And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? <laughs> yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fuck quit. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Spit and Chick. Let's Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 415 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What's shaking, everyone? Had a busy week in the NHL. A few of the boys had a little road trip down south, and it's Hockey Hall of Fame time once again. But let's check in with the fellas. Say hello first. Producer Mikey Grinelli, what is shaking with you, big guy? Uh, it's also little ravioli's birthday, RA. Ooh. So that's what I did this past week, past oh. weekend. I threw ravioli her first birthday party. I got a little custom cake made of mashed potatoes, purple mashed potatoes. So it was awesome. Just just a great weekend with the dog. And other than that, the Carolina trip was just a, a blast. And I can't wait to talk about it with you guys. Where did you hear about these dog cakes? It's in New York City, dude. You can get anything, anytime, anywhere. I just Googled dog cakes. And right away, two blocks from my apartment, there's a place you can get a custom dog cake. It had purple mashed potatoes all on the outside, had a nice pumpkin pumpkin uh, mix on the inside, so it was healthy for her. Wow. Unbelievable. Wait, you had think- you ever heard about these? Did you see the Patriots player whose wife got him a birthday cake of her five hole, like in dog oh, style no. with a thong on? Is, was that also cake. recently? Oh, How, was, what I a segue. Today. Was it a Cavell cake? It, and, and I think there's a picture of the guy licking the her five hole cake. And it's just <laughs> you just said dog cake, and I went to human cake. Wyatt's birthday is Wednesday, guys. Oh Second god, birthday. we're so we're really going, hopping. We're going here. person. <laughs> we're going human. My son, my born my my second born son, Wyatt Tyler Whitney. We're going real cake for him. So I love the cake talk though. You gotta um, go Cavell. Cavell's the best ice cream cake. Those little chocolate brown cookies. Had you ever yeah, heard a homemade of the dog guy, cakes? RA. Have you had you heard of the dog cakes, RA? You? What about you? I know, yeah, I know there's everything for dogs now, which is kind of weird because the dogs, I don't think they're cognizant. It's their birthday. Or it's like when people take dogs to religious things to get blessed by priests. It's like, I don't think the dog knows what's going on or really has any leanings religious. That stuff. happens. Oh, yeah. They like the blessing of the animals. Oh, yeah. People take their their animals to church and they the priest like blesses their animals and like, dogs like the first probably, communion? I uh, no, I don't like that. Yeah, it's it's uh yeah. Hey, whatever floats your boat. I'm not you know what whatever works for you. But I just wonder yeah, what the, we're gonna what have the pita are after us. Or what if the dog like is secretly like a different religion, but he, he can only bark and like tell you, but nobody understands. Remember when Peter went after animal crackers? Oh, my in God. Family Guy. No, like they, they, I think they made them take uh, the 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 animals off the off the box. I mean, Grinelli, you can Google this. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I drunk. Oh, that you up. said Peter. I thought you meant Peter, as in Peter Griffin. Oh, <laughs> no, Peter, no. Peter. Speaking of family guy, wait, remember the wait, um, wait, Biz, you're right. Barnum's Animal Crackers cuts cages from the box. All cages had to be removed from the box. Christ. Wow. Eat people. I mean, you know hey, what? I go to the that's... zoo and then I go to the zoo and I feel bad, but I still enjoy. I, go, I enjoy going once in a while. But every time I'm there, I do feel kind of bad. Hate the zoo. I hate it. Yeah, well, when I'll that... tell you, the cages just look good on the box. That's that's the unfair part. When I think of those boxes of the of the, that, that, that the cages look good on the animals. I know it may sound bad, but it just looked like an old school. I feel vibe. like uh, I feel is, like yeah. there'd be bigger, bigger fights uh, out there. Bigger, bigger battles to be won than, than getting the. Yeah, the a fucking box cage off a cookie box, box that nobody gives a fuck about. Like, Wait, I wonder how many how many dollars and resources for, that you donate to PETA went to getting the, the cage off the box. A family guy. Uh, remember they used the line that you used very early on in the show and on Chicklets. I mean, it was a huge so I, coincidence. I was, I, have we ever gotten the answer if that was after I, uh, the Chicklets t- time I said that? Oh, no, 100%. 100%. It was what you said. You said it first, and then it was on the show later. I mean, we didn't confirm that they heard it on our show and used it, but it was an awful coincidence that... Explain, they, all right. Explain. Yeah, what you have to explain this for yeah. me. I don't even remember this. So when, CTE, baby. So when... Wit, early, early in the episodes, it was, I think, pre-biz days, and, you know, we were heavy on the uh, KHL Russia content with Wit, and he said every woman there is either, what, a one or a ten, <laughs> I, I believe. Well, lo and behold, on oh, Family good. Guy, when Peter went to Russia, he was driving around, he's like, huh, every, every woman here is either a one or a 10. And it was like, it was so like spot on. We, we all like texted. It was so like, oh, funny because they had the picture of like the old babushka and then like zoomed rocket supermodel Russian. Zoom, old babushka. Zoom, you know what I mean? It was kind of one <laughs> or a 10. Labushkin. So the actual cartoon of it was very funny. 
Oh, uh, I mean, so that's like the I first, was not the question. first person to say that, by the way. Right. right. No, because you're probably talking to all these hockey players, which the first question I ask any guy who played in the KHL, I said, how are the ladies in Moscow? And they go, buddy, it, 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 doesn't, make, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. They are straight up fembots. So that's, I mean, every time you talk to somebody and now I know why all these guys do go over to the KHL. Uh, I know one one of the writers of Family Guy, with Alex Selkin, he's a local guy, a Massachusetts guy. So if there is a connection from Chicklets to Family Guy, I suspect he might have been behind it. Great, great writer, great Twitter follow. So if not, hey, what do they say? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So it's all good. Let's Fizz, sue him. What are you up to? Where are you right now? You're in a different location every time. No, I'm talk. not in a different location. I'm well, well, different background. I, I guess different background. I did. I got a little set design. The background is anyone else agreed? Is that doesn't that look like a giant gummy bear? The red thing. No, that's a Buddha head, a female a, a, Buddha a gummy head. bear or, or like a big candle. Kind of looks like a giant candle. I no, love the pink stone. Whitney golf clubs there, Biz. Yeah, the that is a hell of a gorgeous. with the hockey stick. Wow, man, you got a great background. Well, that's actually uh, I mean, we're going to get to it. We got a couple sandbaggers in our belt, in our belt buckle. Is that, is that what you say in the belt buckle? But uh, every time before I leave for a round, I, I rub the, the lady's head for good luck. And I'll tell you what, Biz has been buzzing, Wit's been buzzing. We got four in a row. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a sandbagger dropping this week. Kobe Armstrong and Bugsy Malone. And of course, Merles is there. So a little bit of a chicklets, et cetera, type of feel. But uh, I appreciate you pumping the tires of the backdrop. I, I put some hard work into it today. Uh, guys, real quick, speaking of chicklets, et cetera, we never picked a name for chicklets, et cetera. I mean, there was a lot of talk about us, you know, maybe Check the game notes, bud. Maybe the Mindsies. Do you guys have any take? Can we get a final vote here on what the name's going to be? Because we I have another think, show coming up in two weeks. I don't think anybody liked Chicklets, et cetera, compared to what the options are with. That was worse than real wit. Um, I didn't hear one good thing about Chicklets, et cetera, the name of the show, as opposed to the content. Everyone loved it. That's, that can't be the name. That name's horrific. So I... I I, I laughed when I originally heard check the game notes, bud. I don't I, I, I could never say that I would be a final vote in this. I think it's up to them, but we can't be having chickens, et cetera, anymore. Let's have a sh let's have a new name on the next episode, the second episode. And I see love how the it mindsies. feels and the mindsies is another that's a that's a sleeper pick. Yeah. So I those are it. the two front runners right now are the mindsies and uh and check the game notes, bud, or check the game notes. I say no, bud. Yeah, check the game notes works better, and I I like that much better. I think it's just you know yeah no you, bud no bud. Yeah, I agree check with the that. game notes. It's just yeah, it's a, it's a great little title. Whether they know the history or not, they can learn it. But I think it beats the other one as well. So we'll see what happens. So you guys were down Carolina for the sandbagger. You guys went to a, a Carolina uh, game that night. Did you guys partake in the tailgate? Because that's one of the few places that you can actually tailgate in any gel game, or if not the only one. Was there a tailgating on a Thursday night? So it was uh, it was kind of raining as we got to the game. We didn't get there early enough for the tailgate. I have a lot of things to say about the experience down there, Biz. We had a sandbagger that went a little late I, without I can't give anything away. One of the most ridiculous ending basically in the dark that we've ever had. So that'll be coming out, I don't know, in the next two months, next month and a half. That's not right even the magic we got coming Wednesday. So we got late. We were a little late to the game, but I walked in and now I remember playing there. Um, my first year in the league, they were sick. They won the cup. They, they were just a, the crowd was unreal. Uh, I remember seeing the crowd when I went there for the 02 final game three, Igor Larionov, Larionov in triple overtime. I've seen this place in, 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 in a, an amazing atmosphere. And then the next few years, I, I want to say 06, 07, 08. I don't remember how they did, but it didn't seem like when we were playing down there that they the crowds were the, the same. They, they lost wow. a lot of luster when the team struggled. Well, any thought of, of that I had is completely over because, Biz, that it place awesome. blew me away. It was awesome. It was electric RA. The place is going nuts. They, they're they busting in college kids from Elon. I mean, NC State kids are going. We were there, what, Thursday night? Thursday night. Yeah. That's Thursday, yeah. Thursday in oh, Raleigh. Yeah. And then they score goals, all right? That their song. Can we play the song quick in the podcast? North Carolina, come on, come on raise, raise up. Take, take your shirt off. Go around like a helicopter. North Carolina. 
Uh, so, Biz, I'll let you take over, but I am on that Canes bandwagon now. I got a bunch of different teams. They're, they're a team that's on the wit radar in terms of I'll hop on that bandwagon very quick. And easy living down there. Great golf. Just an amazing trip. Justin Williams, we can't thank him enough. Um, I, I keep talking, Biz. Go ahead, though, buddy. Well, no, Eric Cole as well. He was a funny basher on the course. So those are the two oh, guys Colsey. we got banked. What a legend. I believe they will be coming out right before Christmas. Uh, as far as the trip, a quick in and out. It was fun. After a couple nights at TNT, I thought I'd be a little bit tired. But I tell you what, the area and just being there put me in such a good fucking mood. And then the game to follow. You talked about the energy in the building. Shout out to, to Williams and the entire Canes organization. They hooked us up uh, to start in the press box. And then Willie brought us down. I think Eric Cole and his buddies had a box. So we got to kind of be more in the mix with the fans. Um, I mean, other than stroking off Carolina and what they got going there with, one of my major takeaways from that trip was, oh, the Oilers are in trouble. <laughs> and I'm not trying to troll either. And I know you're going to say, I knew oh, this was coming and, and you have every right to bring it up. But without McDavid and Dreisaitl, sincerely from the bottom of my heart, this may be a lottery team. I No, no, no. I'm going to go even further to say, without McDavid and Dreisaitl, I would take the Coyotes in a seven-game series against the Oil right now. Huh. But All right, we'll we we'll gotta get to Connor and the uh, Oilers in a second. A couple of the notes in Raleigh because I know so you guys. Yeah, give, talk give about him a little. It. Give him no. Give him some time to think and, and digest that one, Ra. I appreciate you. That's a buddy move, Ra. That's a yeah. buddy move, man. Yeah, I, I don't, don't even nice need guy. one goddamn second because a lot of what I have to say would kind of agree with what you're saying right now. But we'll get into it later. That T though, you just held up to the screen. That makes me want to tee so bad right now. Go warm what the kind, throat up, baby. It's what kind be a of tea long is? pod. What kind of uh, that is an English breakfast because I want a little bit of a little kick in the arse. Guys, we have so much fucking hockey to talk about. The league is thriving right now. The storylines are incredible. I've been fu- I, I feel like we got a month's worth of conversation going all the way back to Tuesday. We had a doubleheader Tuesday TNT, Wednesday TNT. The fucking headliners were out. Wit, you should go grab a tea. And RA, I'm going to throw it back to you because we got a few more things to talk about. Before I'm going to we- Uber eat the tea. tea. Uh, you, Biz, if you like tea, you got to try Yorkshire tea. It's uh, British tea, English tea, the best in the world. I have drank tea my whole life. I started that a couple of years ago. Someone suggested it. You'll never go back to whatever you were on before. Yorkshire right. tea. Yo. And you know what we're going to do on this podcast? Like the ladies say, we're going to spill the tea. Ooh, I love spill- spilling that tea. Uh, What's up, Whit? Give me that tea, girl. Tea. Um, Ooh, girl, we want that NHL That's drama. actually a new, a, a, a a new term for me, done. and I love it. I, I love spilling that tea. Or anyone can spill tea to me. All right. Am I am I to guess that you put a lot of milk and a lot of sugar in your tea, or are you just crushing it black? No, I put a dollop of milk in, and I actually put honey in my tea. Okay, that's yeah. a class move. Yeah, I put I put classy move. All right, teaspoon, a little teaspoon plus in my tea because this Yorkshire tea is so good. I grew up drinking Salada tea on, on occasion, Lipton, and someone suggested this Yorkshire stuff. I got it on it from Amazon. It's like I said from England. I, I drank it. I'll, I'll never drink any other tea again. I've gotten a couple of my family members on it. I've converted them. It's it's awesome. It's just that's a delicious tea. You don't even need sugar or milk. But anyways, back to Carolina. It's straight, straight Colombian wolf in a bag. Uh-huh. And he's just fucking dunking uh, her in there. Um, uh, all right. This tea is white. Is uh, it supposed <laughs> to be like that? Uh, so listen, we're going to be back in Carolina, Biz. The stadium series, Saturday, February 18th, 8 o'clock. The Caps and Canes at NC State's Cotter Finley Stadium. That's going to be the real tailgate, I think. But. Boys, you know what? I think we should do the night before. I know we're probably going to have a meet and greet or something going on. The night before, one night only, Hootie and the Blowfish are going to be playing down there. It's As part of the festivities? The night before the, the game. Yeah. Who hired playing. them? The team? I I don't know exactly who, but there's, there are concerts down there. I think we should do a meet and greet early, and we should talk to our friends at game time maybe and try to go see Hootie. Dude, 100%. They, they don't score. They haven't done a show in ages, so a one-off with Tootie and the Bluefish? Well, either it was the League or the Canes. What a job. That's a great band to kick things off. How buckled will you be at that show? Don't you go uh-huh. see these guys regularly? I've Actually, I've never seen Hootie in, in concert. I like him. I, he was huge in my college days. I never actually saw him in person, but... Yeah, I'll, I'll go back in a college mode if we see them down in North Carolina. Wait, you're going to be on I... vacation, correct? Uh, I believe so. When is that? That's my 40th birthday? Yes. Ooh. Yeah, I probably won't be there. All right. So it's I, I, be me, I, me and RA what? playing beanbag toss in the That's parking right. lot, playing college turn, kids for their lunch money. When do you turn 40 with? 
that game already. That's what we're talking the, about. Oh, the, oh, the, that actual day, the 18th? Okay. I mean, 19th, I don't know 19th. Okay, so the next day. I'm actually not saying I definitely won't be there. I, I'm not at all. I'm not at all. I I'm just not exactly sure yet. But um, you know what? I, 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 I'll I be back there in the playoffs. I, I can tell you that. That's a get. That's an act, That's a Billy guarantee. We'll get to the wild later. All right. Before we go any farther here on Spitting Chickens, here's a word from our presenting sponsor, Pink Whitney. Pink Whitney is the only shot you should be taking when celebrating a big life milestone or even just watching a big game. I love seeing fans who tweet us that they're doing this, doing that. They're having a shot. They're watching their favorite game. Somebody scores, boom, they whack a couple shots back. We love it. And we especially love it when you tag us in your bachelor, bachelorette party or wedding. Very popular at a lot of these weddings lately, so make sure you tag us. And hey, Grinelli, what do we got on tap lately? We are going to be doing a Pink Whitney signing on December 2nd in yeah. Philadelphia from 5 to 7 p.m. at Fine Wine and Good Spirits on 180 West Gerard Avenue in Philadelphia. And RA, on top of that, the Pink Whitney was flowing this past weekend when we were in North Carolina filming a sandbagger. It was also flowing in the other sandbagger that comes out this Wednesday with Colby Armstrong and Bugsy Malone. But the Pink Whitney's always flowing, RA. Of course, and of course, we're going to be back there for the stadium series in February. I'm sure it's going to be flowing then as well, but we have a lot of exciting stuff for Pink Whitney coming in 2023, so make sure to head to your local bar and ask them for some Pink Whitney. Should we um, talk about a couple of the other Pink Whitney appearances we got coming up as well? Gee, I'm um, going to throw it over to you. I know we got some hockey to talk about, but uh, we're going to be hitting up some arenas here soon. And all right, I don't know if you want to take it or G. No, I mean, yeah, Thursday, we're going to be in Philadelphia. We're going to the Flyers game. This is Thursday, December 1st. We're going to the Flyers game, doing some big deal brew activations. Friday, December 2nd, we're doing a Pink Whitney bottle signing in Philly from 5 to 7 at Fine Wine and Good Spirits on 180 West Gerard Avenue in Philadelphia. Saturday, December 3rd, I believe we're flying to Detroit to do a little appearance at a retailer, a quick bar meetup before a Red Wings game. Then the boys are hitting Little Caesars Arena. Sunday driving or flying to Columbus, hitting a retailer there for a little big deal brew activation. Then I believe we're hitting our bar before the game, before the Blue Jackets game, do a little pink Whitney shots, little big deal brew. And then I don't know, Biz, do you want to say it? We might be off to New Jersey. So I I, want to go to the Columbus game. They're at home. And then I'm going to fly. I was going to, I was thinking about going back to Arizona and getting cozy, but I said, you know what? I got to answer to a fan base. And one man in particular, Frank the Tank. I am going to fly to New York. We're going to record live on that Monday. Is he calling you out, Biz? No, he ain't calling me out, but I want to go to a game. I want to see with my own eyes what they got brewing there in New Jersey. I'm going to go into New York, and I'm going to go to that Wednesday game. Or no, excuse me, it's a Tuesday game. It's a Tuesday game, the 6th, December 6th, Chicago Blackhawks against the New Jersey Devils because they have been humming. And we're not going to talk the Devils quite yet, but I want to go see it with my own eyes and Frank the Tank, a, a, an absolute hardcore Devils jock sniffer. And, of course, Posh will be with me too. Well, you did see with your own eyes in Carolina last week. Connor McDavid, TNT, kicked off the week with him earlier in the week. We're going to start there. He continues his torrid pace. He had a goal and an assist versus uh, Tampa Bay that night. Had a goal and an assist for us Carolina later in the week has an assist later in the week, whoever they played Saturday night. He's got two points a game he's averaging right now. 32 points in 16 games. Wait, I know you made a video for PMT. Uh, were you getting trolled there or were you trolling? What was, what was going that on That was there? bullshit. They were being fucking those assholes guys, to our Lord Those guys were treating me like some no-name, fourth-line scrub pigeon. They wouldn't even let me get my point across. PFT was... P- Pardon the interruption. Pardon the interrupting of Witty. And you know what? When Big, it was actually so funny when Big Cat said, uh, "Well, then why do they come off the ice?" I knew right away on social. I could, or I could just see the comments. <laughs> ha- like, like this, this guy's literally he thinks he can skate the whole game. So it, it it went great in terms of their plan. But my argument's legit. I, I wait. Let me play the audio quick. Okay, go ahead. All right, so wait, Connor wait. McDavid, best player in all the sports right Connor now. Connor McDavid, the most dominant at his sport. If he's the most dominant at his sport, then you would figure that they would have won the Stanley Cup. Good so point, it's not, it's not, it's not an individual scumbag league like the NBA. You need to have a great team around you. It's not one or two guys. Well, then guys you can't with, be the most dominant at uh, your sport. No, 
Yes, you can be. Okay, for for the yes, like you can be. What about Yami? Of the no, game because even in the, the playoffs, ice. he was. He doesn't have he. He can't throw last and year catch the and maybe may it's be harder to be dominant as an individual in the NHL. That's what I'm saying. Uh, well, it's no being dominant and being that good cannot lead you to a to a if, cup. The way one or two amazing NBAers can win you an NBA title, it'll never happen in hockey. If like he that. was so dominant, why does why does he come off the ice? It's a good uh, question. That's that's something that where if you skate long enough, if you've ever done it, you run you run out of wind. You can't right. really continue. NBA to do players it. don't come so, off the, the court. So that's because they, wa- that's cause they walk around the court, <laughs> and then their their exciting crazy plays are dunks. Yeah, which why, is who? like me putting the trash away in the kitchen. But why does so, it, it, so brings there's up no a fair there's point. no course of any of you guys trying to mention that that's similar is just you trolling me. I mean, I won't Giannis, stand for it. no, like, like, Giannis plays okay. forty eight minutes. What are the longest shifts in the NHL? What's the longest shift you ever played? So if you get caught in your own zone, you could be out there two, two and a half minutes. Oh, God. Oh, no. oh man, that sounds awful. Yeah, people don't understand because they don't wait, skate. like 120 it's seconds? Almost like, it's almost like people don't get boxing in terms of a three-minute round is so long. People yeah. are like, oh, three minutes. Hockey's kind of similar okay, without so the punches to the face. That's crazy because like in soccer, they play for 90 minutes and they don't get a break. Yeah, that's true. Well, they get one at halftime, but it's 45 minutes at a time. Some of the most amazing uh, athletes in terms of uh, endurance and wind in they, the world. And toughness. Players. And toughness Basketball as well. players are a joke. And you guys <laughs> both know that. They need their... Hockey players don't do their what are the days load called? Management. Load, load management. Yeah. So don't even start with load that. management's important. You you know you guys just you bring me in for an NHL preview and you and you, right, okay. and you, and you troll the NHL. Right, wait, no, 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 yeah. no. For anyone, yeah, who didn't hear when I was, I think it was two weeks ago, maybe. He is that much greater than anyone else that plays in the NHL. That I look around every other league. Now, the one name that popped up, I think PFT said it, um, was Otani, the pitcher in Anaheim. That's actually a pretty legit argument because he's. He's hitting like 40 dingers. I think he's straight. He's a beast. He's an animal pitcher and he rakes, hits bombs. So I, I, I that's never been done, right? So I it's guess that's roof. a great that's a great argument. The other argument I heard was I, I don't know exactly his first name. It's like Holland. He's I think Norwegian and he plays for Manchester City uh in the English Premier League. He's scoring like two goals a game. He's got hat tricks coming wow. out of his, the, his in arsehole the, in the for, British Premier League right now. In the yes, the English Premier League. Man City's in second. He's he's he was the biggest transfer ever who came over from a team in Germany. Erling and Holland. He's a, he's a he's like actually McDavid. He's six four. He's up there. He's a machine. He's a striker. He's so much faster. Strong than everyone. Unreal highlights, even if you're not a soccer fan. So he's another name that was thrown out there. So that that are very those are very legit arguments. So I'm not saying I'm always right, but I like believing I'm right. And he just does things. We got to witness it in Carolina. Now, yes, Edmonton stinks. They're back to stinking. Now I said this last year, and look how that turned out. We were um four games away from going to the Stanley Cup final. We had a great run. Western Conference Final wasn't good. But I said this last year. There's times where they need stuff from the third and fourth line. They didn't get it. But back to McDavid, I I just, he, Biz, when he scored the goal the other night, he's getting, he gets the puck early along the wall. And even the the box were sitting in. Everyone's like, when he, when he has it, they're kind of getting a little quiet. They're watching him. He cuts in quick backhand. You're just like, what just happened? I've never seen a guy penetrate box like him. He can penetrate box with the best of them. Like wow. tightest box in the league, just penetrates it's it quick, every time. Hard. And then he's elbow. out of the box. Then he's out of the box. Bing, bang, in boom. And out like a fucking fiddler's elbow. It's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's, it's ass it's, like a sewing true machine. magician at work. That's a great way to put it. That's a really good comparison by you, Biz. So I, I just, I, I love, I love getting the chance to watch him play live. Unfortunately, the Oilers, like I said, it's, it's ugly. It's ugly. I, I do you want me to expand or do you have questions? So Pooley RV. So, uh, so Pooley RV. Yeah, he's not. A, I buddy, feel bad. 2016 draft. Oh no! It, it, Here comes the know, list. Here comes the list. Read them off. Matt, Matthew Kachuk, two picks after him. Oh, Clayton geez. Keller, the pick after that. Oh my god! Nine. Mikel Serge. Mikel Serge. Tev. <laughs> Sorry, I can't talk right you now. You could you could try that one again if you want. Okay. Nine. Mikel Sergachev. This one hurts. 14, Boston McAvoy. Can you imagine Charlie McAvoy oh and the Edmonton Oilers? Oh, my God. Can you well, imagine he'd, that? He'd want 12. Can you shut no. your eyes and just no. think? He'd want, he'd want like 14 no. to stay. RA's like, no, don't say that, kid. 
We got um, Jacob Chikrin soon after that. Uh, there's a name at 26 who we can get into the, a goal this guy scored this week. But this is Pooley Arvey's draft. I will say, Tage though, it's Thompson. Very, I... Tage Thompson and the oh, Edmonton Oilers. Right now. Now, granted, okay. he's been traded. So this it's, is. It's... This is death by a thousand cuts, but I will say it's very ironic to hear. And I know some of you at home are punching your fucking steering wheels, wherever you are saying a guy who's a fans of the Oilers bitching about the draft. You guys had how many fucking layup first overall picks in the NHL draft. So I was just going to throw that back to you after that quick comment. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, Yakupov, I was, what? Whoopsie. Well, a lot, just getting, a lot of bad drafts. These... It's not a, it's not me about complaining about the drafts. It's it's more about you're so lucky to get those picks. And when you you know, they were just so close from having a true dynasty. Now you're relying on two guys. Now the argument of they didn't have them, well, they do have them, so that's not I mean it, that it's kind of a stupid argument. They're there. And, um, and that's my point is when they can get rounded into form and hopefully get some contributions from the third, third line, Yamamoto, he doesn't have a goal, I don't think. So with, with that, with that, how bad they look now in the Campbell situation, even though Stuart Skinner looks good, Campbell right now is a nightmare. They could still ride those two and get hot and get to the playoffs and but like get to a Stanley Cup. That's my argument, okay? So well, I know not, without them, they're weak, but I, they have them. I will say, though, the, the amount of trolling going on on PMT and just with them taunting Canada with the sorry, sorry. At this point, I don't know if after chirping our Lord and Savior, McJesus, that they would they would allow to get into Canada at this point. I think a, a big apology to all of Canada is in order from the PMT podcast, not only with how they treated you, but of course what they were kind of, they were kind of ragging on McDusty a little bit. Now they were ragging. You know what? By ragging on McDusty, they're really ragging on all of us biz. That's what I'm saying. They're taunting the game of hockey. So I think we have to declare war against the PMT podcast, at least from a hockey perspective. So really nationality should have nothing to do with it. Now. Drink that tea and then spill that tea. Saying that. What the fuck is this guy's problem? I'm on TNT on the national broadcast, and this guy's on pace for 82 fucking goals. And I say, hey, Connor, was there a different mindset coming to the season at the fact that you're scoring at such a rapid pace? Even before I ask the question, I say, I hate to beat the dead horse here, but people want to know, what was your mindset? If it was such a stupid fucking question, why was Dreisaitl talking about the fact that you were going to get 60 coming in the year? What were you talking about with your buddies? And what was your mindset coming in in which you were going to start scoring at a more rapid pace? In the answer, he's like, well, I think he fucking rolled his eyes to the back of his head when I asked him. And he, oh. he goes, well, I, 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 Does he I know scored, that's you? I, mean, I scored 40 a, a couple of times. So we get off of it. I say, fuck, I'm just some donkey ass in the questions. Talk's now ragging on my question. And then I bring up your story. I say, Sidney Crosby, the year he scored 51, I want to say it was his fourth season in the National Hockey League. Talbot came up to you. He said, buddy, he's going to get 50. And you're like, Sid, pass first mentality. That's how he's always been. What's going to make him get 50 goals? He went and he switched to a one piece and he worked on it all fucking summer long. And then he took 10 K off you. He had a different mindset coming into that year. So I don't think it was that stupid of a question. What do you think, Mr. Fucking Euler? What's your what's your captain? What's his problem? What's what's the problem he's got with me? Um, they were on a bit of a losing streak that pregame intro. That was a pregame interview, right? Yeah, they were on a bit of a slide. I think seven games. Okay, so I mean, at that point, this guy's just so sick of losing, and it's a question about his goal scoring, and he's just like, fuck, get off me, biz. He's like, let me sleep. Let me just let me just don't ask me about my individual stuff. He probably would have answered what's going on with uh, what do you guys got to do to get out of the slump? I should have said, hey, when the fuck is this bottom six going to wake up? These fucking losers. Huh? You should have just guy. How's your how sore is your back? You want to you want a little back rub? No wonder you got the hot tub in your backyard. Your back's about to fall off from carrying these fucking bums. Is that what I should have asked them? Sometimes the greats got to carry some guys along and. And and then they find they find their way at the at the the most key moment, you know, in in, in February and March and leading into the playoffs and then just going on a run and and just and just figuring everything out. But I mean, 
I, we actually are talking about the Oilers too much without mentioning how scary that was with the Vander Kane boys. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ra, you awful. can kind of let everyone know the entire backstory of the night it was and who was, who it was against. Yeah, it was the, well, the same game, Edmonton at Tampa. Very scary moment. Uh, Evander Kane suffered a gruesome gash across his wrist. Uh, a total accident. Pat Maroon was skating by, and, you know, he was exposed between his glove and his hand, and it just sliced him. And immediately, you could see the horror in his face, and he got up and went right to the bench, and there was already a huge pool of blood. And oh. even, even the big rig knew was up. You could see him motioning to get some help right away. And, you know, I think these type of incidents, guys, are scarier than, than when they bring the stretch out because the stretch is usually precautionary and, you know, it's just being extra careful. Whereas when a guy gets gashed like that, man, you know, there's the potential to bleed out and, and it's everything is they got to get him out. Of there. They got to get him taken care of right away. And Evander commended the uh, Tampa and Edmonton staff. They treated him right away, got him to the hospital. Uh, you know, he put out a statement right away. Thanks for everybody for reaching out. I'm going to be fine. I'm feeling better each and every day. Uh, he's going to be out three to four months, but it, it's just those things, especially after what happened to Clint Malachuk years ago and uh, a, a couple Zitnick. other incidents. Zitnick, the, Zednick, they're just horrific to, when, when there's that much blood on the ice because it's it, it's just much more of an emergency situation that when a guy you know has to get taken out in a stretcher, again, typically for precautionary reasons. So uh, either way, uh, Evander, we're happy you're doing better, buddy. Uh, get well. We hate to see this. So uh, we hope you, you get back out there in a few months because nobody such wants a, to see that with anybody. Yeah, man. It's just, such a tough it's loss. And he said afterward, right down to the bone, the amount of blood that hit the ice as quick as it did, I was like, oh, fuck. This, he's in one. And the first responders closing that fucker up. And I think they had to do it outside the locker room right then and there, or at least stop it there. And then they finally got him over to hospital. So well, one well, of Biz, the... didn't, didn't you have like a sim similar injury like that when you were playing in the AHL? Yes, I, uh, I was playing in Wilkes-Barre. I don't know if I've told the story on the podcast before. I don't, think, Wait, I don't, I don't think you were around. I think you were in the NHL at the time. I wasn't there. And uh, we were playing against Hershey in playoffs, and I got ha hit ass over tea kettle, high and low. And the guy who hit me high, when he took the next step, he stepped right on my wrist. So when I got up, I was dazed and out of it, but I saw blood on my shirt and on my other arm. So I started touching my face because I was still out of it. And then I looked to the people who were right there in the front row and they just had their mouth, their mouths covered. And then I looked over to my left wrist and it was just squirting out like crazy. Oh. And luckily our door was right there, ran right down the tunnel. And that's when he like thanked the, the you know, the paramedics, first responders, the, do the doctors on staff. Cause like I was white as a ghost and we had had this doctor in Wilkes-Barre. I want to say he was like in, he was a medic at, at, at a war, not, not World War II. What was the one that went after? Probably I think Vietnam. it was Vietnam. And he took a thread and needle and closed the artery that had opened up that was shooting out. Like, I was fucking freaking out. It ended up cutting my tendons, uh, nerve. I had major nerve oh, damage. Like, I can't dude. feel my... Yeah, and then... But, hey, I'll never forget, though. So, I the ambulance takes me over after they get it closed up and stabilized. And... uh I'm talking to the doctor at the other place and it, it, you, I couldn't really move my fingers obviously because the tendons were cut, but he came in and kind of looked at it. He's like, ah, stop being a wimp. You'll be back next week. So I was like, fuck. I'm like, that's fucking unbelievable news, but God, this feels like it's got to do a lot of healing before then. Well, then they fly me out to Pittsburgh and I go see Dr. Booterbaugh and they get in there and they're, I was out for fucking six months. I had to, I had to wear that arm thing that Evander's got on, and I would you know I, you have to sleep a shirt. Holy fuck, Doc! <laughs> Talk oh, about yeah, an all time been, hey, That that's petrifying. You know what the scariest thing is? Actually, I want to I want to shout out the the training staff, and I don't know the name of the of the Lightning guys, and I should, but playing for Edmonton, TD fours, Chris Davy, Happy, we call them. Those guys, I mean, th thank God for them, and then Tampa Bay and the doctors oh, yeah. there. And what's so scary is like something like that happening in in a rink, and guys are playing men's league or something. It's yeah. it's it's just like you thank God that the, they have the help right there because Evander Kane's face, you could tell like the the horror, as scary as it sounds. That stuff is it's 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 so scary. And, That's Tom and, Mulligan. Uh, wait, Tom Mulligan is the head athletic trainer in Tampa. Yeah, and think it back to that tragedy. Oh my God, in high school hockey, I hate even talking about it. It makes my skin crawl. You guys, you remember that? So it's uh it's scary. Thank that thank basically thank God he's all right. Yeah, Liam McHugh was like, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more with like how guys are just flying around and how how fast the game is. But uh, oh, it's terrible.
Terrible. Yeah, it, it's always a fluke thing, and you hate to see it. But again, Evander, hope, hope, hopefully you're doing well. Get back out there soon. We want to see you back out in the ice. So. And we're to circle back, though. If I ever get to ask him a question on TNT again, I'm asking him about his hot tub every fucking single time. Every time moving forward now. Hot tub time machine with Connor McDavid. All right, I and, can't uh, wait the, to hear those clips. The nightcap that night, Biz, you guys had uh, Nashville and Seattle. Crack and smack the Preds around five to one. It's been a bit of a bit by a bippy start, a bumpy start for the Preds. Uh, six, eight, and one. Thirteen points has them three points back of the second wild card. Four points back of third place in the Central. And UC Saros, my boy, a Vesna finalist last year. He's uh, kind of struggled a bit coming out of the gate. He has yet to win two games in a row, and the Preds have only done it themselves twice. Uh, Eleven starts. He's four, six, and one with a 3 2 2 9 one but he was excellent Saturday and went over the ranges. And I think once he puts together a few games in a row, you kind of see that form come back. And I think Nashville rally around him. I mean, like I said, I think their defense is better. They brought in Ryan McDonough. Uh, he's obviously a huge defenseman to bring in uh, over the offseason. I think they'll get better. Um, as for Seattle, you mentioned Jordan Eberle. He said this is one of the most well-balanced teams he's been on, Biz. Yeah, so I was actually kind of getting a pre-scout for a couple teams, and Army said that he talked to him when he was in Pittsburgh. And he's and that those were the words out of his mouth. And this is a guy who played with the Islanders, who that they have one of the best well well balanced lineups in the league. Excuse me. So to hear that and the way that they've been playing, their D don't really hop out at you. Martin Jones is is having a, a career year, a, well, a bounce back year to when he was in San Jose. But the the more you look at that forward group and the matchups that like the Tanevs has, the the the, the Schwartzies, like they're chewing teams up right now and they're playing some great hockey. I mean, uh, as far as Nashville's concerned, talk brought up a good point. He's like, man, look at how many of their forwards had career years last year. Like sometimes yeah. when you see that guys, not to say they regress, it's just like, well, they fucking had a career year. Everything was going in, you know? So right now they got to get their mojo back. They're not scoring many goals. They're not keeping them out of the net. So I agree with you, RA on paper, this team, they added Nino need rider. They added McDonough. They got the same goaltender. This team should be flying. So, like you said, a couple games for, for him under his belt, a couple W's playing some good hockey. I think they can get things back on track. But, uh, man, Seattle, that's kind of that surprise team, and there's a few of them. Absolutely. Uh, currently third in the Pacific with 19 points. Uh, the Kraken have uh, also given us a new rival for you, Biz. Uh, Bowie, he talked smack to you uh, on the, the – well, he didn't talk. He had the sign on the broadcast, the, the Jumbotron talking shit. Wait, what's this all about? You and Bowie I know, picked a beef on the show or what? Well, he was unverified, and then I fucking chirped him on, on TNT. Then he, then he got the check mark, shocker, Twitter. Uh, well, maybe now that Elon's got it, uh, Bowie will lose it. But I th- talking shit on your Bowie last Nash- nationally televised broadcast, and then now we don't see Seattle the rest of, the rest of the year. Typical move by a SJ Dub blue-haired freak. <laughs> Typical move. All right, uh, you picked good. Seattle at the beginning of the year to get in the playoffs, right? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, they're playing significantly better than last year. Yeah. Well, you bought them last week too. When we sit, when you did the buy or sell segment on the Seattle Kraken last yeah. week, you said, "I'm buying. I think they will be a playoff team." Uh, hey, they all- quickly, Martin Jones, my man. Remember, I picked him to win the Vesna that one year. Yeah, you're just a few yeah. years behind. He's he's bombing through the league right now. Uh, the, yeah, the Kraken, are, the Kraken are nice. Uh, you do you like the that you like those jerseys they have? Okay, I was gonna bring that up. I think that the reverse this- retro. The socks need to have as much of that color. Is it turquoise? Is that the color that it is? Turquoise, uh, aqua. I was going with teal? aqua. Yeah, mm. like au- that aqua color. There's too much on the jersey compared to the sock, so it throws it off balance. I think they should have dumbed down that aqua color. It just seems a little too top-heavy for me, but everything else about it I don't mind. It's brutal. I think it sucks. Okay, well, there you go. That's a strong yeah, opinion. They, they could have done something wow. really cool, really special. Had like a real vintage vibe to it, and they just, I think they blew it. What would be the I think it's the same vibe? color. It's the same color as uh, Bowie's hair color. No wonder I've they went seen, excessive on it, fucking losers. Didn't, um, Probably didn't got his they hair have like a maroon on. Seattle jersey back in the day with an S? That might have been either a mock-up or the Metropolitans, perhaps, way back. That that was the Metropolitans jersey. That would have been kind of cool. I agree. But these these jerseys, actually, they uh, honored the Seattle Ironmen, uh, first formed as the Isaacson Ironmen of the Northwest Industrial Hockey League back in uh, 1943-44 during World War II. So, sounds like you hit the troops, Mike. (laughs) Guess so. I'm a a fan of these jerseys. Not going to lie. 
I don't know why. This is usually something I'd hate. But I, I'm I'm liking it. I'm digging. Well, it. I I like them on uh, like when you look at pictures of them. But then once you see them on the ice, it's just like there I don't go. know. It just was like messing with my eyes the whole time. It was too I think, bright. I think it's the the yeah exactly. It's too much of that aqua color, and they didn't balance it on the bottom half. A jersey that would look good with blue jeans on, but not on the ice. Agreed. Kind of like the the white buffalo ones that people weren't digging. The the, the, the with the buffalo head or what do they call it? The, the hamster goat, head. The goat head. The goat head. The goat, yeah. goat head. The hamster. It's, head. I got a package in the mail last week. I wasn't expecting anything. I opened it up and it was a Toronto Maple Leafs reverse retro jersey. And I was looking for like a card or a name tag. I figured someone was trolling me or whatever. And there was nothing there. I don't, Adidas must have my address. They just sent it out and they said, oh, tag us if it was a gift. So I, that, I that was me, RA. That yeah. was me. Okay. Sure. It was. So I, was uh, I swear. No, I swear to God, that was me. I swear so, to God, that was me. That was me. I played a prank on you. That's why I, I told you to videotape yourself opening it, and you and you sent me a video of you opening something else. But yeah, I I, I sent you the the leaf. <laughs> rip shirt. another fucking I, bong. Hey, rip the bong again, all right? No, <laughs> he's told opening me. up his wife's Amazon package. You not remember it's that like, conversation? It's like a makeup. No, it's a G makeup cleanser. He's like, yeah, sweet Mikey. G told me what two weeks ago. Said you got a package coming. When it comes, uh, have your wife, you know, videotape you open it. Oh, okay. So it was like chicklets merch. Okay, I made the video, sent it off, and geez, like, oh, thank you. And then, uh, what, a week and a half, two weeks later, the, the Leafs jersey came. So, like, I, I, you know, I didn't think that had any. I couldn't blow it. Now on our A side. I couldn't blow it, though. So yeah. when, when with the merch, I couldn't be like, you have a Leafs jersey coming, RA. Well, you could have said, oh, shit, that, you must have, they must have been coming already. Uh, no, it's something else coming. And I would have, you would have had me hook, line, and sinker because, I mean, we got, I got chick merch all the time. So I was like, Chicklets merch. So I just figured it was that. I thought it was weird to record. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you get? Called Chicklets merch. Chick merch. No, I and, got I, the... and I immediately corrected myself. Chicklets merch. Ra's got an OnlyFans. He's yeah. just. <laughs> uh, if I could just jump in real quick, wait. You wanted me to remind you about our uh, our video editor skating through the airport. They take the rental car, um, like earlier. G and the boys, and then I show up to the airport. I walk down the stairs. They're right in front of me. He's holding a skateboard. I'm like, what you like? When were you skateboarding in Raleigh? He's like, no, I bring it for the airport. I'm like, what? He's like, I just bomb around the airport on the skateboard. Nobody ever says a word. I'm like, show me right now. He takes off and runs a full sprint, 15 yards, plops this thing down like Tony Hawk and is ripping through like a, he's a good skateboarder. I'll give him that. He does a big ass loop. He's 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 passing the people who are moving on the on the moving walkways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. he's an F one car, and he does a big ass loop, and then he does a couple more sprints. It comes flying what? back at us. Where and I'm we, like, where do we Whoa. sit on that? I was like, I'm like, you're an asshole. I'm like, I think I <laughs> like I understand how cool it is, but you're the not cool. I understand the whole premise. He's like, yeah, I could bomb around anyway. I'm like, but you're an asshole. You know who are bigger assholes than that and, and the people who are bringing like uh, eagles and falcons on planes? The ones who have the, the carry-ons that, that you can make into like a little cart. That you they have the motorized carts that are luggage. And then they, and they ride them, right? And they sit on their luggage and they drive through the airport. How You could sit on them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw How one the other day. Those go? Oh, they're fucking humming, buddy. Hey, I, don't, are, I do not think those people are, are assholes at all. I think for some reason, riding like on that and just chilling is so much better than like actually exerting the energy of like being a surfboard uh, master on his skateboard, ripping through everyone past Auntie Annie's just to get to his gate a little bit quicker. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're all on the same plane. You're not going to get there any quicker if you're on the same fucking. Plane. I don't know, man. That's like because at least the skateboard you can you can. Oh, and the other thing, this is the other, use this is that the other when thing. You get to your location if you want to go for a skateboard ride. This is the other thing. So when he when he did that 15 yard like Michael Johnson sprint holding the skateboard, I'm like, is he going to drop this thing? He slams this bitch down, <laughs> and the woman next to him jumped up like a firecracker, just <laughs> went off with her right ear drum. <laughs> so that, that's why I was like, "Oh, what okay. a dickhead!" All right, okay, like, you win. The and then he's like, Zoom. "Okay, we found the bigger asshole. You win, Whit. You win. Holy shit, this guy is just up to no. Should we, is that a fireable offense? I'm so happy. I just remember that Cornelli because he was. I was looking at G. I'm like. He's like, yeah, he does this all the time. We have to let this guy go. 
I've never seen it done. We got to go back to the, the Wednesday, though, that we had fucking the two goats going at it. Or two uh, of the ab- new Mount Rushmore's. Absolutely. Uh, before that, Biz, we I also want to thank Seattle. Uh, they were putting out their weekly show on YouTube, and they uh, used a few of the voices from the boys here. We heard, uh, I think, three of us in Merle's. They, they decided to use our audio to open up their show, which is a nice tribute. So to the folks at Seattle Kraken, we appreciate it. Thanks for using Were we our pumping their voices. tires? Um, we were saying nice things, I believe. Uh, oh, I think it was preseason stuff about their odds. It was a few different uh, snippets they used, but... It was an honor to hear, hear them use our voices. So thanks to everybody at the Seattle. Yeah, let's pat ourselves on the on the back here. Way to go, oh, Trickles. I'm not patting them on the back, saying thanks. Yeah, Wednesday oh, okay. biz. Don't break your arm patting yourself on the back. Yeah, yeah. That's such an old school like dad to son statement. Sorry, uh, Ari. I guess I'm right. just a little poopy pants at the fact that their mascots throwing daggers and then and then coming at me online. Sorry, yeah, we'll, buddy. We'll get up there someday. Before we go any farther, I want to talk to you guys about DHM Detox. Hockey season is back in full swing, which means you're probably crushing some Pink Whitney's or some big deal brews, the original Golden Ale, while watching the games. But I want to tell you about something that is going to help you wake up feeling your best. Yes, DHM Detox by No Days Wasted. DHM Detox is backed by science and designed to help break down alcohol-related toxins. So you can wake up feeling fresh the next day, No more slow and sluggish mornings. Just take two capsules before your night out, and it goes to work. It's 100% risk-free trial. If you don't like it, send it back. You will be refunded every cent. Check out their recovery bundles for the best experience. DHM Detox with Hydration Replenisher. The holidays are coming up. No Days Wasted is kicking off the party in style with the Black Friday sale starting with 30% off. Just go to nodayswasted.co. That's no days wasted.co and enter the promo codes bid promo code, excuse me, biz30 to enjoy your 30% off. DHM detox, no days wasted, hydration replenishers. Now let's get back to the show. Uh the Pens and Caps, they resume their rivalry in DC. And the Pens used an old trick the hockey players like Biz. They uh got off the Schneid with a little Halloween party, got banged up and ended up winning the next game. And I I know you talked to uh Sid, see what he might have been having for a cocktail. Gee, let's roll that. I was explaining to people at home that, uh, you know, sometimes when teams are going through a losing streak, it's nice for the team oh. to go out and get a little party action, maybe hit the <laughs> bottle in order to loosen things up. Was that the situation and, and, and uh, why you guys got the dub because of the Halloween party? The timing was perfect. So, yeah, we, uh, we needed that. So I'm glad it worked out. Drink, drink of choice? Uh, I didn't have too much, honestly. We played... Uh, little yeah, Civil War so. and a uh, couple of vodka sodas. That was it. Oh, you were totally setting up for the uh, Pink Whitney uh, big deal. Bruins uh, bait right there. He didn't take it, though, huh? Well, at least he didn't stub my question, and he answered it like I asked a good one. It made me feel good about myself. Um, didn't mention the Pink Whitney. No free ads. No worries there. Um, sh- I think we should talk about the game overall, right? Or actually, let's go back to the Halloween party because Merle's before the game went, and we. I think you mentioned it in the HOSA interview, awesome or awful losing streak for the penguins how do you get off it you got to go fucking get buckled with the boys have some laughs put on some silly costumes and get the team morale back up uh sid went as ted lasso so you know ra is a fan of that the weird one was the prime mantis that latang had on that is just i don't know if you guys know much about prime mantises but the 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 male gets eaten by the female after they plow that's nature taking its course with what? That's, That's what the, the case. Prime Mantis does. All right, you're maybe you're the nature guy. You're watching all the octopus teachers. There's actually, I think, female octopuses even do it at some in some cases. Did you see the meme of Ra hammering the octopus? No, <laughs> from Spin Chunkles memes. No. Uh, uh we, you know, l- listeners long know that Ra he went on a a streak of just tugging himself off to my octopus's teacher for months and months. He loved it. Me just check out Smith Jiggles memes. Wait, and then he gave himself credit for winning them an Oscar. Yes. I don't know yes. if we have the full, I don't know if we want to go back, but basically RA was, he was up there on stage with them as they accepted the Oscar. Cause he thinks <laughs> the amount of chicklets fans that he had, had watch it bumped them enough on the documentary spectrum to win a fucking Oscar. <laughs> we have an Oscar under our belt. Holy shit. Uh, 
he fucking threw us off. All right, so we're talking about Sid. What were we talking about? I apologize. No, we were talking about the Prime Mantis, and we were talking about it Prime. on air, and it, we kind of just got lost in the sauce late in the broadcast about what an odd costume to wear. I mean, the, the, the moral of the story was the boys went and got banged up, though, <laughs> and then they finally won a fucking hockey game, and they, they had just needed to fun. loosen up. This. They were gripping the sticks too tight. A little too tight, and who had to get the boys going? And I got a bit of a rant. Well, I won't go too far. Sometimes uh, th these teams have bottom sixes who are so fucking vanilla, and they won't get the boys going. They won't do anything to drag their team into the fight. Ten minutes in, they were fucking horrendous, and it's Sid. Him going off after with the, the Faravy. Is that how you say it? Far Faravy, Farver Beans. For the Washington Capitals, he cross-checks them three times, and then boom. Right after that, they finally, the team answers the bell. They score a goal. Then they get one shorthanded with finally the bottom six, Jeff Carter contributing with that McGinn guy who's been awesome for them the last couple games. Brock McGinn, he's been a spark bug for them. So finally, they got they were alive, but all as a result, fucking Sidney Crosby dragging his team into the fight. Why does it always got to be him doing it? You're on a you're on a seven game slide and you're the Pittsburgh Penguins and he's been leading the charge, just like the we talked about with McDavid. Sometimes these fucking bottom six guys they got to become a factor. And I'm not even talking about just going out there scoring a goal. Just provide some energy. Go draw some penalties. Get in front of their goalie. Go fucking fight. Look at Tanner Janot right now. What's he doing? He's not providing offense after he did last year. Twenty four in his rookie year. And then after that game, when he helped them spark that comeback, when they, they in Vancouver, when they were down three nothing, he said, "Hey, I'm not providing offense right now, but I won't back down, and I'm going to provide that physicality to get my team sparked up." Who the fuck did he fight uh, last night or the night before? The heavyweight champ, Ryan Reeves. So enough with these fucking bottom six vanilla lattes. We need to get some hard nosed players back in the league to have a little bit of character who are willing to get the, the boys into the mix. When maybe you, you know, oh, it's a Wednesday night. You're on the national broadcast here. Let's go. So good job to Sid to get the, get, getting the boys going. That's what I got to say about that. Even Ovi was throwing the weight around for Washington. Cool. They got he, more... hammered, he hammered somebody behind the net. Uh, Ruda. Killed oh. Ruda. Blew him up. Ruda? Yeah, I mean, you know what's crazy, too, about the Pens is and I, I was I was wrong about this one. As of right now, I'll take the L on the forehead. Just another one about the Ty Smith and the John Marino deal from the Oof. This guy is unbelievable for the Devils. And and I wonder, like I thought he was good in Pittsburgh. I guess last year he struggled a little bit. And I, I and I hear that, you know, Hextall think thinks he's a little thought he was a little bit soft and I don't think Sullivan was thrilled when they traded him because that's a he's a good, solid top four defenseman. I don't know about numbers. You can come at me with all the numbers. I don't care if they're if they're not the good analytic numbers. Watching the Devils, I've now watched a couple of their games this year. Recently, they beat your Coyotes, Biz. Um, he's good, and that's a big loss for the Penguins. Penguins still though they're they're all right they're all right they had a big win where was their big win oh I'm a they, one, blank. They, they beat Toronto as well in Toronto oh, I'm sorry the road. so they how do I forget of, that they beat Toronto um but going back over to Washington I think they they deserve a little bit of slack right now uh, when we had the broadcast at that point they had forty million on the IR they got Carlson out of the lineup they have Orlov out of the lineup no T J Oshie no Wilson no Backstrom. No, uh, who's the one who played in Pittsburgh? Good penalty killer. Haglin. Haglin. Like that's f buddy. That's those are some fucking significant pieces. And they're, they're kind of keeping it on the rails. Kemper was playing extraordinary, had great numbers, has kind of fallen off the last couple games. So we're going to give them a little, little leeway, but very cool at this point in time, though, the amount of pressure that was put on Ovi and Sid when they came into the league, how many amazing head-to-head -head rivalries that they've produced, whether it's going back to the dueling hat-trick games, the numbers on them. I think they're two points spread out. I know Sid's lost, lost more time because of the head stuff. Look at the, the, the longevity on Ovi, given his physicality. There was a, a graphic that got put up, and I don't know if we have those numbers right here on the podcast, but the amount of hits that he's thrown compared to like Crosby, Malkin, and then it was somebody else, some of these big stars who have put up similar numbers. It, it, they, you would have had to multiply the three guys' combined numbers and hits to get 
the same amount of hits that Ovi has. Ovi's close to 3,000 hits in his NHL career. So pretty pretty insane, and, and it's always fun watching these guys go head-to-head. Wasn't really the matchup that we were expecting, but nonetheless, man, tip of the cap to those fucking guys, man. Nuts. When did uh, Wilson tear his ACL? What, what, when did that happen? I think right before playoffs last year. Yes. Yeah, so he's got – all right, so, yeah, he's around December, I read. Yeah, hopefully, the, you know, hopefully they get guys back sooner. The Bruins had Marshawn and McAvoy back way sooner than they thought they would. Yeah, he had surgery on May twenty fifth. Yeah, so I know I was long winded about that, um, but you know, figured figured we talk about the inter- what's that? Doing some math in my head. I didn't mean to be doing that out loud. Oh, I, I thought you were. I thought you said oh, yes. Math, oh. <laughs> uh, all right. Did you end up watching that game at all? Uh, I watched all, all the games on TNT this week. Yeah, went went on the club, what, put all the what, games what, on. What What did you think of the next one? I would say probably the, one of the biggest topics, in my opinion, on this podcast happened in the next game, and I'm going to let you tee it up for the night one. Yep, uh, the late game, uh, Minnesota visiting Anaheim, and we got sonked on a Michigan goal during the Wednesday late game. We thought our boy Trevor Zegers did it again, the dude. Scored his third Michigan, but the goal was overturned because Dmitry Kulikov was offside by an inch or two. And uh, your co-worker, Ali McHugh, he tweeted that uh, Kulikov should have gotten a game misconduct for being offside, which is pretty funny. <laughs> uh, but a lot of people are pissed off about it. Uh, Ray Ferraro, he, he was on his show and he said, you know, they got to do something about this rule and people saying this shouldn't happen. But, you know, it, should they make a change here? If so, what do they change? And is it fine the way it is? Like, what do people want to change here after we waited for the system for so long? Like, like, do we just want to ignore certain offsides or what? Hey, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I was this emotionally invested in the, the offside challenge before that broadcast, but they need to change this fucking rule and they need to change it now. That thing would have hit the airways. How many more fucking video games sold? How many more kids signing up for fucking ball hockey in, in, in California? The growth of the game, all because 45 seconds prior, Kulikov was offside by the width of a skate blade. It is the dumbest fucking thing. It slows down. I, you know what I want? I want, give me the analytics. Give me the fucking numbers on how many of these challenges are actually going back the other way. And we can all collectively as a group decide on whether this is fucking so goddamn stupid that we're slowing down the pace of action. Allow the human error. The the human error is a, is a, is a good thing. Like, Listen, I get it. If the guys, if, if it's a Rangers game, yeah, maybe the referee's getting killed in the parking lot. But that's got to be a risk to, uh, the league has to be willing to take. But f- for the amount of growth of the game, if that goal counts, that would have been his third Michigan. It, it's so good, and it's slowing down the pace of play. I want to know how many of these fucking things actually start coming back. And if you're the Minnesota Wild and you can't beat a team who hasn't had a win in regulation yet, you don't deserve to eventually make playoffs if you, you didn't get enough points because you couldn't beat Anaheim after they let in the Zegers michigan goal. Like, fuck off. No? Wit? Am I crazy here? No, I agree. I, I would love to disagree with you. And there are certain arguments about just getting the call correct. And when they review them, they 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 seem to be most of the time when the video re- um, coaches are quick enough to say review it. I think that's offsides. They get it right a decent amount. I hate it. I hate it. And when it ruins something like this, it makes me despise it. So I'm 100 percent with you. Um, Ray Ferraro had a great point on it as well in terms of human error and you know, if he calls one offside that wasn't, they don't get the two on one back. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, okay. So I think that so if there's you're a error referee... both ways, man. It's it's that's the game. It's the game's not supposed to be like I, I at least I, I personally I actually understand people's point of view on wanting to get it right, but personally, it's played. Refs make mistakes. Players make mistakes. It's just they get it right most of the time. I would say, like how how. Am I am I incorrect on that? No, I would probably say the Duchesne one fucked us all, or 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 I don't know if Kreider's ever gotten away with his, but but I, I completely agree with in in, a, in a, and maybe even capping off at a certain amount of time, but that, yeah, the good. amount of the amount of offsides that are probably being called that end up being called back, let's say throughout the full course of a season, if it's maybe forty goals, I just don't see it being worth it. 
And especially in this case, Gary Bettman has to have like a Batman phone where if he get the flashing light goes off, where if it's a Michigan being scored, where he could say, Hey guys, like <laughs> this might take care of a bit of the escrow at this point, that Michigan goal with all the highlights and the sports center clicks that it's going to get. So that's why I'm so emotionally invested. RA, I don't know how you feel about it from like a consumer standpoint, or if you think, Hey, if there's this much money involved, that they should be getting it right because they have the ability for the replay. But at this point, me, I could say fuck off with it all. Yeah. I mean, they have the technology and they have the opportunity. So teams won't get screwed. So if you want to do it away with it, cause you don't want to wait, then we're just going to see teams getting constantly screwed. We're going to see the replays. Oh, they, that shouldn't have counted because that, you know, we did away with this rule and now we got a goal that's counting and our team's going to go to the playoffs or move on to the playoffs. So, uh, people clamored for this years ago. Hey, if we have the technology and the cameras, let's get it right. And now people are like, well, we don't want to wait because it was an inch offside. It didn't affect the play. It's like, but it was offside. So it, you, you got to do right. all or nothing. You can't split the middle. You got you got to do all or nothing, I think, with it. Uh, yeah, I have a question for you in that. It should be you, punishable you by death if you being, call it and it's not. You remember it being the majority of people really wanted it? Because I feel like there was – because I, I never thought it was like a great I, – I, I didn't – it's the same thought of like having the, the the umpires and all the questioning they do to umpires in Major League Baseball. Now, I don't I don't enjoy the the video aspect of refereeing and umpiring games. So I don't remember like wanting it. But if you're saying everyone did, I believe you. I just don't remember well, that. Well, I think every team was getting screwed at some point. Not not necessarily know, every year, but over, of over the course. Of years. So, yeah, if you, you don't want your team to get screwed, especially if the playoffs are on the line or if it's in the playoffs and they have the means to fix it. So fix it. And if they do away with it, it's like, well, what are you going to have? Like if it happens two minutes after the goal, it doesn't count. I don't think that's really keeping with the spirit of the game. I think. I think they have to keep it as is or just do away with it totally, in which case people are going to just put the gifts online and say, oh, this should have been a goal. Uh, I know it sucks to wait and to lose fancy goals like that, but I don't know. It's all about keeping keeping the rules of the game. I, I have no problem. It's two or three minutes. It's not fun to wait, but it's not the end of the world, man. I'd rather they get it right than, than butcher it and have everybody complain more. All right. About the, I, well, about I, the, I, I think that oh. that's probably not a bad thing either, though, Wit. No, because then it creates more dialogue. Then, then all of a sudden, all all that clip's gonna go viral, and then everyone's gonna be like, "Ah, forty five seconds, it was offside." Ah. So you get more of the attention and bickering around it, which obviously draws more attention from viewers and 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 everything, all of it, the whole kit and caboodle. But I I, I see where you're coming from. I don't remember that many like botched offsides calls that changed the course of history in hockey. Do you like every team's getting screwed? You're talking about, I don't, I mean, are there any, le- do you guys even have one like legendary story I, I, of an I offside? I think a good compromise, I think I a, a, a good compromise would be if they introduced it come playoff time where, where more, more is on the line. But, uh, but to your question with, no, hate I'm that. sure. I'm sure one fan base will send Love us a that. video of a. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. Oh, we'll get some stories of some legendary offsides. But I'm just saying the the whole. All right. The other thing about the time difference in terms of, um. If it if it happens within ten seconds or something, it's like okay. Now then you get very arbitrary. But if you did pick a time, and you talked about a play going in the zone, and then forty five seconds later the goal gets scored, and you're going back that long on the time clock, and it's offsides, no goal. There's been so much time that the offsides, it didn't have any aspect on the play. They didn't get a scoring chance. The teams were in the zone. The defense was set up, and it was defensive zone coverage, and it has nothing to do with 45 seconds before that. So that's that's my my case. Okay. Okay. I think yeah. I think we I think we've had a good civil discussion about this. If you call the if you call the rule and you're wrong, it should be punishable by death. Though uh, another highlight of that game, uh, Kaprizov, who some people thought he wasn't going to be in the lineup. I don't know if you saw the incident with a lot of hounding on Kaprizov, not a lot of calls being made, a lot of frustration from him. If you ask their fan base, he gets mauled every game and he, and I, I understand why he's a freak of nature. He is so good out there and teams are given all the focus. They sick drew Doughty on him in LA and he ends up retaliating, gets a stick up, gets his glove up. I didn't even think he should have been kicked out of that game specifically. Then you got Dewey giving him the way of goodbye. Is that his new arch nemesis now that uh, Matthew Kachuk's on the East coast or what? I think he gets a new one every game. That's how he does it. That's how he's been doing it all these years. Did you think yeah. he should have got tossed? Um, 
Yeah, it looked it looked it, I don't think he meant to cross check him up there, but the video on the replay, it looked as though it was worthy of getting the game right there, getting the gate. Inadvertent, but doesn't really matter when you get the stick up near the nose, the mouth. So I understood him getting the boot. The, the, the wave was amazing. Um, so I, I don't watch them as closely. I, I wish I did. But it, even though this year seems to not be going as smoothly as last year, they can't score right now. But he still is. He's still producing at a ridiculous rate. He pretty much carries the play whenever he's on the ice. So I imagine that if he's not getting enough calls, that, that that's got to that's going to truly crush the Wilds' chance of winning. Because if well, they're on the power play, he's going to he's gonna get more points. Did you see the cheeky goal they scored on the five-on-three where they were just – him and Zuccarello were passing behind the net, and he just gave it a little quick wraparound. So they're starting to come. I know they got shut out two games in a row, and you got to think that maybe teams are taking some more liberties. They got Greenway. They got Felino out of the lineup. So that's a lot of toughness they're missing, and, of course, no Delorier anymore. So maybe uh, more liberties now that they don't have any meat in the lineup. Uh, I think that was pretty much it. Other than, oh, I will say that Dewar kid can chuck him. Him and that bull, you went toe to toe. There were some bombs being thrown there, R.A. Yeah, they were chucking nuts pretty good. Uh, back to uh, what's his name, uh, Kirill Kaprizov. He does have to help this team. People, well, they didn't forget Kevin Fiala is gone, man. He was a point per game guy last year. And taking a look at the stats right now, uh, doing it in L.A. Right, too. Right now, Minnesota is 24th in the league with 41 goals for us. So they're just not they don't have the score that they're going to need to get in the playoffs. But again, they've been kind of winning one, losing two. They're kind of one step forward, two steps back. But I think they'll be settled down. I think Mark andre Fleury, he, he kind of struggled early, playing well late. I think they're going to be there. They'll be in the, the, the mix for the playoffs. But yeah, Caprizov's got to get a lot more done and they do have to fill the void with uh, with no Fiala there. Uh, Biz, now it's time for you to, to eat your uh, humble pie. Oh, my God. Oh, again? Like, More? Yeah, I know. I know. It's like a weekly serving. Eat it I've to been, me. Thanksgiving's coming up. I've been getting dummied. Yeah. The New Jersey Devils. No beat. spit, no lube, sandpaper finish. Just getting, I'm getting fucking eight on one right now. Did any, Adriana, is there anyone out there besides a, 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 Adriana Chichik or whatever? I got the broken back right now. <laughs> is there anyone out there who, besides. Pasha and other diehard Devils fans who thought they were this good. I, I made a mistake, too. I, I'm openly admitting it. And, and I love that their fans are openly admitting their mistake as well. Ari could bring that up. But this is they're they're a group. They're a, they're a great team. But do people see this? Is this is someone going to try to say they called that they were going to yeah. be this good? Well, Pasha did. And I'll say this score one besides that mutant score one for the analytic community because they were raving about this team coming in the other team they were raving about some in which were were the vancouver canucks so it could be hit or miss just like our opinions but i was dead wrong on this group ra i'm gonna let you probably read off a few stats if you got any but they are just all system go right now They're not, they, they skipped wagon status they went right to the fucking freight train status Yep, the Devils beat uh, Biz's Yotes Saturday 4-2 to two for their ninth straight win, making them 12-3. and three. It's the first time they've won nine straight since 2007. Uh, only Vegas and Boston have more than their 24 points. And the fans actually started some I don't think I've ever seen before. Uh, Lindy Ruff, they booed him at the first game. He was, like, kind of flabbergasted. Well, the other day, this chant started, sorry, Lindy. Sorry, Lindy. And I don't think I've ever seen that it, a crowd chant the sorry uh, chant to a coach before. He said after he had a laugh, we'll have a beer with these guys after. And, you know, the vibes are good. And like you just said, Biz, who expected this? Well, the analytic community, they're not surprised by this at all. Um, other, other teams started hot. Buffalo and Philly, I think the, the uh, fancy stats, people were waiting for them to tail off. And they have quite a bit. Uh, but the Devils, they're still right there. And I think a big part of this, we already mentioned the John Marino trade. Tommy Fitz made an unreal trade. New Jersey sent 22-year-old Ty Smith. He's a pending RFA after this year. Currently in the NHL at a third pick. They got back Marino. This kid's a 25-year-old. He signed through 27 at $4.4 million. And you might look at the stats. They don't jump out at you. But this kid is a three-zone player. He's all about suppression chances. Every time he has the puck, New Jersey owns possession. This, this team is like an analytical down right now. And like I said, those people aren't surprised at all. They've been expecting this. So uh, it's it's great. It's mixing up hockey. I don't. I know you don't like it right now, Biz, but I don't know. It's good to have a little outline. You know what like my this. biggest fear was? 
is because everybody was chirping their goaltending was I was going to say they're going to pull a rabbit out, out of their ass and all of a sudden this new kid in the organization and he's only played four periods and talk about getting dummied Schmied uh, a, a, or a, 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 a Asia Akira Schmied over here all of a sudden <laughs> four fucking periods his numbers are insane and 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 my luck would have it he's probably going to be the next Martin Brodeur for their organization that's what's happening right now and the amount of momentum this team has their back end, everybody. And to go back to the, I said, I wasn't going to, I won't jump on the train, but I said, I wouldn't give them the proper praise that they deserve until they apologize as a fan base to Lindy Ruff. Well, holy shit. They actually the did it. The brat pack. And you, you mentioned all these people who might've believed in this team before they actually started proving it. This guy who's on his social media who brought a bunch of their fans, the Brat Pack fans, to the game, they started the chant in the upper bowl. And we're going to get to the building and how much that's rocking. Oh, Christ. I, I think I saw on TV the other night when they won their ninth in a row, somebody, some girl doing a key toke off a guy's cock in the lower bowl. That's how crazy things have gotten at the presidential center. But this guy has, has got a following, the, the Brat Pack. He knew that I think it's. Prudential, presidential, oh, the, that presidential center. That place is sick. He brought a bunch of his fans and fans of his Twitter account. They got the chant going and the team, the PR team. Have you seen these memes they've been posting to after their W's? They deserve the whole crew deserves a raise. They bring all the chanters down to the ice. And yes, but brat, yes, but brat comes out of the locker room to come over and they chant eight more years eight more years so the vibes are so high there and i've to been made to feel like such a fool and i'm sorry i mean maybe the hate started with pasha being in my ear for three years and then finally getting it right you know where i do think things might have changed though wit is when we we ran into lindy ruff in buffalo we outside did? that restaurant oh my god he was there all right did we ever tell that. you that we bumped into him I think you might have mentioned out there, but I don't know if I got the particulars. What the, what did happen? Was it a restaurant? Well, were you guys at a bar? I uh, I went outside for a cigarette. Sometimes went on these sandbagger trips, and, and we were there for the Chicklets Cup. You know, you get a little bit degenerate. But I was there, and 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 Lindy walked out, and he fucking asked me for a cigarette, and so I was like, oh, okay, well, that's fucking Lindy Ruff. I didn't say anything right away, and I gave him a cigarette, and he pulled a a, 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 a match stick out of his ear, like on the top of his ear, and he fucking lit it on his tongue. And I was like, holy fuck, dude, this Lindy Ruff's a bit of a fucking badass. So we got chatting, and uh, and then finally I said, hey, uh, Mr. Ruff, uh, you know, will, will you come on our podcast? And he inhaled the smoke, and it felt like he held it for about 15 seconds. He, seconds. he looked like he was fucking Clint Eastwood in one of those Western movies. And then he exhaled and said, what the fuck is a podcast? And after that, I said, you forget I even asked you, and I, I said, that motherfucker right there is going to win the Jack Adams next year, and sure as shit, here we are. Crazy. He rode off on a on a buffalo, too. On a, on a buffalo, on a bison. He got probably at good cost when he was coaching there, winning a fucking Jack Adams. So show some respect. Jack Adams favorite. Right put now. some respect on Lindy Ruff's name, New Jersey fans. Most and I, and I accept your apology as well. And, and people I, say we're a Bruins podcast, though. We haven't even brought up, like, the best team in the league once this year. So I just wanted to bring that up. But the Devils, congratulations. Made me uh, very incorrect on all my takes as of right now as well. And the building was bumping. People are all – people are tagging me left and right. Left and right. Look at this atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, you guys have won now nine in a row. I'd hope it'd be good. But a lot of the times when the, the team was going through their past few seasons, it wasn't great. I, I 100% agree when you guys are buzzing and that team's winning, the place looks awesome. So lay off me. I'm starving. Maybe I'll make a bet. Maybe if uh, you keep this winning streak going all the way to when I'm there on December 6th, if you guys can keep winning and you win when Chicago's in town, maybe I'll do a line of blow off Frank the Tank's cock in the lower bowl, just like I saw the other night on TV. Is that too much? Uh, either I'm, way, I'm down for that. Biz, the Devils, they're getting it done with like quality, but not top flight goaltending. They're still getting it done. Uh, Mackenzie Blackwood sprained MCL. He's going to be out four to six weeks. Uh, Vitek Vanacek got dinged up in a collision with Thomas Shabbat. Had to leave the game. He's going to miss a little bit of time. But like we just mentioned, Akira Schmidt, uh, New Jersey's fifth round Asia pick. Asia Akira. Schmidt. In 2018, he came on in relief of Vanacek, won that game. And then he got his first career win, win starting versus Arizona the other day. So 
you know, these guys are, are winning without, like I said, top flight goaltender. But I think what we saw last year, Colorado won the Stanley Cup. I mean, not to diss Darcy Kemper, but, you know, he wasn't the cons. Mike winner for that team last year. He did an adequate job, but they didn't need him to win every game. So I don't know if we're going to see this, if teams can overcompensate for you know, average goaltending. Who knows what's going to happen here with Jersey? But uh, as we saw last year. That's a great happened. point, R.A. I tried to say that on the national broadcast with stats, and then that's when Gretzky told me stats are for losers. So I guess, <laughs> I guess you could shove all those fucking analytics that everybody's talking about with the Devils up my up up your cornhole. But uh, you got we got to pump their tires, man. What a start to the year, and and I, and I hear you. But but hey, but our luck, Asia Akira Schmidt's going to bend us over, and he's going to in fact be the next Martin Brodeur, and they're going to run away with three cups in a row. And oh, Pasha's going to be in my every ear. time you say that Gretzky <laughs> quote. Uh, stats are for losers. I always think of um, Sean Connery and The Rock. The RA always says the line. You know what I'm talking about? That's like no. Gretzky's version of that. Losers whine about doing their best. Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. That, <laughs> that for one? some reason, that when I hear Gretzky say stats are for losers, I think of that line in that movie. Great All right, movie, that might have been Ed, your, Ed Norton, your best. Ed Harris. What's his that that might have been your best Sean Connery impression all time on the podcast. On the spot, show of hands. I, Thank you. I appreciate it. Right? That. <laughs> you got any more? Down. Uh, not off the top of my head, but uh, a couple other notes on the Devils. They're going to be out without Andre Palat for eight to ten weeks. He underwent groin surgery. Uh, the team also named franchise le- franchise legend Marty Brodeur executive vice president of hockey operations. So, I don't know. Things are looking up right now for the Devils, and we'll see what happens. But, boys, we didn't even mention our guest we're getting to shortly because we had so much to talk about. I think it's time to send it to this madman, Andre Wah. I we were talking before the show. This is going to be probably what top three, top five funniest interviews. He's going to be Mount Rushmore by the end of this one, folks. Buckle up. The impersonations will take you on a ride. Uh, insane. So why why, why is he playing with him every single day? Like you'll, 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 you'll hear in a minute here, but, um, guy who kept it loose. So we appreciate him coming on. Our interview today is brought to you by our friends at cross country mortgage. They've been a great partner of chicklets for a while. Now CCM listens, understands and communicates throughout the entire loan process. And they provide a ton of options customized to your financial situation using innovative technology. They have faster closing times than their competitors, stable monthly payments and low to no down payments. Plus, plus you can use your existing equity to use for larger things like debt consolidation or home renovation, which I'm going through right now. I'm in the middle of a home renovation so see if you qualify today. Visit ccm.com slash barstool. Once again, that is ccm.com slash barstool. Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, NMLS, 3029. All loans subject to underwriting approval. NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Now, back to the program. All right, it's time for our next guest. This bruising winger was drafted in the sixth round of the 94 draft. After a couple of years in the Bruins system, he made stops in Ottawa, Pittsburgh, Calgary, and Tampa Bay, where he won a Stanley Cup with the 2004 Lightning. He played 515 NHL games, and he also had a few other adventures in hockey that we'll get to soon. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Andre Wah. Thanks for coming on, brother. How you been? Hey, pretty good. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, great intro, too, by the way. How are you guys doing? <laughs> I, sh- I should work at a, a tire shop with the tire yeah. when I do on this thing. <laughs> right on. Biz Wit, how are you doing? Wazi, well, hey, it's sp- great to have you on here, buddy. Hey, yeah, speaking, of, uh, speaking of intros, first thing Talkit said was, oh, I heard he does unreal intros in the lock room for the boys so you've been a you've been a, this caricature that we've been talking about on the podcast for a long time and finally we get you on man You're i know i know goon baby it took a while yeah yeah <laughs> my t-shirt goon it's from uh gong show the guys in ottawa yeah, uh, set yeah. me up once in a while jerry mcnamee those guys are great so uh but no it's been a while i was like uh, because I, I people would always tag my name too and on twitter or whatever you guys gotta get andre on the on the chicklets and that so i was like <laughs> whip knows me biz i don't know but it'll probably come one day and now finally i don't know it's been what four or five years I was just wondering, was it because something I did that was it at the Mark Recchi Halloween party uh, with? Maybe I took my uh, Michael Jackson, uh, Michael Jackson trap on and hit you in the face with it. Anyways, <laughs> remember that, Wit? 
Oh, it's amazing. He had a big hog tied around his waist from Michael Jackson. <laughs> with a 12-inch dildo hanging around. He was smacking me. Oh, in yeah. And then I got my head shaved later that night. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, I go there, so it's the Pittsburgh Penguins Halloween party, eh? So I went as Michael Jackson, obviously, had the big 12-inch yeah, strap on uh, the Peter North uh, pattern there. So uh, anyways, I had Jocelyn Tebow, a tiny goalie, as you guys know. He's tied up to my wrist like those little, so you don't lose your kids at, at Disney, you know? So I had oh, Josh Tebow <laughs> tied up, and Tebow had like a mini pajama that we got at Walmart for 10 oh, year olds. He had like a necklace with a penis in the, well, just anyways, we had to make it really, uh, but anyways, it's just oh for God. fun. And I oh, think guys God. had a good chuckle out of it. Anyways, it was funny. Oh, that, would get, that would get you banned from the league nowadays. Holy <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Gloves are off. Gloves are off. Well, this is a good start. I think that uh, a lot of you, know why the fuck we got this maniac on there's so many <laughs> one I mean, of the funniest teammates i've ever had in my life oh, like was oh he like God. and the noise you always made the noises this guy has a million different noises he'd make chara be skating by the bench we'd hear the star wars noise yeah it was uh <laughs> no i don't know it's just people always ask me so yeah you're a funny guy. Tell us jokes. I was like, I'm not like a guy that no. brings jokes. I'm more a guy that I react in the moment, like whatever. It would be at Morton Steakhouse, and I see the waiter there, and something will pop up. I'll just get up, and I don't know. I'll grab the tray, and or I'll grab, let's say, what they put the big trays on, the kind of the stand thing there, and start walking like an old man, <laughs> like I, I'm limping with the people in the restaurants. are like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? Anyways, just guys are like, what's he doing? Anyway, serving steaks, um, whatever, you know, so. You so, just yeah. kept the room loose. You kept exactly. it loose all the time. Actually, I was watching something. What what was the time on YouTube you're <laughs> You're skating out in Tampa and you and your knee, you wouldn't bend your knees. I don't know if you've seen this. Man. Just straight hey, yeah. hey, that the time, chopstick okay, dance. Say, so they bring us the, the Stanley Cup 2004 Stanley Cups champs. They bring us out. I think it was the 10 year anniversary or 15. No, it was the 10, whatever. So Torts was actually with uh, Vancouver, the Canucks back then. So they brought us in for the weekend. They wanted to do a, just a special weekend, have the, the old five, uh, old four alumni guys just come on the ice and wave, whatever. So uh, we're in Tampa. Obviously we golfed all day, crushing beers, vodka, whatever, you know, we showed up at the rink. I'm a little, I'm feeling good, you know? So, and, and as we're going one by one, they, they asked us actually to put on skates, to go on the ice and wave to the fans and, which I was like, all right. Uh, so we just grabbed skates and boxes in the, the, the old uh, locker room there. So I grabbed the Victor Redmond skates. They're like 17, size 17. <laughs> I'm like, those are probably the only one that fits. But as I go on, I got Brad Lukowicz behind me and Nolan <laughs> Pratt anyway. So uh, they're like, you won't do anything. So you can't say that to me. So I was like, yeah. So he, they're like, just go and pretend you're falling. No, I'll do better. I'll just go out and pretend, you know, I'm a beer league skater. I, can, I forgot how to skate, whatever. So as they go, number 36, Andre, why jump on the ice? And then I just go with the straight legs. I used to do it in practice. With oh, my I remember bucket. you doing it in practice. That's yeah. why I was laughing so hard. Exactly. <laughs> So I go on the ice and the crowd's kind of cheering, <laughs> clapping their hands. But then, oh, son, you could see, I, I didn't, I, I saw it after when I watched the videos of me jumping on the ice, but the fans are all like, oh my God, oh my God, what happened? Then the tr Twitter blew up. People were like, what happened, Andre? Wah? Has he been in an accident? Uh, <laughs> did he get hit by a, a car or has he, uh, whatever? <laughs> so it was just, it got out of control. But the guys that knew me, that my buddies, they text me, they were crying. <laughs> they saw the game on air. They're like, you're fucked. I was like, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to have a good time, make it fun. I don't know. Then I, I skate. I even had to stop like in a, a V stop kind of by stop. JP Stern towards. Stop. And they're like, you're a beauty anyway. So I just sat there. I, I stood there after on the, the circle. But everybody was like, wow, Sweet. what happened to them? So I had to do a, I did a video in my beer league the next week just to show I can still 
uh, skied and score a lot of goals, I could still play in this league right away. Oh, easily. Hey, the video too. The video goes over to the, the Vancouver bench and some of the guys are like, what the hell? And then Sadiq's oh, yeah. just like dying laughing. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the other thing. I used to work out with Alex Burroughs. Burroughs was on the bench. He said, I was crying. And guys are like, <laughs> What what's wrong? Like he can't play. He can't skate. He can't. He, 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 Burroughs told everyone he's like he's fucking around. Trust me, he is fucking around. Oh, I don't think anyway, I've so, ever laughed this hard on yeah. the pod. This is <laughs> but fucking... after I was like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I should. Uh, so I guess this year they're doing the the twenty. No, no, that's true. It's a twenty fifth anniversary of uh, the Lightning's existence. You know, so they're supposed to bring us in March or something. So I'll do something else there. Well, the one that got this all sparked up, and I think I reached out to you via, uh, via Twitter after, was when we had uh, Brad Richards on. And he talked about yeah. the situation in the plane. Now, <laughs> I, I think I remember it being after a, a big, significant playoff loss. Yeah. So walk us through that one. And obviously, this is another one of your spur of the moments that like, is told throughout the entire hockey universe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I've told, actually, this story quite a bit different events. I do these hockey events anyways, podcasts, but I think it's still for people that never heard it. Uh, so we lost. We're, we're in Philly. It was game six. So we were up by two goals, I think five minutes left. So we're all, yeah, man, we're going to the finals, you know? So they, uh, they scored a goal, made it 3-2. They pulled their goalie 3-3, went to overtime, and Philly scored 4-3. So tough loss, I thinking we're going to the finals, game six. So we're going back to uh, Tampa. We're, we're going to on our charter plane. Everybody's bummed out, obviously. Big loss, it hurts, you know, but... Uh, we come in the plane, and uh, as we everybody sits down, uh, one of the stewardess uh, just passed. She fainted. I don't know. We heard like a big boom in the back there. So, you know, one of the trainers ran in the back. They're all looking after her. Obviously, she she's down there. Just oh my god, I don't feel good. I don't know what happened. I'm just so excited, you know. So, um, so as I, I'm, I'm, we just sat on the plane. Marty St. Louis comes <laughs> and he's like, Andre, you got to do something. Thing. I'm like, what are you talking about, Marty? He's like, look at look at this. Look at the plane. Look at the long faces. They all have the Colby Armstrong faces. I was like, yeah, I know. So I, <laughs> he's like, what do you want me to do? He's like, do something. We got to cheer. We got to change this move. We got one game left in our barn, game seven. It's not over. I was like, I know, but it's, you know, he's like, no, but just do something. Said, yeah, but towards, you know, he's like, never mind towards go and do something, change that. I was like, okay, what should I do? What should I do? So as the Stewie went down there, I was like, oh, that's what I'll do. I'll serve the meals. So I went in the back and I, the, the other girl was like, hey, do you have any extra aprons? So she's like, uh, why? Why do you want that? I was like, never mind why. Just give me a fucking apron. So <laughs> she's like, they're up. Oh my God. Oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because they, they kind of knew me. So I, I went in the bathroom, got butt naked put on the apron on, you know, had the baby arm hanging in front. And uh, so I go in the back. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, he's not, though. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So I go in the back. There was the cookie tray that usually they give, they give out after dinner. But I grabbed the cookie tray and I, I kind of put a, a cookie in my ass and my butt crack and I squeezed it, but it could, it all crumbled up anyways. But I, so I, I went up, went by the, the, the two uh, stories, whatever. And I was like, hi guys, I know you're hungry. Are you, would you like a cockley? We got chicken, we got chocolate chip, macadamia. And we got, we got also uh, uh, more stuff coming, but in the meantime, so no, you're good. So, so I was just going all the way up and just with my ass sticking out behind, you know, people, you could see all the, the shit, the crumble in my ass. I was like, no, I didn't, I didn't poop myself. It's just a cookie. It's just, I squeezed it and it just crumble in my booty. So anyways, I just went up. I was trying to just clowning around, you know, and uh, I went all the way up. And then I, I just, my guys were all chuckling and laughing and that, having a good chuckle out of it. So I, after a while, I was like, I might as well, you know, so I stay like that. And then the food was kind of coming out. So I started going and giving steaks and salmon to the guys up front, you know, all the way, almost to the coaches up there. Everybody was laughing in the plane anyway. So 
Uh, yeah, so we won game seven because I cooked my ass. No, no, just <laughs> no, but it kind of it just changed the mood. Kind of guys were laughing. That's and unbelievable I, that St. Yeah. Louis was thinking about it. So you said it was St. Louis came yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, Marty just came up to me. He's like, do something, do wow. something, like, do something. I, I don't know. So, and Marty, he loves to laugh. Like, yeah, he's in the and he's, uh, he's in his seat and he's like, <laughs> Andre, Andre, come here. <laughs> I find <five>, Andre. <laughs> Andre, come here. <laughs> and he likes to laugh. He laughs just like that. So I'm like, I give him a high five. Guys are giving me high five. I'm like, <laughs> anyway, so we had a good chuckle. Then after a while, you know, went back oh. to my seat. Guys start playing cards and, uh, you know, uh, started, uh, forgot about the game six. And uh, yeah. And then that we're, uh, we, we, anyways, awesome. it changed the mood, you know, it's just the uh, fucking rights. It did, man. Yeah, I yeah, believe exactly. in that shit. I, ju- oh. I just like to, yeah. I just think biz, you know, with everybody, you know, it's just a season is so long and I know you have to be so and, monotonous. And, yeah, exactly. Right? The meetings we have the video and always, sometimes it, it gets like, it's, it's like a record just every day, the same thing, uh, do this, do that. And, it gets pretty heavy just to, to handle all that. So I think it's good to have a guy, a good locker room guy, just have fun. And I like to, to, to clown around kind of like that and have the guys uh, laugh once in a while. Obviously, there's always a time to be more serious, you know. But uh, other than that, uh, on the bus, the plane, whatever, we, we, I'd like to, to have the guys chuckle. Did, so. did, did you ever cross the line to where you were fucking around too much, where you got pee-pee whacked by one of your coaches? I thought Terrian gave it to you one time. <laughs> it's like, not now, was he? <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, with Torts, actually, we, uh, we were okay. You know, it was after the Cup. Uh, after Pitt, I went back to Tampa. And we lost a big game, like 6-1. But, you know, when you you lose a game next day, you kind of, it's a new day, right? And I was always like uh, Alex Alexander Svitov. Svitov, big Russian kid. I don't know if you guys remember. First yeah. round, big, didn't, uh, didn't speak much English. Anyways, he went back to KHL after. And I was, every time he would shoot, score a goal, I'd go, <laughs> and he would just laugh like the Russian anthem, you know, so. And then uh, one time I was doing it so often that Svitov brought in the locker room the anthem of the Russian anthem. So we put it in the stereo and I cranked it up towards came in. He was so mad. You fucking guys. He fucking, after last night, the way you played, you're having fun at a party here, whatever. He was like all pissed off because we're pranking the, the Russian anthem. So he gave it to Svidov actually because he knew like Svidov was by the stereo laughing. <laughs> I love America. <laughs> Let's jump on some balls, play hockey. So anyways, but uh, George kind of gave it hey. to him. And, uh, hey, uh, but, another another Russian. Apparently, uh, when you, whenever you would swear, Malkin would just start laughing and giggling. Like, what was it about you, you swearing that made him? Wazzy, giggling? not to interrupt Biz. Bi- no. Hey, Wazzy, we we went back last week and it was like we never talked to him. Remember, the guy couldn't speak English. Now yeah. he's fucking hilarious talking to Biz and I. <laughs> I know, I know. It was funny. It was just da do da 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 what do you want? And then he point his uh, he point his winner condom. Hey! Condoms! Yeah. Oh, okay, condoms. That's the trainer, Gino. But uh, <laughs> just uh, but he was Dana. really hard to understand. We do signs and all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Comb his hair with a pork chop, uh, Gino. <laughs> but yeah, just a great kid, though. You know, <laughs> just funny as hell. I haven't oh. seen him too in years, so I imagine his English is better. He's got better so, English than me yeah. now. Yeah. Hey, what's this thing with you guys in the in pit with the microphone? Oh, hey, Sydney. Was it? You would have loved it. it like, it's actually really? it was it was actually built for you. What Biz did? He Biz just started yeah. screaming at him on the jumbotron. I know. <laughs> He's and like, Sid was fuck? looking up, and I was like, I could just picture Mario and in, in his suite just looking at, at you guys like. What the, I don't know if he, uh, <laughs> but that was hilarious. I was like, imagine me at the Bell Center, Montreal. Hey, 
hey marty what's up it's andre <laughs> i don't know he'd be like what the fuck is this i got a Security. cookie in my asshole <laughs> <laughs> exactly oh. cookie crumble in my ass but uh yeah but hey, remember with I don't know, Ari's not speaking much. Sorry, I don't know if you. No, he's not. No, I'm, I'm listening. Laughing laughing. My balls off. I, stroke. Uh, I don't want to interrupt I, these great stories. And Pitt also, um, I uh, that that when I signed as a free agent, we had the lockout after the cup. I'm the only guy probably that that probably celebrate party for 14 months straight, celebrating a Stanley Cup win because there was a lockout. I didn't play, just hammered, signed with Pitt, came up out of shape completely. Uh, but I got hurt early on in the season. That's where I'm going because I'm speaking of Mario. So I remember being in trainer's room. Guys are on the ice. I think with you might have been there anyways. And then I grabbed one of the Pittsburgh Penguins uh, flag they had in the room. I put it around my neck. I tied it up. And I had these tight underwear, like under armor, really tight, you know. And uh, they were like, you won't go out there. And uh, I was like, yeah, watch me. So I just went. I, cl- I went up the stairs all the way, section two. 200 and i'm screaming super penguin and i'm just <laughs> running in the stairways going down and up guys are on the ice and then they're just looking at me but i kind of forgot that mario's on the team i'm like man the owner my idol mario lemieux then i was like oh shit what did i just do then i looked i looked up and i see mario was kind of bent on his stick laughing <laughs> so i was like okay i think i'm all right for a while anyways but guys were uh, out there on the on the ring to practice just stopped like looking at at me the donkey up there in the melon arena you know when my well, remember said. remember san jose remember san jose <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> take us through that one that was that was the hardest i've ever i've ever laughed like in a there's, there's so much stories that people ask me and i i wish all my former teammates could bring back some stuff but yeah that that's one that's a good story so Again, healthy scratch. Can you believe it? Hey, eh? a guy like me. Yeah, so I'm scratched Bullshit. again, you know. Politics. Pure, pure talent. Just you and me, Biz. We know what it is anyways. But <laughs> so I do the pregame skate in San Jose. It's all right walk, you know, just so people know you walk, uh, you know, quite a, you know, I said maybe five, six locker rooms. Uh, so I, I do the warm up as I come off. I, I at one point I think Taryn was the coach now. So at one of you was, was held. I was being scratched. Whatever. At one point I was like, all right, I'm just gonna have fun with this. And while I see what whatever is happening next, so I got off. I hurried up, hurried up, and I went where we changed the players. So I went in San Jose, and I I, I was looking for a tight suit. So I grabbed. I think it was Neil Zekman's suit. Yep. It was a little Swedish kid there, Ikea. So I grabbed his uh, pants there and his <laughs> his dress shirt. But I felt like Hulk. If I, I flexed forward, I think I might have ripped his shirt anyways. But it was kind of funny because his pants were so tight. That's actually the new style today. You look at the players with their suits all tight and that. But back yeah, then, kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> so it was halfway to my chin uh, my shins yeah sorry and uh then really tight on my quads that so i i go out there and i'm like i go see the security guys there and in san jose people so you know they they wear purple jacket like barney i love you you love anyway so i go see this guy's like can i borrow your, your suit jacket just for for five minutes I, I, I don't know i don't know so i'll give you a dollar okay so I gave him a dollar go buy yourself a box of a duncan timbits anyway uh, no, just, so <laughs> timbits is here <laughs> i mean munchkins and duncan donuts anyways where am i going with this so i grabbed this guy's jacket i said okay, i need the walkie talkie so he's like yeah it's just to have fun with the guy so i get the the cb walkie talkie the jacket i grab some gel dippity doop comb my hair on the side and then i just stand where the players are jumping in the corner in san jose by the glass so i'm there standing there with my arms like i'm a bouncer a club bouncer <laughs> whatever so <laughs> I see the guys, they're coming out for the game. So I've been sitting there for 10 minutes, whatever. So uh, they're coming. I was like, all right, make sure you clear the hallway. The Pittsburgh Penguins are actually making their way on the ice. Clear the... But I'm kind of, I'm like, I'm figuring out that the players will look up, say, hey, that's fucking wazzy. Anyways, so they're all coming out. 
And then as I'm talking, nobody, they're all in their kind of their game mode or they're full of flowers, the first guy. So I'm like, come on, flower, Galis, in French. So flower turns, uh, <laughs> turns real quick sideways. He looks at me and all I see is this big smile. You know how flowers always, and he's <laughs> laughing. <laughs> I see him on the ice and then Whip shows up. Oh my God, an army and Bugsy. Oh my God, let's do Jaeger bomb, Wazzy. So anyways, all these guys are coming out and the guys are counting. They're all giggling and I, I turn around in the glass. I kind of go against the glass with my arms against the glass. Like I'm a huge fan of the penguins. <laughs> I got the purple leather. Let's go penguins. And I'm banging in the glass. They're all howling. Oh, next thing you know, I think it was two or three nothing after five minutes i said fuck i get really fucked up and oh, i think no. i ripped the i, I ripped and terry the had to walk the, the other the coaches way. had to walk across the ice in that building too so they had to walk by each other. Oh, yeah. it wasn't like one that went right from the room oh yeah oh, yeah they, they went right by me right oh. by me i was like oh buddy san jose it- san jose there was like a 10-year stretch where like you just needed to survive oh, yeah. the first 10 minutes Oh, it was something about the bar. Like, I don't know if it was, yeah. it was so, de- so depressing in there. It's so City dark. sucks. Oh. And we, we couldn't win there. Hey, it was tough to win. San oh, Jose yeah. was, wow, the yeah. shark tank. But They uh, were swarming. Oh, yeah, for sure. But uh, were you, yeah, uh, you, were, were you yeah, always like that all the way up as a kid? Like, were you always the class clown? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I always like to, uh, yeah, in class too, I got kicked out of class quite a bit. Just, you know, I know if it was just just a way of, I don't know, I just like to have the class uh, laugh. And also, you know, at at, at that age when you're you're maybe in 12, 13, 14 grade, you know, girls are laughing. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, she likes me. Anyway, so I just kind of... Yeah, just like to clown around the class, but obviously sometimes teachers were like, all right, that's enough. Some days I'd walk in, Andre, just go outside. I don't want you in the class today. So I was like, all right, good talk. <laughs> it's not often like a correlation of like a, like a humorous guy like yourself and someone who like fights or at least enjoys fighting. When did that come along? Like, were you, like when you were playing minor hockey, were, were you a goal scorer? And then all of a sudden you had to do it to survive? Like, when did that all begin? <laughs> What was I a goal scorer? Was I ever a goal scorer? <laughs> One of the best players in Quebec. Never was, lost no, juice, boy. Seriously, uh, Biz, I was, I was uh, yeah, I was quite a good player. Always uh, top two scorer on the team, top three, you know, uh, scoring lots of goals. Big. I was tall, more skinny, you know, minor hockey. Uh, then uh, Bantam Midget started playing a little more physical, you know, because – and, and I think I grew up with two brothers, two older brothers. Yeah, we fought a little bit. I don't know if I, I don't know how, yeah, I have a short temper, but, but I mean, got to be careful. On the ice is different, you know, obviously. But uh, I, I remember minor hockey as I was getting older, playing contact, you know, uh, I was getting pissed off. Sometimes guys were trying to run me and I just, you know, retaliate or whatever or take Dude, you number snap and sometimes. Them. You know, three seconds late and just jump an elbow to the jaw. Here you go, bud. Remember me? Anyways, I didn't. I didn't. But but uh, I could play <laughs> hockey. And then when I got drafted, I always tell people this as a good player. Then I got drafted in the Q, Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. And I remember a guy I knew said, well, you're 6'2", whatever, and uh, you're tall. Guys are going to try to fight you. And when I I I, I joined the uh, the league back then, fights, fights. There was maybe seven, eight guys that could fight per yeah, team. That was, crazy. that was maybe ninety two, yeah, ninety one, ninety two, ninety three. Anyways, so a lot of fighters in the league, and I was like, really? He's like, oh yeah. And if they if you back off, you know, for sure you they'll cut you. And I my dreams NHL NHL like most of us, most of the guys, yeah. we you know we all wanted to play NHL. And I said, I'm going to find a way to make it. And I always, it's funny, I always try to copy, people laugh at me, but it's true. I always try to copy Cam Neely, Rick Tockett type, Wendell Clark, you know, good, tough player can fight and that. I wanted to play like that. So I, I still could play, you know, in the queue, I finished with 33 goals at 19. Yeah. 323 pins and I started fighting I remember my first fight Patrick Cote uh not the MMA guy but uh he played in Nashville Dallas uh anyways I fought him 
And then I, I fought a second time. Then I was like, man, I'll just do this. You know, it, it was all right. Got, at first, it was not pretty. It was kind of you're swinging for the fence and falling down. And then I picked it up, and then I started being not too bad with it. You know, my second year, I started feeding guys pretty good. And uh, anyways, yeah, so I got drafted in Boston. And um, going to camp there, uh, yeah, I was young, Dad. But I remember one of the scouts who told me, uh, He's like, Andre, after my second camp, I think, uh, he's like, uh, we drafted you to be uh, not to score goals, just so you know. I was like, oh, oh okay. It was sort of, uh, okay. I, I, I like to score oh, goals. Oh, thanks. It, it makes oh. more money, you know. I want, I I want to play goals like thing. Brad Richards and, and Eginla and all those guys, you know. And, <laughs> but anyways, when he told me that, it kind of, it processed to my mind that I was like, all right, maybe I'll have to, you know, just hit, fight, do whatever to, because uh, I still wanted, I had a foot in, but nothing was settled yet. So, and then my third year with the Bruins just went downhill. I got cut right away. First guys went into Providence, um, hanging out Foxy Lady too much, I think. I, I, anyways, but it was, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, just kidding. But we we were uh, I was there. I had Bob Francis for two years. He was good to me, you know, pretty strict. But uh, then Tommy McVie came along, and me and Tom, it was tougher, you know. And at one point, I think uh, me and him, we kind of <laughs> uh, crashed. Um, you know, we just just didn't get along. So he sent me to Charlotte in the East Coast League. That's why I finished. I played uh, twenty five games in the coast. So. I finished the year there, to totally dominated, you know, 18 points, 25 games, 90 pims, killed everyone. And uh, it was just, <laughs> by the way, I'm being sarcastic. So people are like, really? Is he for real? Who is I this know, guy? Yeah, a few of the they, they can't yeah. tell they're, they're, they're yeah. morons. They're no, I know, but it, it, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I went down there and the guys were great. Guys obviously partied a lot. You know, we had a good time, you know. But uh, anyway, so after that year, I signed as a free agent and I played in the IHL one year in Fort Wayne where I, I racked up 395 pims, but it was just, you know, I, I'm fighting a lot, jumping guys, uh, jumping in the stands. Uh, it was like the, 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 the Charles Town Chiefs, you know, I was just, yeah. I, I remember this time, you know, but lots of fight, but at the end of the games, a lot of time there was brawls, five on five. I was always in the middle of it anyways, but uh, so a lot of 10 minutes and that, but I remember back then too, there was shootouts and in practice, I was actually good at scoring all the time as one of the last guys left. They're like, oh, well, anyway, so at one point, one game against Hindi, I think they decided to put me out there like second or third shooter. So I, I, I went out there. I actually did it two games before and I scored every time. So this game, I go on the ice, we're at home and uh, Gerard Galan was the assistant with Grant Sony, head coach. They were really good to me, helped me a lot anyways. So I go out there, I go with, I dig, I, I make a fake move, whatever. I go to go back and, but the goalie, went for my skate. So I kind of fell in for head first in the boards. I didn't hurt myself, but I just slide in the boards there. I skated by him. He's like, fuck, nice move. Yeah, dummy. I turned around. What did you say? Boom, right in the face. I dropped my miss. We're in a shootout right now. I dropped my miss. I'm speeding him. Boom, boom, boom. And the goalie's like doing the turtle. All I see is their bench clear <laughs> brawl. The two benches empty in Fort Wayne. <laughs> Fucking fighting the goal in the <laughs> shootout. shootout probably the only oh. guy to start a line brawl in a shootout that was me in the IHL so I got a 5, 10, 10 5 minutes uh, ban from the anyways. okay so you kind of were, I mean, were you on an IHL deal like you weren't signed with an NHL team that season no not yet but but wow. I signed with Ottawa at the end of the year okay. Rick yeah. Dudley was a scout for them Rick Dudley likes tough guys uh, because he's uh, yeah, so he uh, he's the one who kind of started following me, and then my coach was telling me about Ottawa likes you, Rick Dudley's at the game, and uh, so what I do, I go out there, I grab whoever you know wants to fight, I hit, I try to do whatever, and then a couple of weeks later, my agent called me, he said you have a, a an offer to to a two year contract two way obviously including that year so i said yeah where where do i sign i didn't care i just wanted an, another opportunity and i was like 24 at that time so i uh, i signed a contract and uh, yeah 
I, um, that summer, I, I remember the GM in Ottawa was Marshall Johnson. He called me in the summer times, like, hi, Andre, Marshall Johnson. I was like, yes, Mr. Johnson, how are you doing? So he's like, we'd like to send you a uh, power skating. We, we think it'd be good for you to North Dakota. I was like, man, my summertime was just, I want to be with my buddies, go oh, yeah. train party, going on St. Catherine, St. Lawrence, <laughs> you know, at that age anyways. But I was like, trying to get it wet. one side of me wanted to party. The other side was like, okay, maybe I should maybe uh, start being more uh, serious about my hockey career. So he's like, yeah, we're thinking of sending you three weeks to North Dakota. I was like, on the phone, I was like, oh yeah, cool. No problem. Unless you want to go one week. And my mind is like, what am I going to say? No, three weeks. So I said, no, no, I'll go three weeks for sure, which I did. I went there. We skated, worked out, plyos, boxing every day, Monday to Saturday. And uh, seriously, that's the best move of my career. That's what put me really ready for training camp. I, I showed up in Ottawa. People were like, what? Who is this fucking wing? And especially I had 400 pins in that season not many people were coming around me i was just running around yash and alfredson all those guys <laughs> hey and you anyway. never and you never played in the minors again like you you probably yeah. never would have guessed that fuck never yeah. again yeah exactly i i just uh you know i but i gotta say when i was 2021 20, with the bruins i think mentally i wasn't quite ready i think because i was so impressed remember i remember my first game called up against the sabers in the fleet center in boston that's what it was called it was the first year i missed by a year the garden so first year fleet center the buffalo sabers all i'm thinking is like oh shit rob ray brad may you know they had barnaby bugner whatever i was like maybe i should grab barnaby to be our bugner or whatever but ray and may i was like holy shit i was like 20 years old i think i was 201 at that time you know just coming out of junior i said like, i'm gonna get killed if i ever i said if i have to i will but i played i think three four shifts i i was kind of I, i wasn't ready just being there with ray bork adam oates uh kevin stevens uh kevin stevens was there <laughs> party <laughs> party <laughs> Anyways, but uh, those guys, it was just like, wow, what am I doing here? I just felt like I wasn't, I, I, I was in the wrong place. But I think in Ottawa, I, I finally, I said, you know, I knew a lot of guys in the league. I said, I can play in this league. So I did whatever I need to do. Any, uh, um, any MMA or, or boxing or anything in the summer times? Yeah, I did some boxing. Yeah, not MMA. I don't know if it was that big back then, you know, but not in Quebec anyways. But I did some boxing in the summertime uh, a little bit uh, once or twice a week, you know, with a guy, with a coach. There. Did, did it did it fuck with you, like, leading up to it? Like, uh, like, a, like a game day routine? Were you, like, the anxiety? Or, or did you just – you kind of mentioned all these stories about the eye and how you f start yeah, yeah. the warm-up. Like, or uh, in the shootout, excuse me, like, did you just live for it? <laughs> When, when I played that, doing that role, you mean? Yeah. Oh, my God. It's the worst feeling for people that never fought. That, that No, not never fought. For people that, that are wondering what is the role of an enforcer. I mean, back even you, Biz, you, you kind of, you were still in the league and there was a lot of tough guys still around. Now I know it's changed. There's still a couple tough guys, but the role of an enforcer is, oh. it's basically like the, so, so people, so you know a little bit what it is. It's, it's like the bully coming to you at school, telling you I'm waiting for you at three o'clock when the, the bell rings, I'm going to beat the shit out of you outside in the schoolyard all day. You're thinking of the bully waiting for you when the bell's going to ring. That's kind of, that's the feeling. Anyways, that's, I, I wasn't pretty, I, I, I can't say I enjoyed fighting. I did it. It was my job and I prepared for it. I, a lot of visualization uh, and ment mental too, you know, watching a little bit of tapes, but uh, all day, you know, I couldn't sleep some afternoons when I knew it was a really like a big tough guy. What I remember when Bougard was there uh, my last year in Calgary, I got a St. Calgary. I, I wanted to do it, but my mind wasn't there. I, my fights were just shit and i just and i remember boogie he fought Federock and hurt him pretty good uh, i think trevor gillies got knocked out he was just killing guys and 
we're playing the wild. I was like, man. And then he, one game he crushed Rene Borg behind the net. I was like, fuck, I got to answer the bell. Oh, so geez. Keenan, Mike Keenan puts me out there. I was like, hey, yuppie, woo. <laughs> so I go in the face of Fay hey, Boogie. I'm trying to be all nice. So I don't want to piss him off, you know. <laughs> Same with the whoever, McSorley, Proby, or those guys, Brash. Anyways, so I'm like, uh, hey, Boogie, we'll have to go. He's like, he looks at me. I'll fucking go. Yeah, I was like. Oh shit, here we go. So I just kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even wait. I didn't square off. I kind of went in. I wanted yeah. to go more technical because I knew the reach. He was six, oh, eight, yeah. would have just crushed me, bro- broke my face, whatever. I didn't want that. So, but I did what I could and uh, all respect, rest in peace for him. I know. Uh, but uh, yeah, but, but yeah, every game when I knew something happened or I had to do something, sometimes we, you know, Biz, when you lose three, four games in a row, the coach all in a, in a pissy mood in the locker room. You're like, okay, I'm going to start my first shift. I'm fighting someone for sure. Try to get the team going, the crowd into it. Then he starts you starting lineup. You kind of know. So you're all hyped up, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it was tough. to You know, but I, 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 find a, I found a way to manage that, that yeah. uh, anxiety, Survive. if you want, you know. Survival. Yeah, but... Yeah, exactly. It was a job and it wasn't fun, but I did it because, you know, I had to. But once you're done, it was oh, fuck in the box, you know, then you could just, oof, you know. It's- but, but, but going back, I know we kind of hopped uh, over your junior career there because you gave us the full rundown. Um, <laughs> it wasn't to that level of intensity when you started that Q career. You started in a city called Bo- Beauport or Bhopal. Yeah. yeah, that's Quebec. That's Quebec. Now it's the Quebec Ramparts. Okay. Patrick Wa, Patrick Wa coaches there, so it's a small city, right, right by Quebec City in Quebec. So we're pretty much, you know, in downtown. So I was in Beauport there for uh, till Christmas, then I, I got traded. Just uh, yeah. What was just, it, what, like? What was it like living in these like small Quebec towns? Like, what was it like playing? Yeah, there? yeah. Well, Beauport wasn't bad because Quebec City is is yeah. kind of like Ottawa. Or uh, let's say in the states, uh, it's the size of uh, oh, <laughs> maybe Mexico Buffalo. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's a good city. Maybe like Buffalo or uh, I don't know Hartford or, or or Providence, bigger now, but sort of like that, you know. So it wasn't a bad city. It was kind of good. I went to Shikurimi. That's way up north. People just live hockey, hockey, and uh, there it was more. Uh, I was like five hour or four, five and a half hour from home. It was kind of yeah. I miss my buddies, family, you know, at first, but you kind of get used to it, you know. You. Uh, uh, create that uh, kind of that like how uh, many camera. Uh, how many <laughs> English speaking people were there be in, in oh Shikurimi? my god Quebec is terrible Shikurimi too but, but not to be a, a an ass or nothing but people uh, you go to Quebec City and it's gonna be like excuse me uh, uh, can you tell me where's uh, the, the ring they'll be okay uh, you 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 come uh, not here huh? okay you, you go light. You go 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 left, and then it's sort of like that. You know, it's really uh, they don't speak much English. It's not so when when people go there, it's it's completely because uh, I've seen people trying to speak English. I actually had fun with it. I remember one time when I had my truck uh, license plate Rhode Island. When I played Providence, I'd come back summertime and I'd go golf in Quebec cities with my buddies. So I'd stop and we just fuck around. I excuse me, can you tell me where's the golf course? We're, we're from Rhode Island. And the people would go like that. Okay, the, the, the guy, if uh, you go the, 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 there and the, the right and the, no, the, the past, the church, the, ter- the church. Yeah, the, the church, church. <laughs> and then, uh, then I finish in French. Okay, merci beaucoup, salut. <laughs> and then they'd be like, oh, shit, fuck you, you fucking asshole. Fuck. You know? I used to do that with my buddies. We just oh. howl, you know, we just fuck around. The, the poor guy would try for five minutes to tell me how to get to the golf course. And then I tell him I speak French. He, they would just lose it anyways. But, uh, but yeah, just back to the question. Not many people that the English not too good. Montreal downtown uh, is really good. Oh, yeah. Montreal, yeah. I got to uh, say. Was yeah. It? Oh. yeah. You had the, you know, you had the two call ups in Boston, but your first when you became a regular NHLer, your your first regular coach was Jacques Martin. And <laughs> the imitation you do of Jacques Martin, that guy did. Did you like him? Did you get along? 
<laughs> I like Jacques. Seriously, he's... <laughs> hey, I had Jacques Martin. I had um, John Tortorella, Mike Keenan, and, and and they're all good guys, but they're really hard coaches. You know, Mike Terrian. Terrian and Edzo. I, Ed Olchik, I had him briefly, but I loved Edzo. Too bad we were just uh, losing. It was more, uh, you know, it was a tough start for our group, but Edzo was great, but Jacques, I always tell people he's the coach that gave me my my chance in the NHL, gave me an opportunity to to establish myself, and uh, you know he helped me a lot. So I, I like Jacques. I I do the impersonation of Jacques just because I, I spent a lot of time with him. We talked in the office, and you know he's a great guy. I love him, and it's not it's not to be rude or, or make fun of oh, him. No, no, I, I, I know it was just Jacques. so funny. Oh my god! I know he was in Pittsburgh, but yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, Andre, it's uh, important that you uh, just keep uh, working. Uh, you know, being physical also. You know, bring that uh, physicality to our team under control, and uh, think down the road. <laughs> you know, you're gonna be important to our hockey club, and. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, but, uh, just great, you know, just, uh, one time he brought, uh, yeah, he, <laughs> he's, uh, no, he's just good. He's just guy. Fucking guys, fucking shit. Wake the fuck up. I give you days <laughs> off. That's the way you fucking respond. Fucking shit. Fucking get going here. Fuck. You know, it wasn't too, uh, it was nothing crazy when he got mad, but you know, guys knew how to respond still. He was great. <laughs> I love Jacques, and I, I, if he listens, I, I say I always do, and I love. I, he's he's great. I, I love him. What was the incident <laughs> uh, where like th- they were taking like a bunch of photos for the guys going to the Olympics, and you wore like a, <laughs> like, a jersey during like this picture session, and like oh, yeah. the organization was pissed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think maybe I got traded after that. Maybe it was uh, that you were talking. Was there any times that you crossed the line? Maybe those are times I crossed the line and I didn't know. Was that was that in Ottawa? That was in Ottawa. So we were we. I was there the years early two thousand where we played the Leafs first round and we'd lost. We'd lose to the Leafs. Uh, in the first round, it was tough because see, regular season, we're always first. We were unreal, you know, Alfredson, Havlet, Marianosa. Uh, um, Chara came along after we traded Yashin, um, but we had a great team, Wade Red and Chris Phillips anyways. So we had a bunch of guys going to the Olympics that year. Marianosa, Chara, um, I think was Red and maybe going to Bonk, Alfie. Radic Bonk was going with the check. We had a bunch, Jacques was going as a coach with Team Canada. So I was, uh, I don't know, I, I I talked to the trainer and I was like, would it be funny if I just go there and like pretend that I, I'm like part of the Olympic uh, guys going to the Olympics? He's like, uh, you won't do it. Hey, let's do a jersey. I was like, yeah, yeah, do it. This. So they were all getting ready. The photograph was on the ice to take pictures of all the guys. So uh, since I was born in the States, I'm born in Port Chester, New York. They put a blue jersey and they put USA with white tape. So I put the jersey on and they're taking their pictures. So I came in flying. I stopped. Obviously, Hosa, Bonk, and Chara, they're kind of laughing. <laughs> But I don't know if Jacques thought it was funny. It was like their moment, but I was just trying to be, you know, just say, I'm I'm with you guys. I'm going to the Olympics. USA! US! Anyways, I was walking around like that. I'm there in the team picture. I, I just stood there for a little bit. Then I took off. Guys are kind of laughing. And I was like, oh, maybe, I don't know. Well, uh, anyways, I think I got trained not too long after that, but uh, yeah, it was it was kind of funny in the moment, anyways. But uh, it was just again to to just have the guys laugh and uh, I thought well, the practice won you a Stanley was, Cup. It won you a Stanley Cup. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, hopefully, anyways. But uh, I always tell people if Ottawa would have been patient, we wouldn't have won the cup in Ottawa. Because uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But uh, yeah, to Tampa, uh, I always yeah. When I got traded. There, were you surprised? 
Oh yeah, big time. Because seriously, in the the paper, and and I was I was playing some really good hockey. Seriously, because I remember there's all these articles, and the, yeah, there are articles. But anyways, they were saying good stuff. Andrea playing well. Uh, you know, even at one time, I was like, wow, okay, settle down. I'm not. Uh, but there was an article. It was saying Mister Everything because I had a goal and assist. The game before an assist, a fight, another fight. <laughs> so a guy that kind of liked the rough stuff wrote that. Don Brennan, anyways, and uh, I think it was Don, anyways. Uh, but uh, it was just funny, and I, I didn't expect it. I remember I got the phone call as at home, just having dinner, and uh, the GM said, "We just trade you to Tampa. Thank you for everything." I said, "What?" Well, I, I didn't know what to say, so I went to Tampa, and uh, they were out of the playoffs. I was getting ready for another round of playoffs, so. Went to Tampa. They were like playing in front of thirteen thousand fans. Twelve thousand. It was like oh, it was fans. bad atmosphere then. Uh, oh yeah, it was. Uh, oh, so I, I got there and I turned the franchise around. Really, I came there wow. and showed really how to do Fucking it. Fucking right, you did. And uh, no, just kidding. But uh, but it's funny because the guys not playing would sit with the wives in the stands. It was that bad, and the, like people would kind of know who you are, but not really. So. That's a fine. But That's but a uh, fine. Yeah. Yeah, with, so, uh, sitting with your old lady in the crowd <laughs> during a national league yeah, game. Yeah, that's like at least I get the two oh. and a half hours with the boys if I'm a healthy scratch. Yeah, no, ching, exactly. dude, ching, ching. Um, no, no, but uh, yeah, it was a fine for sure. He's like, watch what the guys are doing that are in the lineup, honey. That'll get you. Got to watch these guys and study them. Yeah. Okay. But so- it, it, yeah, exactly. Oh no, I fuck. But uh, I would sit there, but I know there was uh, one or two guys not playing. They would go there. I was like, what the fuck are they doing there anyways? But it's funny because it really, uh, it, 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 uh, it went on quickly because from that year, not making the playoffs, the next year, our group, there was a couple trades made. It was a good core there. And uh, I think guys slowly started believing and we made it to the second round that the, ne- the following year lost to the devils. And the next year we went all the way to the finals. So it, it, it turned around pretty quick. I got to ask you this question. RA was grilling Brad Richards about, uh, about how Andrew Chuck's nickname is wood. Is that what you said? It was RA. Yes, per the article I read, in Sports Illustrated. It, it Had you was, ever heard of of Andrew Chuck being named Wood? Wood, uh, it depends. Uh, it wasn't something regular though. He had a couple different nicknames, Andrew. Okay. Chuck. So it still lives but, on. But uh, Wood, I don't know if it's what I think, but I, I yeah. All right. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There you go. Funny Good story job. of Andrew Chuck. There you go. That's towards, what I was asking next. Okay, but but not with the wood, uh, nothing related to the wood. But I remember one time, Andy, you know, he's older. He's 40, whatever. I think he played till 43, whatever. He was maybe 41 back then. We're in Nashville, a boring city like Nashville. So we were staying there, sleeping, staying over before we're traveling to Philly. And I'm kidding, by the way, Nashville's unreal. We all know the strip that. So we stayed in. We just won, I think. So we went out, obviously, like everyone. So we we uh, partied hard. We had fun. And Johnny Graham, you know, backup goalie, great guy, um, you know, had had fun that night. So next day we had an early bus and Johnny Graham couldn't wake up. We're trying to call him, text him, whatever. So we're all in the bus. Where's Johnny? Where's Johnny? So uh, and he's trying to call his room that. So he got one of the uh, maintenance guy of the hotels. Like I'm trying to get in the room for, to get my, my teammates. So they're knocking on the door and they had the lock there. They couldn't get in, but I guess the guy had something special to, to, to cl- close the door and open the lock, the hatch on, on the door. So he, I guess he told us after we're all waiting in the bus, then towards said, okay, enough, let's get the fuck out of here. The, so we're all, Hey, but, and Andy's up there and, and so we're all, so the bus is leaving the hotel. So as we're leaving the hotel, all we see is Andrew Chuck. He has two knee braces. You can barely skate and he won't be upset that he, he was unreal with his stick, not the, he skated all right, but not the, so his knees were, were pretty banged up. We see Captain Andrew Chuck, 41 for <laughs> He's running behind the bus in the streets. 
it was kind of funny to see him run <laughs> behind the bus, but he was pissed off, got on the bus, and guys were like, stop the fucking bus. So we finally stopped the bus, <laughs> and he jumped on the bus, all like <sighs> exhausted, staring at Torts. He was a little pissed off that Torts, he knew it was Torts that said, okay, let's get out of here, you know, but I guess Torts told us later on he wanted to see what kind of team we are if we stood up for a teammate, but that he said that John Graham was on the bed, but naked, just there, passed out. <laughs> He's like, okay, go shower up and meet us in Philly, which he did anyways. Uh, Maybe that's why they call him Wood, because he looked like Woody from Toy Story chasing after the bus. <laughs> oh, no, he maybe, looked like Wazzy maybe. skating at the reunion when he brought him back on the ice. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Hey, so when, remember so, when, remember what? I was talking to Alan Costume when I grabbed the guy's guitar and started playing song. He was in the corner just waiting. Can I get my guitar and leave now? <laughs> We're at Recky's house and I'm the plates are hot. The plates are the hot. Plates are hot. The- <laughs> um, oh my god, the poor guy. Mark he's Recky. hired and was he stole his guitar. So oh, yeah. I think it, it was, was your uh I think it was your maybe your second time with Tampa Bay, maybe not, but uh, you had a run in with Torts where you made um you made like a throat slashing gesture at the Oh, end I was of- itchy. I was itchy my oh, because I shaved happened? in the morning and my oh, the- my my beard was kind of itchy, yeah. Well, Torts um, wasn't happy about your itch. Is that uh is that in Philly? You're talking with uh yeah, Cote there, yeah, yeah. Well, uh yeah, it's uh, and and I'm so not proud of of that moment. That's one moment when people ask me, "Is there anything you regret?" That that moment, I I, I went over. Uh, but I'm I gotta say, I'm somebody that's really proud. You know, I I hate to look bad or or everybody. I don't know. I I like to. I don't like being embarrassed. And and that fight, I fought Kota in the first period. I I think I did well. You know, we fought like four times that year and it always was good. I always did well. He caught me on the chin that fight anyways. And, um, you know, obviously I I was a little embarrassed. You feel like you let your teammates down. You feel like, yeah, what did I do? I just... And nothing that Cote did wrong. He did his job, just happened to hit me. I went in a little nonchalant, you kind of, and and I, that's a moment that I, I totally regret. I went overboard and, you know, I wish I would have reacted differently. Just maybe take that fight and just shut my yap, you know, and, and maybe wait till next year because it was towards the end of the year, I think. Uh, that time and uh yeah but there was a big build up too people really don't know they see the youtube video and by the way i even that's how embarrassed i i I am of that video i wish i could take it off i even tried to write to the guy that posts that video because there's a video just sandre why loses cool you know and you see me doing slash throats and again, I'm not proud it's not a good example I regret everything I did that night and uh I, I couldn't get a hold of the guy, but I don't know. Anyways, so if you're listening, take it down for my kids. No, but, uh, you know, it's anyways, <laughs> long story short, short um, I went in the room and that was the second fight. Of, and the, as I fought him first, did well. Second, he caught me. Go back in the room. Torts comes in the room. Andre, come here. So I, I go, I see him. He's like, can I play you? And obviously I'm fired up. I'm pissed off because they, they start showing us in the box. They're showing the replay. You know, it isn't Philly fans are chirping me. Hey, Roy, that's I'm hearing all kinds of stuff. That's that's uh, pumping me even more. I'm oh, getting yeah. fired up inside of me. I'm j- I'm trying to talk to myself. You know, <laughs> stay within yourself. I can hear his shock, <laughs> Martin Andre. We need you under. Con- yeah, we need you under control. Uh, you know, it's important. Uh, you're physical and. Uh, down the playoffs, you know, uh, you can't take bad penalties uh, for the team in a tough situation. So I go back and run towards, are you okay? And all I said to Torres, because I was fired up, fans, uh, and they're showing the replay. I was like, I am fine, Torres. You know what? I'm, I'm starting the period. He's like, and, and I'm, I'm fucking going out there and I'm going round three with Cote. And then he's like, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. And then he could see, I think Torres saw my face, how I was fired up like I, I i was ready to i was just pissed off you know because just what happened i think it was maybe one of the first time that 
my knees buckled like that, but it happens to all the best of us. That's the thing. In the moment, you're fired up. You you think it's the worst thing that, but Proby got mad. You know, everybody, even Cote it's ego, uh, against e- George ego driven. Barrows. It's ego-driven. Hey? It's ego-driven. Exactly. Like you you too, Biz. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. Marty McSor, you name him. Everyone had a bad night or a bad fight or that you wish you could uh, handle I, it. I did it to Yablonski, but then he knocked me out again. Exactly. <laughs> See, so, so, and like, oh, yeah, you're going to baby me ah, again. <laughs> Exactly. Any fucking night, it can be anyone's night. So anyways, so I was like, I'm fucking starting third period. We're going round three. Then you coach your team, do whatever you want. It's like, no, you stay here. You get undressed. I was like, I'm not getting undressed. Fuck that. He did that to me. Well, I know one time I took a penalty towards told me get undressed. And I did. I don't know why. And I don't know why I got undressed, but I just listened to the coach. He, he's the one, he's the boss. And that time, I said, I'm not getting undressed because it shows I'm, I'm hurt and that. I was, yeah, I got my bell ring, but I was ready to go again. So anyway, Stuart saw I was fired up. So I went on the bench and uh, the whole time again, they're showing the replay and fans, uh, hey, Roy, hey, you going to go again? Hey, you fucking pussy. Hey. You know, sorry, my language, but you hear all the, 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 the chirps of people. So I'm just fired up. And I think Scott Hartnell skated by, said something to me. That's when I, during a TV timeout, I jumped on the ice and I tried to kind of go towards their bench. The linesman grabbed me. I came back on the bench and that's when you see me, I'm all fired up. And I, I, Cote was kind of, and again, Cote did nothing wrong. He's just doing his job. He's thinking up for his team. And I don't, I'm not even mad at him today. It was just, you know, in the moment, it's just how it went down. And again, I'm not happy how I reacted and that. But so I did the slash show to telling you, I didn't know. I was like, what am I going to do? Show a fist and I'm going to give you this fist on your nose. So I, I just, it was just a reaction. I'm going to, you know, come after you, keep your head up and to, to Arnold, to him, to everyone that was looking at me basically. So it's pretty embarrassing moment. So I, I regret it totally, but yeah. So that's why I did the, the slash throat. Feel yeah. shame. Go sure to the box. To be, sure to be a Buzz Kellington. And <laughs> no, 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 no. But I, I'm glad because I never really talked about the uh, that incident. It's not something, you know, because... Like I think I you're said, being a little hard on yourself. Like, it's... You yeah. Know, it's, yeah. You know how many times so that's happened? You were pissed off. And you're in no, the worst know, building exactly. ever. You're in the worst exactly. building ever to lose a fight in, too. Exactly. Those yeah, fans. the stuff they were probably yelling at you. Fuck. Yeah. Me. Exactly. And, and, you know, it went well first period that, and uh, so, yeah, it was just, yeah, a tough environment, tough situation. And I reacted maybe uh, the wrong way. So, yeah. Hey, uh, Wazi, I'm curious, like you got to Tampa and, and kind of not many fans team isn't necessarily doing great, but you must have seen pretty quick how good this team was going to get. Like, was it just LeCavier getting that much better? St. Louis was what, what kind of brought that team together to become that good? Yeah, I think like I, I mentioned earlier, we had really a good core, a good group there. Uh, like you said, we had the, the Marty St. Louis that started uh, becoming who he became, you know, and uh, then uh, Vinny LeCavier first round pick. It was a re- <clears throat> really good player. He was kind of slowly getting in his uh, role, you know, as a, a first rounder, big guy, you know, just skill, good shot. Brad Richard came along. We traded. They got Danny Boyle. That was unreal on D there. Dan Boyle uh, on the power play, Pavel Kubina. So slowly, I think as a group, I mentioned that, but we were, uh, they added some uh, bits and pieces here. You know, me, I came, uh, I think, for a little toughness, same as Chris Dingman got trade from Carolina. So uh, me and Dinger were playing on that four line, but the Richards, uh, Freddie Modine, Ruslan Fedotenko. Hi, guys. Uh, then we had... Uh, <laughs> Elmo? <laughs> yeah, Ruslan. Such a nice guy, eh? I love Ruslan. Oh, he was too. so nice. But uh, Ruslan was clutch. That Stanley Cup run, yeah. he was great. He was and Corey clutch with Stillman. Pittsburgh, too. Didn't uh, he score the, the goal that won the Stanley Cup? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we won 2-1 against the Flames, and Ruslan got the two goals there. He was... Uh, that's the thing. Every... Every round and every game, uh, there was a different line uh, stepping up. If one line wasn't going, you had another line. So 
we had good two first uh, line and then the uh, Corey Serge, Colin Moore, the, those guys, Pratt, were blocking shots towards his uh, a maniac with blocking shots. We started just playing and just uh, it's part of the game nowadays. You see it a lot. You know, it's a big stats. If you look at on, on players, they, they, they block shots and uh, Abby Bullen and Nat Nikolai Abby Bullen was unreal. And I always tell people uh, a team without a good goaltender can't really win a cup. You need some good goaltending, which he did. So we had all the, this group, but that first year I mentioned earlier, second round. After that year, guys, we sat down and said, listen, I think we we have the guys there to, to make this happen. So coming in camp the next year with Torts, he's, we know his training camps are hardest camps I've ever been. Uh, we were prepared to start the season off uh, really well, which we did. We we're always, uh, I think we were first in the East with Detroit. That was, uh, we're battling to first in the league actually. So we had a really good run. And after Christmas, we went on a good streak there and, we believe we could win. Uh, we could go far, and uh, yeah, we we uh, we did it actually in all four. So, were you partying quite a bit during that run? I remember that being the run of uh, uh, Hulkamania. Like the Hulkster yeah. was. Oh yeah, was he around you guys? His daughter yeah, was yeah. singing all I, the anthems. Apparently, he tried to get in the locker room for like the the final speech from like the the ownership group and shit. And they were like, "Yeah, listen, buddy, you got to go." Like he was milking it hard. <laughs> yeah, I know he was trying to get in. He was, oh yeah, Hulk mean. But Hulkster, I remember, I have great pictures with him on the ice when we won the cup. He <laughs> would come to the games, and they would bring this uh, kind of big. Uh, uh, dolly whatever they would bring him out there and he would just grab the mic and Tampa Bay let's play hockey and the crowd would just go you know so he he would come just to get the crowd fired up every uh, game in the playoffs so uh, when we won he came on the ice and uh, yeah I think he tried to get a locker room there but it was just the I don't know who who stopped him but yeah um, you know, his, uh, I think it was a time where the owners were there, the players and that. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> he, he was there quite a right, uh, qu- quite a bit. And, uh, we, we partied a little bit when we beat Philly, it was in Tampa. We had uh, a couple of days before the, the cup final gets uh, going again. So we party, but not, nothing crazy. Not like, uh, you know, not like a rock star, not like you're going to Vegas or anything, but you know, we not had like fun. Bugsy. Yeah, not like Bugsy, you know. <laughs> hey, should come here, should. But uh <laughs> you, you weren't Dude, do you remember that? I rem- I remember one time you being like like you're always joking around one time, you're like, I never seen anybody like this fucking guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, <Bugs. laughs> he was enjoying the NHL. Oh. Always happy, always smiling. I know. He was, uh, hey, we're in uh, in Columbus after Tyrion said, I think that we're <laughs> trying to be the worst defensive squad in the National Hockey League, and we're we're doing a good job at it. Remember that quote he said about And then Rob the- dummy Bugsy, remember him? Bink, yeah, yeah. Bink, bink. <laughs> yeah. So I go, I go to, uh, we go to Columbus. Taryn brings me in and gives me the, you've seen that 40 old virgin movie. I'm like, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm like, where the fuck's he going with this? So he's like, yeah, I rented last night. How much I paid for it. I was like, why, what, what does this have to do? But do you know how much it was? I was like, I don't know, fucking 12 bucks. So he's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, how much you make here? And I'm like, I make uh, whatever, you know. He's like, exactly. You're pay- you're paid well money. You paid you're paid good money. Do your job. The whole league's making fun of us. Fucking, you gotta do something. It's embarrassing. This team has no balls. Fucking joke. Fucking. All right, go get ready. Fucking shit. So I go in the room. Terrence giving to me. I'm like, yeah, right. Have another cigarette, anyways. <laughs> anyways, but uh, <laughs> no, no. But back then, Mike's was was smoking quite a bit anyways he comes in the room i don't know if you remember he goes around the room and he gives us the uh yeah you guys you want to know because why you don't win because you don't care for one another and until you don't do that you're not gonna win a fucking game you're tough you have tattoos everywhere you think you're tough he starting saying that bugsy ryan malone covered in tattoos so he's the only guy with tattoos (laughs) yeah 
And then he's giving it to us, saying again, we're scared. We're not a team. We're not hit. You know, uh, we don't have our own backs, and that's why we're losing. And uh, fucking wake up. So that game, I think, to five minutes in, the poor goalie Sebo run first NHL game was three nothing Columbus. Woo! in Columbus. We're like, hey, this is really going well. Bugsy's fighting Rob. Boom, boom. Harmy's getting fight. fought somebody. I fought Shelly. Oh, he's fighting someone. Lilo. Anyways, it was just uh, we lost 6-1. Anyways, great great times. <laughs> Holy shit. Wazzy, this is a... Wazzy, are you doing stuff with RDS? Yeah, I do. Uh, I do. I have a show on the road. I go see most of the most of the French guys, because it's a French show, obviously in Montreal. So I go see the guys like, uh, let's say, Anthony Manta in, in Washington. I'll go see uh, Tanger in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, I'll go see the guys establish. Uh, maybe yeah. in New York, I'll go see. I've done it already, but uh, with Lafreniere and those guys. So kind of go around Bergeron, Boston. So I have this show. Kind of, it's a half the show is more serious interview with them. And then I do more of fun stuff with them. You know, I, sometimes I wear costume. I kind of do stuff, games with them just to get them in, in a different uh, zone, you know, uh, trying to bring him in a different side where people can see the player, you know, maybe uncomfortable or whatever. Anyways, but yeah, doing oh, okay. that. And I'm in studio once or twice a week here doing stuff. So I do a little bit of podcasts here also, uh, um, I'm, I don't have my own, but I, I collaborate now with uh, Guillaume Le Tendres, Max Lapierre, La Poche Bleu. It's oh, yeah. called. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, yeah. So they're they're uh, slowly kind of in your they're footsteps, doing well. but in Quebec, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm with them uh, doing stuff there too. So uh, yeah. Kinda. I played with uh, I played with Lappy Quick in in Moto. I I retired two games in in Sweden minus eight in two games. I retired, <laughs> but but we gotta get those we gotta get those guys on because uh, I I see they're doing real well. They got a beer and everything, but I think our yeah. listeners are gonna be like, why doesn't you yourself have a fucking American English podcast? So yeah. it's uh, yeah, we I'd appreciate like, you coming like on. That. I don't know if Biz had anything else. No, it's just, I mean, you you talked about like making the NHL was the ultimate dream. You end up playing over 500 games. You got the bounce around. I know we didn't really talk about Calgary much, but like when when you talk to your, your friends still, like what, what are some one, maybe one crazy story that pops out with an experience with a teammate that you like to, to tell. Like a story, a good story or funny? Or well, more just a, like, I mean, like you seem like you fucking have so many in the bag of where you're like, oh my God, yeah. I get to enjoy these experiences. Like, was there one that was actually more like sentimental to you about like a an interaction or a, a, anything yeah, through well, your career? There was my, my, my first shower with Mario Lemieux, Sid Crosby. <laughs> that was legendary. I think, uh, you know, two idols of mine, you know, showering with those two guys. Uh, no. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I mean, my my. Obviously, there's always uh, your first NHL goal. The Stanley Cup is obviously up there. Uh, something uh, legendary. Um, Baseball yeah, real. Spot. What's well, that? I, no, I, I mean, like I said, it, 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 sometimes it's put a quarter in the guy and he can fucking rifle one off. And sometimes it's like, no, that, that, that's it. Yeah, yeah, no, no. The but there's so many stuff. I don't know where to go with this because I still have more stories that are kind of uh, silly, crazy. But but the first NHL go Stanley Cup. Remember um, rookie party for Pittsburgh and L.A. when yeah, if we this won, Bucks, he could come out there. Oh, my God. Hey, remember, remember they're like, win, if you win, win. we'll fly Malone out. <laughs> With, with remember in LA that rookie party, we got the two boots there. There was a guy, American Pie, uh, Kevin B- uh, Biggs, there, uh, Jason Biggs. Yeah, there was a couple. Uh, Paris was there with her little puppy. Ah, 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 ah. Anyways, a little Chihuahua, fucking with Nicole. Anyways, remember we had the two boots with all the gray goose and people were starting to come and serve themselves and, and girls and dad were trying to still. So I was doing the drinks at the end there. I was steering. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, like, I'm not going to go there, but people were, they were like, well, see, we need another drink. Yeah. Coming up anyways, but uh, oh, no, but, but were you, uh, uh, were, were, God. Were, were you mixing the drinks? 
This is fucking funny. Yeah, I don't know if I, I, I'll get arrested for this. Oh, yeah, but, you uh, had a spoon. It was a, they no, gave you a big had spoon. A spoon. Yeah, exactly. No, okay, it was just because oh, nice. it was getting annoying. People were just grabbing our bottles and yeah. pouring themselves drinks. We're like, seriously, we're, we don't know you. You're, we're paying for this. So I was like, hey, you want a drink? So I was doing the, anyways. Hey, that but, was the uh, night that, um, the girl uh, LC from the Hills, she was there too, and they were filming. They were filming oh, like yeah. an episode of the Hills. That's so right. I remember I went and they had the rope, and I went up and I was like, "Come here, come <laughs> here!" Like thinking she'd never come over. She comes over. She and and, and I was like, uh, "Do you like doing this show?" She just went like, "What the fuck?" and <laughs> oh. turned around. I was like, "Oh my oh. god!" You're yeah. Just yeah, a yeah, loser, yeah. loser. Oh, no. That was a good night, though. That was a good oh, night. Oh yeah. It was uh-huh. it was really good. We we end up at the mansion there with F and the hot tub and cigars. Get out of here! We, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You no, are no, such a that... ball buster, man. This has uh, been awesome. No, no but we it was appreciate uh... this, buddy. You know yeah, what, Wazzy? No, we got to do a sandbagger. I don't know if you've seen us on YouTube. We we play uh, other hockey guys, two buddies in, in golf. It'd be fun. I know yeah. you mentioned golf a couple times. It'd be fun. Yeah, yeah. No, we I played love Theodore. Golfing. We played Theodore I, and Jovanovski. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd love to send me uh, whatever. It'd be great to, to go either golf or, or hockey games. I know a lot of people, sometimes it, there's alumni. Uh, well, I, I know Pittsburgh. I wasn't there long enough. and But uh, I know they, they do games, Army, Bugsy. I think Max Talbot went down the pit. They're playing another. But anyways, if you because I do charity events there, and I see Brad May, I see uh, Wendell Clark, guys like that, like that, Shane Corson. We have a good time, so... I always like to take part of these. So if there's a whatever event, give me a call. I'll be glad to come see you guys. And yeah, just have fun and do Jaeger bumps with Bugsy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> off out of Bugsy's ass. And uh, oh. just <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll get the sock. I, I think there was a, a sock stealing story that you were involved in. So we're going to get more of these pranks. Yeah, we're gonna, you right, you're coming on again. You're coming on again. You're going to be a regular, to tell you. buddy. Yeah, yeah. There's more stuff towards uh, reading glasses. I I steal also, and uh, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> we'll save Bagel. some for round two. But thank you so <laughs> yeah. much. Um, right. I, it's funny. Like I, I remember how funny you are, and I didn't even remember that well because this was this was freaking hilarious. So all right, my you have are, one more. Uh, yeah, well, one one to start. Actually, I, I want a coaching question. When you were with Boston, you played, I think, 13 games on the, the Steve Casper experience. Yeah. Uh, were you with the team when, when he benched Daly and Stevens that night, or were you down in Providence? And what kind of ripple effect did that yeah. have like, throughout the organization? I, I remember that uh, really well. I was in uh, Toronto, I think, but I was in Providence. Yeah, I was in Providence, and I think uh, Steve Casper was trying to like like a lot of coaches, when things weren't going too well, he's trying to, to pass a, med- a message to his key players, you know. But it didn't go too well. I think Steve Casper got fired not too long after uh, that event there. So, uh, yeah, maybe not the the right thing to do to Bam Bam Cam. And uh, was it was it Cam? Yeah, it was Cam. Yeah, it was Cam. And, uh, Cam, Cam and yeah, Stevens. Yeah. He stapled them to the bench, and it was it was a huge yeah. story. Yeah, he, he never yeah. coached again after that season. He, he never. Yeah, exactly. So you know, it's stuff you can't really go Steve. against your uh, big star player. But I remember my second year in Boston. Uh, we 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 were in that. I think it might have been that year because I got called up uh, ten games that year, and we were in Philly. We lost a game, and and Stevie Casper I think said curfew tonight. Everyone in the room, and and guys, the veterans. You know, I'm like 21, and I think it was Steve, uh, maybe not Stevens, but Rick talked to those guys like everyone is going out tonight. I'm like fuck. Even, even, even me, like I'm a rookie. I just got called. He's like, everyone's going out. You're coming. I was like, right on NHL. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> so I went out. I went out with the boys in Philly. I'm partying in that next day in practice. After practice, I got sent down to Providence. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> oh, shit. Maybe I shouldn't have went out. Maybe they knew who everybody went out. But yeah, anyways, that was, uh, yeah, I wasn't as serious maybe when I was 20, 21. Anyways. Before we get to our last question with Andre Y, I have to jump in to talk about Chevrolet. We couldn't be more excited about Chevrolet supporting our podcast and more specifically their class of EVs. I'm talking Bolt, I'm talking Blazer, Equinox, and of course the Silverado, which I drove around Canada all summer in. And you guys know, I'm not a big lavish spender. Chevrolet EVs are affordable. They're for everyone. Call it a 
all-star capability on a fourth line budget, enough space to keep the whole family comfortable. Chevy EVs are fun, affordable, and they go the distance. And now there are over 2,000 certified Chevy EV dealerships and a network of public charging stations to help you live electric. Chevy is electric. EVs for everyone, everywhere. Now back to the show. Game seven in yeah. 04. I was, at, I was actually at that game, and that was the first time I crashed the Stanley Cup potty. It was that yeah. restaurant inside the arena there. I don't know how I got in, but that, yeah. I stayed there for about till four of the morning. That was a wild one. Nice ripper. Oh, that was so fun there. We were, uh, yeah, because we parted in the room a, a little bit, obviously, like every team. And then uh, with it, up there, second level, there's this big conference room, big, big room anyways, where, uh, yeah, we, we had some dinners there and, and some events, whatever. So we went all the way up there, you know, partied there with the cup. Uh, there was a bunch of people. Uh, uh, there's tennis players, too, from Tampa that were in there. Uh, anyways, the parents, friends, just a, a good time getting drunk from there. We went to our, uh, our Andrew Chuck's house. So we partied at the, our captain's house, uh, jumping in a pool with the cup. We did that before Wade Pittsburgh did it anyways. But no, we were yeah. uh, at Andy's house till 8 a.m., I think, you know, so just getting, uh, you know, we're just enjoying, you know, what we accomplish as, as a group, you know, and uh, it was just great. And the, and the thing is, it doesn't stop there. Then you sleep till noon, one, two, next thing, hey, dinner at five, meet up there. Then we do it again next night. Hey, we're in dinner, then at the bar. Hey, after five, six days, I was like, oh, my God, I feel like Ozzy. Just, you know, buckle, <laughs> buckle. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where I am, but anyways, yeah, so it was, uh, <laughs> but it was a fun, uh, good memories, man. And, and then the lockout happened that, like I was saying, so I partied for 14 months, just, wow. I, I couldn't, I couldn't go play in Europe, Europe, anywhere that the lease were, we're filled up with, uh, you know, players just trying to find a spot. So it's tough. I went to England. Yeah, I should have. But even there, I know I played in charity events and just partied, you know. And, well, man, when I showed up in Pitt, I remember Dennis Bonvi at 9 a.m. Let's go. We're going. Really? It's 9 a.m. We're going. Why? <laughs> Why, Dennis? Because Carcillo and Biz did in game oh, one at 7 a.m. <laughs> Got to set <laughs> no, the tone man. here. Seriously. It's black yeah. against white, 9 a.m., first group. We're going. Really? Can I have a – Awesome. So, well, buddy, we appreciate you coming on. Yeah, You're nice. a beauty. And, and good luck with fun. everything. And we'll, we'll talk to you soon again. Ozzie, about we'll be in touch, trips. buddy. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Hey, keep up the good work and uh, send me all the booze, the liquor, and my ass. Hey, we will. We'll I'll do it. on you, buddy. <laughs> Man, huge thanks to Andre Wa for coming on absolute riot I, I i don't think i laughed that hot since we had timmy stapleton on. hopefully you folks enjoyed it as well but absolute hilarity but moving right along here biz on thursday our pal jack eichel returned to buffalo yet again had an absolutely dominating performance had a hat trick and an assist and a uh, vgk seven to four win the ninth in a row uh, he got a little uh, gladiator going uh, are you not entertained that one of those goals had the arms out uh, a pretty entertaining affair, needless to say. But afterwards, he you know had some nice words to say. I think he acknowledged last year he was still kind of angry about the way things went. But hopefully this will be like not the end of the chapter, but I think this doesn't have to be a big thing going on from now on, does it, Biz? I you mean, don't think this is oh, a big thing already? Oh, well, oh, all right. I, no, I mean, every much, time. He pretty you much don't took think a when dump. Jack Eichel's in Buffalo the rest of his life, this isn't war? You're like, a longtime NHL Bruins fan. Yeah, I, I just thought like he, you know, he acknowledged like after the first game, he was still mad about things and he had good things to say. And not, that yeah, celebration yeah. told me everything that I needed to know. That celebration was yeah. chef's kiss. That, you know what that you know what that was already? That was like, remember last time when I was in here and you guys got the laugh? Lick my fucking cornhole, you losers. It's How my fucking lick? night. One one on the dash. Every fucking time these two teams play, I'm going to be tuning in from now on. Who had the Golden Knights and the Buffalo Sabres as rivals when Vegas entered the lead. Who had that on their bingo card, all right? Nobody. And these two teams now fucking hate each other, and it's the spite tour. The pettiness in his celebration told me everything, Whit Dog. 
the the best part, the part that's kind of gone unnoticed is the hat trick was all in the last 13 minutes of the third period. I mean, bang, bang. It's like, it's easy for him. The first goal right to his skates, he knocks it in. Really nice play. I think it, the rebound went right off his skates and he, and he buried it. The next one, he got shot out of a can and beat whoever his guy was up the ice right in the middle. I think Stevenson fed him. He sniped one quick. And then he buried what was actually a great empty netter. Not the best empty netter I've ever seen from David Pasternak or one of them. But Eichel had a nice one. He got it right in his own corner and just lofted it over everyone. And as it went in, you could tell how fired up he was. But I think forever. Yeah, I don't. I, I understand why he's, he's making the comments on on how he was bitter, everything went down, but he's, they, they're, they're still now rivals. I think that'll always be the case, which I love. Um, what else about that night? Oh, I think, all right, were you, were we talking about it or somebody else about when, when he went back and they lost the night that the, the Sabres fans owned him, it was so early. He wasn't even healthy yet. He's had other injuries and he was, it, it was like almost too soon for that to happen. And then after he just he chose violence, which we're happy about. But I, I was impressed by the effort because he's lighting it up exactly as we said he would prior to the season. He's hey. finally feeling good, dominating. Yeah, you think the Sabres fan base bit off a little bit more than they could chew with this one? We're, we're going to come to find out. Um, right now, it's looking like Vegas is uh, way ahead of them in terms of a chance to win a Stanley Cup. But I've I'm a Sabres guy. I've been saying that they're they're on a nice trajectory. And Tage Thompson, I think I guaranteed. Actually, we talked about um, sophomore slump possibilities. I think we mentioned Cairo Thompson, guys who signed the big tickets. I said the guy you don't have to worry about is Tage Thompson, and this dude looks like a superstar some nights. He's scoring. End-to-end -end goals shorthanded against the Bruins, cutting it in tight on the goalie. So Sabres fans, stay positive. That was a that was an unbelievable solo effort by him against the Bruins. That was their only goal of the night. And listen, we mentioned, unfortunately, we mentioned the wagon shirts. And I believe since then they've lost five in a row. The Bills have lost back-to-back -back games, and the city is in shambles. I don't know why we mentioned the shirts. We should have let them maybe – Soak in a little bit more, but and then on top to boot RA the against Zamboni, the Coyotes. The Zamboni had to call AAA and get dragged off the ice. <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> the fucking wagon shirts is what happened. Oh. This was you, Biz. This was not me. I want to oh be, I'm, I was very clear about it. This was your idea, not mine. Could you imagine thinking your organization's turned the corner and then you lose to the Coyotes in a full blown rebuild? And then on that same night, you have to send the guys out there to push the Zamboni to get it off the ice. That is just a walking L. Listen, I think that they're going to bounce back. They're going to be fine, but uh, oof, not looking good right now for the Sabres fans who are getting lippy with me when I simply said I still believe this is a top, uh, a top five picking team, potentially a lottery picking team, and that would be a good thing. Some of them are ragging me. I think it's a good thing. I still think you need some more pieces, clearly. Or maybe some fucking new Zamboni pieces. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, Vegas, uh, the Logan Thompson story continues to chug along. Uh, eight and two, two, three, one goals against nine, two, five save percentage, two shutouts. And Aiden Hill, no slouch either, five and one in relief, two, three, two, uh, let's see, goals against nine, 20 save percentage. All but two regulars in their lineup have at least one goal. And hey, credit to Bruce Cassidy. Team is playing back to the level that, you know, they, we've gotten used to in this league. I know they haven't been around long, but they kind of set a good standard. And Cassidy's gotten back to that. So it's, uh, it's you know, I like having Vegas. I think Vegas is one of those teams that you want at the top of the league. People go out there. They're a marquee team. So, I don't know, when they're better, I think the league's better. But what about those Winnipeg Jets? Wit? Quietly slid in the first place in the Central with a three-game winning streak last week. They went seven out of nine. Uh, after Sunday's thrill and comeback win, the Jets are 9-4-1. and one. They got 19 points. Connor Hellebuck, a huge reason why. Uh, seven three and one record, two oh eight goals against nine three five save percentage, two shutouts. Uh, Josh Marcy leading score on this team did a total one eighty. And Biz, you know, uh, what's his name? Brick Bonus got there. He reconfigured the whole leadership group, and you never know how that might play out. But obviously, he fucking pulled the right ones here. Things are working pretty good for them thus far. Well, we we mentioned Nashville and guys having career years last year. It seemed like a lot of guys on that Jets team had off years. 
And we thought that the top nine high flying offense was going to come in. It was going to, you know, put lipstick on a pig for uh, maybe not a, a good, a so good looking back end. And then Hellebuck would be up to his old tricks. Well, now with bonus coming in and things settling down, I, I don't know what to call the leadership issue because there were rumblings and we did talk about them before the year, but you know, San Jose has taken this approach where they ended up taking the C off uh, Joe Thornton. And although at the start, there's plenty of rumblings and, you know, drama, this drama, that it seems like everything is in a great place there. And the boys are fucking playing for each other. And that back end who everybody said was thin, you talk about Morrissey, Pionk, who they ended up getting over from New York and then Hellebuck up to his old tricks, man. He's playing absolutely stellar. And look at Shifley, 10 goals right now. I think he's got a couple OT winners. Blake Wheeler's playing great hockey and, I don't think that we've done enough justice for this team by talking about them. And I think that at some point in the near future here, we are going to get one of their guys on to give us a deeper look into what has turned things around with this organization. So we're looking forward to it. We appreciate all you Winnipeg Jets fans being patient about it, but well-deserved after an off year last year and looking like complete dog shit, this team is playing and headed in the right fucking direction with dog. Hell of a breakdown. And this is with, one of the best goal scorers in the league the past few years, Kyle Connor. He's he only has two goals right now. You know that'll change. So I think this team is I was a year off, Biz. Last year I thought they were the most improved team there and I have a great year. I was just a touch off. You know, there there was a, a major shakeup in I guess every aspect, coaching, players, leadership. But still, I was I was only one year away. So I think with Hellebuck, they could be there the entire season. They could be in the playoff hunt where I didn't really consider that possible, even with as good as he as he is. He is he's at he's at that special level right now where the players when you when you have a goalie like that, every game you just get this added added confidence knowing he'll keep you in it. You got a chance tonight. So we're going to talk to one of their guys hopefully soon. All right. Do you think we got a whiteout coming potentially? You think the Jets make the playoffs? Did you have them before the year? Um, I know yeah, I didn't. I did, yeah, because I have a future on him to win the Stanley Cup. What? I think I got a bit of a man, the one. Shocker. Yeah. Kraken in the playoffs? No, um, in our preview, Winnipeg. We I know. About- no, he's oh. saying you had both. Too, I believe. Oh, oh yeah, I'm, I, I'm not sure. I think I had Seattle, but as far as like an actual future play, I did. I definitely took Winnipeg to win the. He's cup. got a parlay like, for them to both win. to win the cup. Uh, <laughs> uh, Biz, we mentioned the fight between uh, Reeves and Jano earlier. Um, we got to talk this up. The Rangers are going to be in Montreal January 5th, and then uh, the Habs are going to be at Madison Square Garden January 15th. The Wi-Fi man, is that, how Jack I, Arbor Jack I, no, the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is how you can refer to him. He is a household name now. He did so by running around in training camp like a madman, just knocking everything over, and he had that big dust-up with Zach Cassian. Cassian's a coyote, but even he'll tell you he lost that one. This kid could throw hammers. I just think that there's a resurgence of the heavyweight division in the National Hockey League, and Wit, you can chime in on this. Uh, Jeannot, obviously very willing. I give the win to Reeves, and after the fight, he did do the heavyweight belt again. He is establishing that he is Great the top fight, dog. Though. Very it was good a good fight. It was very even. Nashville fans tend to lean towards Jeannot being homers. I would say edge to the champ. If you don't beat him, you don't get the fucking belt. And with the takedown, it's kind of like if it's a great back and forth bout like that, w- w- you get the takedown. It's like, all right, you know, you give that decision to Revo. There you go. And there's a few other guys who are tough around the league as well who could probably fight for that crown. I don't know who your other top dogs are, R.A., Wit, Grinnell, if you want to chime in. But I would, I would probably now with Chara out of the league – consider Luch to be in that top five. Wilson won't fight. He won't fight Revo. He tends to shy away from that one. So I guess it's hard to put him in the top five. Who else do you have, R.A.? Uh, yeah, Luch. Uh, well, Revo. I would say Taylor, uh, Tanner Janot, definitely based on what we've seen in the last two years. I mean, Willie, whether he fights Revo or not, I, he's definitely got to be in there. I mean, Willie's one of the, the toughest guys league. In the Laurier guy. will go anyone. Yeah, yeah uh, Delore yeah. has got to be in there. I think he Patty Maroon will go anyone Mc, too. Patty Mc, Maroon is very yeah. willing. McDermott. I mean, those are, you know, three guys right there that could fill the fifth spot. So I think that there's are going to be a resurgent, like resurgence, like the Mike Tyson days in the heavyweight division where everybody is going to be paying attention. I felt like the middleweights had taken over for a little bit. 
I'm interested to see if Wi-Fi wants a shot at the title. Well, here's a guy we saw fight last week, and I think he's you know he's a good scorer, a good point guy. That we forget how much of a bull he is when he fights, and that's Jamie Ben. He fucking flings bombs. He's a bully. He he is a bully, and hey, that's part of hockey. And he fought uh, Logan Couture last week, and I swear to God, he took it easy on him. He, you know, he looked like he could have pummeled him a lot more. Obviously, fighting not Logan's main thing he does. You know, Ben let up on him a little, but uh, he, he reiterated, like, yeah, I'm a tough motherfucker out here, but the Sharks as well. This is another team that, you know, who knew what they were going to do this year after last year, and they're doing pretty well, man. 9-5-1, 19 points uh, at the top of the division. You know, we talked about Sagan and Ben before the season, you know, the big contracts. Well, they got the swagger back. They're playing very well, but this team, Biz, they have two, I think, two hot candidates. Jason Robinson, a.k.a. Robo, we've had him on the show this year so far. 10 goals, 13 assists, 23 points in 15 games in his career. 68 goals, 80 assists, 148 points in 143 games. This dude pushes play. He dominates. I think he's a hot caliber uh, candidate. And Ottinger, Otter, 6-2, and two, a one eight zero goes against 938 save percentage, a shutout. And six of his nine starts, his lowest goals, uh, I'm sorry, save percentage, 929, 941, 960, 967, 969, 974. I think he's an MVP candidate too. Dallas, man, the sky is the limit with this squad. Oh I my think goodness! This. I, That's probably the biggest walking out. Go ahead, Wit. Oh, I, no, I was going to say it was before the season. I said I don't know if they're lottery or they're division winners, and everything's kind of coming together for them to look like legitimate threats to make a little bit of a run, because. Robertson being this good, missing the training camp, like you're like, oh my god, we got a real legit top end player right and Sagan and Ben playing this much better that's all you, you just need them to play solid and contribute but if you don't need them to be the 80 point guys you actually have one in this kid and Pavelski this guy doesn't slow down and then the biggest thing is Ottinger BU BU Terriers um they could they could ride this guy along with some good D and and and, and beat anyone but Robertson I didn't know I I didn't know he was this good I, I'll say it. Even after last year, no training camp does that. Fucking how oh, many guys? Are this be... guy, this guy's saving. This guy is, is changing lives for players. I'll hold out. Oh, look what he did. I can do it. Might make some more money pulling a Robertson. But what a, what a player and DeBoer. I can't pump that guy's tires enough. Um, quickly, I just want to mention because we're not going to mention the otherwise the Sharks. Eric Carlson right now. Shout out him. I think the other night in regulation he played thirty four minutes in. Three of the last five games, he's over 31 minutes and second most in the National Hockey League in even strength points. Connor McDavid and Eric Carlson. So that guy is legitimately keeping them um, as, as, you know, playing way better than people thought because they have an MVP caliber player right now in Carlson. So you could talk about the stars biz. I didn't know that you. was a that was a heck of a breakdown. The only thing I'm going to maybe pile on is. Jamie Ben and Tyler Sagan having that bounce back year. That is so massive for them. That relieves so much pressure from the other guys underneath. Like they got root Bay hints. They got that, uh, G Georgianov. Is that how you say his last name? Georgianov. G Who? Uh, Garyanov. Garyanov. Yeah. Uh, Garyanov. Uh, but fuck man, they are just playing like a bunch of bullies in the West. And when you get goaltending, like that guy, off, I think they, what's that? I think it's Gurionov. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what the fuck I was going to say. We can move on. Double stroke. Right. My, my wrists are tired. I've been stroking too many guys off on this pod. Uh, we got some shitty news Friday when the NHL and NHLPA announced that there will not be a World Cup of Hockey in February of 2024. Uh, the statement kind of vague. It said, unfortunately, in the current environment, it is not feasible to hold the World Cup of Hockey at that time. We continue to plan for the next World Cup of Hockey, hopefully in February 2025. Like I said, the statement was kind of vague, so there was a lot of assumption that it was Russia-related, uh, specifically having Russian players participate as Russia's invasion, invasion and attack in Ukraine still continues. Uh, Russia is currently banned from international events by the IIHF, so the league and union were hoping to find a solution where they would basically compete under neutral name or a neutral flag. Uh, but some of the other participating countries weren't down with that, and they advocated no Russians at all. Uh, that's the main thing I would say. And then per Emily Kaplan, uh, she said apparently the logistics of putting on the tournament in the middle of hockey season were an issue as well. 
and that the IIHF's top business partners were leery of holding it during the season. And as well, the league had yet to secure a broadcast deal for North America. So yeah. either way, it's uh, once again a huge d- disappointment for the players, the fans hoping to get this best on best tournament. Tournament rather, it's kind of a clusterfuck once again, but it is what it is. So we're just gonna have to enjoy the uh, NHL hockey instead. It's a bummer. Uh-huh. I will say as a hedge to the Olympics, because I think that it's a joke that they use the NHL product to put on the best thing, in my opinion, at the Winter Olympics, and there's nothing financially coming back in return. I think that that's a joke. And the fact that the IOC is a little bit, or if not a lot corrupt, take your time and set up the best possible tournament because you don't want it to be a shit show and then all of a sudden, it, it deters people from wanting to do it mo- moving forward. Get it right. It sucks that all this is happening. I want to see a best on best. But I think that NHL's best opportunity to not only capitalize financially within reason and get out of this escrow hole and get the league thriving is to have full control of it. Move the thing around where you can do one in North America. Then the following time, you can do it over in Europe and you can have full fucking control of this juggernaut. Do it the proper way. It sucks, though, R.A., like you said. And now, though, to boot, it'll be in 2025 when the Olympics would then be in 2026, correct? I believe so, yeah. Yeah. So you don't very much up in the air right now. Yeah. So then all of a sudden it's like, well, then do you just wait to do it and then still go to the Olympics the following year? So we'll see but i still very much strongly believe that the league needs to set up a world cup of hockey do it your own way and if the, the players are going to the olympics i fully agree with the owners in a sense that there should be financial compensation coming back from the ioc which i don't think would ever happen anyway no probably not with them before we go any further we have to talk about game time if you want to see any games this season you need game time Game Time is the ticketing app that makes it easier than ever to score the best deals on tickets to sports, concerts, and shows, and they guarantee the lowest price. If you haven't given Game Time a shot yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. You guys are going to love this app, and we have tons of Barstool fans using it, hitting us up on social about the great deals that they've been getting to see anything they want. We've been using Game Time all year. And we actually went to the Steelers game with game time. We went to the Hurricanes and the Oilers game with game time. So we got to shout them out. Download the game time game time app. Go to the account tab to create a login and redeem code Chicklets for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. All right, moving right along, a few bullet points to get to here. Uh, PK Subban. Su- PK Subban. Holy uh, shit. I know Subban. Yeah, it feels like it's P.K. Subban joins ESPN as an analyst. He signed a three-year deal, and he began his quest for $100 million. Gee, when does P.K. Oh, I'm sorry, $78 million. $78 When does, million. When does P.K. Million. make a $78 million, G? What year? 2042. 20 years. Exactly 20 years to the day this guy will be well over $78 million in, in career and earnings. And, and, we'll, and we'll double it down probably the same day he's inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame now if he goes on a 20-year rip in media. He's going in as a builder. I fucking told all you people. <laughs> I told all of you guys that this was going to happen. And I bet he does it away from hockey, though, Biz. That went? was my thing. Good morning, America. Here he comes. Yeah, that was, that was the one thing I was going to bring up is that Grunelli kind of mentioned it wouldn't be throughout covering the National Hockey League. And and if it is, um, that's amazing because that would be good for our league and good for us. <laughs> and then also, it was that's what I thought. The the morning, Good Morning America. That's how you'd make the big bucks. So if if that happens, I'm all in. But overall, though, awesome for the league and the fact that he's going to be helping out with ESPN broadcast, growing the game, hockey wins, fucking rights. Let's keep her going, baby. Yeah, he was great in his uh, audition last year, so I'm looking forward to seeing him back on there. Uh, we have congratulations to Eric Stahl. He played in his 1300th game Wednesday against the team he made his bones with, the Carolina Hurricanes. Uh, what's more, even more impressive, he did this after not even playing in 21-22. He came back for the season. I uh, did a PTO at Florida. Uh, he's got the most games played among active players. Uh, Ryan Suter and Ovechkin are after him. Uh, are you guys surprised he's still playing 38 years old? What? Yes, I am. To take a year off, Biz, at that age and have the dedication and the desire to still 
there wasn't there wasn't a a, a day he wasn't training. I'm sure and skating and and doing that all um, without the team around you and without even the the security of knowing you would be playing at the NHL level again. That takes a lot of a lot of guts. I mean, a lot of a lot of just passion for the game. And so that's why I'm surprised because. That's so, if you're 25 years old, it's one thing. 38 to do that's impressive. And he, he was able last year to play in the Olympics. So that's the little hockey that he did play. And I yeah, don't know true. if he went anywhere afterward or if he was playing overseas. But even before, right? It's just but it, it is crazy to take a year off at that age playing playing that many games to come back. Um, very cool too. The other night, all the Stahl brothers were in another Ash, uh, National Hockey League game together when Carolina was in Florida. So uh, Mark Stahl as well in Florida, as well as Eric. And then, of course, uh, um, Jordan still in Carolina. So very cool that, they, that, that he's still going and the family's still uh, going strong. He should be selling his sperm. I said, the old man, he should be jarring it up in Thunder Bay, man. I uh, also want to send congrats to referee Kevin Pollock on working his 1500th NHL game Saturday in Buffalo. Uh, before the game, Rasmus Dahlin and Patrice Bergeron presented him with uh, signed jerseys from each of their teams with the number 1,500 on the back. So congrats to Kevin, man. That's a huge accomplishment. That's a lot of games for a ref. And, you know, we like a lot to of games getting yelled at. Yeah. We like to re- recognize the milestones, uh, be it players, GMs, coaches, or, or referees. It's it's a, a huge accomplishment. Uh, Ottawa is going to retire Chris Neal's number 25 on February 17th. He's the franchise leader in penalty minutes with 2,522. Of course, he played all 15 of his NHL seasons with the Sens. Their sixth round pick in 98. He played 1,121 regular season and playoff games. You guys ever have any run ins with him when you played? He was Move over to Carbono. Did I ever have any run ins with Chris Neal? Well, not necessarily you, maybe Biz. RA, RA, this guy. I think I told this before. Uh, the lockout season when the AHL was really good. Oh, no. And Binghamton Bingo? had the best oh. team in the league. Spezza was lighting it up. They were just complete wagon. Vermet was down there. Volchenkov, Chris Neal, an amazing AHL team. The Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins went down 0-2, losing the first two in Binghamton. We came back to win four straight and beat Bingo in the first round, upset of the year. But I bring this up because Chris Neal, in the course of that six games, he knocked out five guys. Oh, no. Three shoulders and two two concussions. Oh, I think who, two of them shoulder labrums. The other c- concussions, conkies. He was a wrecking ball. He played the game as hard as anyone. Just out there holding his stick like a bulldog. Barking hey, Biz, he was willing to go down. anyone, right? Yeah. Yeah, he had the he had no no front jibs towards the second half of yep. his career. Now, to be fair, and bingo, the 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 walls were cement. There was Tiny no little budging. barn too. There was no budging of the walls, so that's why the AC joints were popping, popping like crazy. But uh, I will say, pr- pretty pretty crazy. That I guess getting his number retired. No, I mean I know there's a lot of games there, but like as a a, a role player, is oh, that? I was is that shocked. The, is that the craziest number retiring you've ever seen? No, that, I mean that would be in my mind. Well, so he didn't win a Stanley Cup, right? But that, but nobody's won a Stanley Cup there. So that's not a fair argument for retiring. But I'm trying to think of a comparison for a number retirement. R.A., do you have any? Terry O'Reilly's retired by the Bruins. But he, he, he won is. a Stanley Cup, right? Um, no. Ter- oh, Actually, you know, what? You, know what? Never- you know what? He might have been on the 72 team, but I don't know if he played in the playoffs. I, he may have got, like, a ring, but maybe didn't get his name on the, on the cup. I'll look into that. But uh, Chris Neal, I mean, he played... His all 15 seasons there, 1,100 games, uh, leading the whole, was franchise leader in penalty minutes. He was the heart and soul of that team. I mean, it, it's an example of a guy who didn't have to put up crazy uh, goal assist numbers. He was just the heart and soul of that team, meant so much. I wasn't surprised at all when, when they announced that he was going to get his number retired at all. Good argument, all right. Yeah. Uh, I, now, my mind would be there's not much history for the Senators. and So you have Alfredson. You have – um, you you have – uh. This Phillips. Is, you have Phillips. Um, I would argue Jason Spezza. Is that crazy? Jason Spezza or Chris Neal? I mean, it, it's, are you saying that he should be on there or you know that Spezza is? 
Because if I, he's not, and Chris I, Neal is, like, does that make? Oh no, no sense I don't know if he is or not. That's what I'm wondering. I was I kind just of giving yeah. people. And I was I'm like not, giving other I'm, names. I'm not bashing here, but I'm saying is provide me an example of a guy who might not as st- statistically, or might not have been as a dominant of a player as Chris Neal, who was inducted into their teams like like raise of the banner or whatever. You Terry want to call Terry it. O'Reilly. That would be that same similar example. Would you f- agree with that? All right. He played one game in 1972, was in no playoff games either. So basically wasn't on the roster. Yeah. So he didn't want to. Cut I just more mean offensive. Yeah. Did Terry O'Reilly ever put up big points? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure he he had uh, like a couple 25 goal seasons, if I'm not mistaken. I'm looking I would think right that's here. a fair comparison. Sure. Uh, let's see. Yeah. 23, 29. So yeah, the most he had 29 a season. So yeah, they, they definitely similar players. I think O'Reilly maybe had a little more scoring touch, but yeah, as far as a uh, heart and soul type of guy, yeah. When I saw he was getting his number tied, Chris Neal wasn't shocked in the least. I thought. Okay, so I, I uh, sorry, wait, maybe maybe I was a little too harsh out of the gate there. What's more? No, surpri- I said I was kind of surprised too, oh, though. I agree sur- with you. Okay, uh, Ari, I'll throw it to you. More surprising, Dustin Brown getting a statue or Chris uh, Neal getting his number retired? Uh, uh, That's beaten. not a legit argument, because Ari, right, he asked you. I apologize, buddy. Um, yeah. Dustin Brown, I mean, any guy who wins two Stanley Cups and is a key part of him, he was the captain of the team. Yeah, I, I have no problem with the guy getting a statue uh, for being a captain of two cup winners for a, a team that's been waiting a long time for it. So it's a different measurement, I, I would think, than uh, raising a number to the rafters. It's kind of a different recipe. It's an interesting question, though. I mean, yeah, the, does Dustin Brown, he hasn't doesn't have his number retired, though, right? They haven't retired it for the, for the Kings, have they? I would imagine that maybe follows with it, but I was just trying to throw up a comparison and man, maybe, maybe, maybe because you said that they don't have that much of a history that it shouldn't be that surprising where he was one of the guys there for a long time that people saw as that heart and soul. So I'll put my foot in my mouth and I'm happy that you senators fans are, are probably happy and getting to celebrate something these days. The, the, the Dustin no, that Brown wasn't a church. The Dustin Brown statue it's one statue with like a bunch of guys on there. Oh, it's not an individual statue. Okay. I'm fair almost enough. positive. Somebody sent me a picture and in the statue, you could tell uh Kopitar is going to be on it, but I don't think they've like filled his like name and number out yet. Um, and there's a couple other guys and then it leads up to Dustin Brown. Part of the statues raising the cup. So it's not like an individual yeah, guys. Basically the whole team is, is on this this yeah, statue. Like, uh, I was mis I was misled on that. I thought there was an individual Matt Dustin Green Brown. on there. What? Matt Green on that? He's gonna, is he going to get the statue? Be. He should be. Matt Green. Scuds people with his play horrible with Matt suits. Green, one of the funniest people oh, I've ever master. met in my life. He's scout he's now. We, now. We yeah. can't get him on, but he's he's a scout. He's a professional. Every time we ask him, he scoffs at us, just like uh, Lindy Ruff did when I asked him to come on the pod. Um, Ra, what do you got, buddy? We're going to your neck of the woods once again. Uh, Tempe, Arizona. They're going to have a big arena vote in May to see if the Yotes will have a permanent home in the desert going forward. Uh, what else is going on in the desert biz? There's a big bar opening, a few other things going on. Phil, oh, folks yeah. Are- Barstool Sports Bar is opening on uh, this Friday. I will be there serving Big Deal Brewing. And uh, although the, the players are on the road right now fighting their tails off. They've had it. Listen, they were 500 before that game against New Jersey. Expectations were not very high coming into the season. So credit to the coaching staff and all the players for playing their nuts off. And just, I know we mentioned Gunther sticking up in the NHL. He's been a very good surprise for the organization, as well as this Michele. Couple skillful forwards who are making some plays out there for the boys and a big reason as to why that power play is humming and the momentum is building. The rink's going to come, and sooner rather than later, this will be the biggest untapped resource the National Hockey League has ever seen. Go Yotes. What's the buzz in the air, uh, Biz? The people like, think it's going to happen? Is there kind of positive, negative? Is it is it unpredictable? What's the deal? If it doesn't happen, it's just, it's it. That's it. It's Get it. rid of them. That's, it's it, buddy. If it doesn't happen, yeah. even Biz, admit, this is if they vote no, they're done. They're Houston gone. That's, Doros. It. That's all I ask. I'm going to be living in And I uh, hope it goes well. I'm going to yeah. li- live it on Wits, Wits couch in Boston. I'm going to have to move. The Yotes will be gone. Yeah, I got no room for you. Uh, yeah, I hope it does it pass because you, we know it works there. We saw it Phoenix early days, you know, in the early arena. We know it works. They did the idiocy of putting them out in Glendale to prove it wouldn't work there. But 
Hockey works everywhere. Everywhere in America, it works. Doesn't matter the weather. Doesn't matter if they win. If you've got a good team there, they're going to come out. We saw it with Arizona before. We will again have to get this arena. Hopefully, if not, then congratulations, Houston. But there's no excuse not to get this done, Biz, because if it's in Tempe, man, they'll stay forever. Right? I would imagine, yeah. yeah fucking hope so. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, it's good. I think I think it's going to pass. I think it's a, it's, we got the positive juju going. Good. Uh, okay, well, by the time this show drops, the uh, Hockey Hall of Fame induction uh, was last night, Monday night up in Toronto. Uh, the Sedin twins went in, the first brothers to go in the players category in the same year. First time that ever happened. Uh, longtime Ottawa center. We just mentioned him. Daniel Alfredson went in. Uh, Roberto Luongo, he also went in and he shared uh, one of his unusual rituals on the Dan LeBatard show. Um, this is kind of odd. He said on day games, I used to take five to six poops a day. One in the morning when I got up, one when I got to the rink, one after the pre-meal, one after the meeting before the game. The last one was after almost with all my gear on. I had to use the handicap stall. I mean, five to six shits a day is preposterous, but did you ever have any teammates, anything similar? Remotely I think it like probably this? has to do with the, just the nerves and what it did to his stomach wit. I, that's the only explanation I have. I think I might have taken two max. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think it's that nuts. I think nerves could definitely make that happen. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 the, it's the pregame poops. It's the yeah, the pregame jitter poops. I have to I, I fight him. I fight him. I'm not going to lie. Although I always did used to smash. Um, Right after warm up, I take all my I take my pants off and my like the tops off, and then I go in and and, and take one. Elaine Nash always after do, warm up, always after warm up. Oh, you must have felt so good stepping I on for felt, the game. I stepped out of there. I put the pants on, shoulder pads, elbow pads, jersey, bucket, and I was like, I'm dishing tonight. Do you do the the pre podcast poop? Uh no, I do not do the pre, but I did a um somewhat. I'm going to say within 45 minutes of going on at the Wilbur, I got a little pregame poop in. I mean, no, that's where we're going on at. Um, what was the place in Pittsburgh? In Pittsburgh. I don't remember. What the Carnegie Theater. Called. Carnegie Theory. R.A., are you a pre-podcast pooper? Um, no, a- he's right when we start. He goes, remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a pee. Yeah, yeah, I try not to have any douche, douche-related activities this close to the show. Uh, I definitely got to get a pee off first. But, but yeah, I... Uh, that's just a lot, a lot of poops for one day, but it kind of reminds me of uh, Shorzy who would uh, poop in between periods if he had to. Shout out to uh, Shorzy. <laughs> come on, I got um, a little plug in for my show there. Yeah. No, I yeah. love it. I love it. Uh, when does that come out? J- James Duffy asked him about it. Wasn't it w- what was crazier? Because he had two incidences one when he left the ice to go take a poop. One time, I want to say he left because he was injured, went to the hospital. The backup goalie who went net then got hurt, and then they had to call him back. And so he came back from the hospital and ended up going back on the ice. So that's probably – I think he said that was his most wildest story when he had to come back in the game. The other one being when he left to go take a shit in the middle of the game. Ooh. That – I mean, player, it's a little different. I know that their story – um Ray Whitney's probably not going to come on the podcast, at least now, because he's working with the league and trying to get a GM job. So he's got to put some of these stories in the vault until all that's finished. But the cabbages, you talk about the cabbage roll poop when around Christmas time, his wife used to make these cabbage rolls and uh, the game after Christmas, it was on Boxing Day in Carolina. He was starting the game and during the anthem, you, 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 what, you know, the saying, never trust a fart the day after you had cabbage rolls. Well, Ray Whitney shit down his leg, shit all over the place. But that the rule is, if your name's on the sheet and you're starting the game, you have to take that opening face off. So right as soon as the anthem was done, he skated by the bench. He goes, "Boys, I'm coming right off. I just shit myself." So the puck dropped. They won it back. Got dumped in, and he went right down the tunnel because <laughs> he cabbage shit right right down his leg during the anthem. Did you ever heard that one, Wit? When he was telling it, I didn't know. I didn't. I. I think I had heard it, but I forgot. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, as, as he told it, it kind of reminded me of him maybe telling it to me. I have a horrible memory, but it's an it's incredible story. And the way Colsey told it was so funny. Unbelievable. So uh, but, uh, I think we're done done with the shit talk. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Hall of Famers deserve our respect. Yeah, they do. But I mean, it was Roberto. It's a crazy story. You had to tell it. Uh, also he was playing forward in that game, too. They get a couple goals in the Hall of Fame game. Playing yeah, the Hall center. of Fame game last night or the night before. Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Uh, 
Rika Saladin is uh, one of the most decorated Finnish women to play and also the first European woman inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. So congrats to her. She actually retired at 30, had three kids, and then came back at age 40 and played for another six years. So uh, congrats to her, man. Wow. Imagine coming back at 40 after having three kids. Uh, Next up, Herb Carnegie. Uh, He was posthumously inducted into the builder category. He was a dynamic center that played in leagues in Quebec and Ontario from the 30s to the 50s. He's the fifth black inductee after Grant Fuhr, Angela James, Willie O'Ree, and Jerome McGinley. Uh, And he's often regarded as the best black player to never play in the NHL. And Willie O'Ree said that Carnegie should have been in the league before he was, but you know, because of the entrenched racism at the time. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to play in the NHL, but it's nice to see he's getting into the Hall of Fame now. Again, posthumously, but at least his family could see that. Uh, and then to the the Leafs, they play the uh, annual Hockey Hall of Fame game because, you know, the Hall of Fame is in Toronto. They played the Pens on Friday, and then they played the Canucks on Saturday. Uh, and before each game, the team honored franchise uh, franchise legend Boya Salming and a pair of uh, very emotional ceremonies for the 71-year-old Swede who was diagnosed with uh, ALS back in January. I'm sorry, in July. Uh, the first night he came out, I'm sure you guys saw the clip. He walked out with Daryl Sittler, his old teammate. And Daryl said, like, he can't talk, but he's very cognizant of what's going on. And when the uh, the applause broke out and, and Sittler was, you know, basically sobbing in tears and when Boy, you realize what was going on. You see him went to hug him. And I, I was sitting there with tears down my face. Boys, what did you must have seen it? How were you feeling watching this? It was so emotional. Uh, very emotional. Um, the worst disease, the most horrible thing. And I'm I'm lucky enough. Um, s- someone actually reached out to me. I'm gonna read this message. Um, because I didn't know enough about Bjorn Salming and 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 the impact he had. And and to see the emotion of his his friends and his his former teammates and and then to hear from this this listener he said um he this guy's from Sweden from a Swedish perspective in Sweden we always have the discussion about the best Swede to ever play the game most of the time it's between three people and two generations if you're born after 1980 it's either Peter Forsberg or if you're a forward or if you're a defenseman it's Nicholas Lidstrom but for any person born before that the best Swede to ever play the game is Bjorn Salming. The impact he can have, he had, can never be underestimated. He showed the world that Europeans are tough enough to play in the best league in the world, in the toughest sport in the world. He was a pioneer, a great hockey player, and nonetheless a fantastic person, helping out nonstop in Toronto. Every place he stepped foot in, he was a great person and treated people with respect. From Karuna up north to Africa down south, a Swedish ambassador, an American ambassador, a UNICEF ambassador, a human ambassador. He said, I'm too young to ever seen him play, but I have one tale about Bjorg. My older brother's friend played with him when he came back to Sweden and played for AIK. He was an 18-year-old, and Bjorg was the king of everything, rounding up his career in Sweden. The team went out after a game in Stockholm, and my brother's friend ordered a beer. He got called out immediately, not for drinking, but for ordering useless carbs. Bjorg said he told him that if he wanted to be a professional hockey player, gin and tonic was the way to go. Easier hangovers and less calories. This was in 1990. His youngest daughter is now a world-class athlete competing for Sweden in the decathlon. So I, I wanted to read it because what a well kind of worded and description of a true legend who then I heard more about him and looked into it after this weekend and seeing and getting emotional, thinking of Pete Frades and that horrible fucking disease. He he came over here and he was the first European to ever play a thousand games. He was the um, a, a, another sort of a dynamic record holder that, that's escaping me right now for, for Europeans. But I just oh, first European uh, born and trained player to be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame and. And he showed Swedes uh, that lived there that, that they can do it too. And then he proved to the entire North American hockey community that Swedes were tough as shit. He was willing to fight. He was willing to do anything. And now you see what that disease did to him. And I, I was very emotional watching it. And uh, him getting that final goodbye and just him getting the okay to fly over here was huge. And so it's just a horrible thing. Whenever you see this, 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 like I said, this shitty disease affect people. But I was really excited to hear from that listener about the type of guy he is and, and what Swedish people think of him. Well yeah, said, Red. Holy shit. That was, yeah, that was great. He totally changed the way people's perception about Swedish players was. You know, they thought they were soft and all that. And he came over, he was tough as nails. He took hits, he gave hits, and it completely changed that perception. And 
I'm not sure if you just said it with the first Swedish player inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame back in 1996. Uh, so it was good to see him up there with Daryl Sittler. And also Sheldon Keefe started six Swedes in the game, which was a nice little tribute. Oh, you know, that's awesome. A lot of Swedish stuff going on there. And uh, also we want to congratulate our friend Al Morganti. Uh, he got the Elmer Ferguson Memorial Award for the uh, the writing portion of the media. And Bill Clement got the Foster Hewitt Memorial Award for the broadcasting portion. You know, these guys have plaques in the Hall of Fame as well. And we were, we were lucky to spend some time with Al. We were at uh, Jonesy's place a couple of years ago. Just a great guy. Haven't met Bill yet, but we'd love to have him on the pod someday. So kudos to those guys, man. Well-deserved. Um, Remember that see. commercial, that ESPN hockey commercial? Clement, Clement, hands of cement. Cornelli, were you too young for that one? Yeah, I, I don't remember that at all, actually. R.A.? I remember. Oh, yeah. Time. Oh, yeah. Back in the day. I made a butcher day, but it, Google, YouTube, and it's actually a solid, solid commercial back in the yeah. day. NHL tonight. He was a tough bastard, too, Clement, when he played. All right, guys. Yeah, we have one more thing here we want to mention. Uh, the Spit and Chicklets family uh, wants to let the hockey team and staff at St. Ignatius College Prep of Chicago know that uh, we're all thinking about you guys, and we hope everyone is doing as well as they can. Uh, their team bus was heading to a hotel after a post-tournament dinner and was crashed into by a tractor trailer and flipped over, resulting in 16 players being injured, uh, five of whom were admitted to the hospital. Uh, school president John Chandler said all of them will be returning to health, but some much longer than others. Uh, and thankfully, everyone was in stable condition by Sunday. Uh, we were very saddened to hear what happened to these guys, and more so we were very pissed off when we found out that alcohol is quite likely a factor in this the driver of the track, the trailer, uh, apparently was pie-eyed, and he's the reason this accident happened, per the police. Uh, if so, it's just another idiot making a dumb, selfish choice that affects hundreds of people by doing this, and you hate to see it, but it looks like everybody's going to be fine. So go Wolfpack, and uh, we hope to see you boys out there again this season, man. You guys will be back out there healed up because that's what hockey players do. So hang in there, boys. Chip, let's got your back, all right? Uh, let's see. The last few topics here. Biz. <laughs> This FTX meltdown oh fiasco. What the f like? Yeah, all right. Probably one of the craziest scandals in the financial world since maybe Bernie Madoff. I would say it's going to go down as at least in the top 10 all time of, of craziest uh, business world. People getting ripped off, uh, the, the world crumbling down. But uh, Chung Pham, he will come on and he will break this entire thing down. Elon Musk follows him. He is like a business world insider. He has all the, the the special terminology down packed. Anything we need to know, this guy is going to break it down for us as to what the hell is happening in the world of cryptocurrency. All right, before we go to our friend Trung Fan, he has a word from our friends over at Shopify. It's time to knock that new business idea out of the park with Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Forget the off-season work. Shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere. Whether you're selling warm-ups or wall hangers, it's time to start selling with Shopify and join the platform simplifying commerce for millions of businesses worldwide. With Shopify, you'll customize your online store to your brand, discover new customers, and build the relationships that create diehard fans. Shopify fields all the sales channels to grow a winning business from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform even across social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. And thanks to 24-7 support and free on-demand business courses, Shopify is on your team every step of the way. When you're ready to take your winning idea to the world, team up with Shopify, the commerce platform powering millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. Try out Shopify for free today and start selling anywhere. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash chicklets, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash chicklets to start selling online today. Shopify.com slash chicklets. Ladies and gentlemen, Spit and Chicklets fans, we have an internet legend on our hands here to explain everything that is going on in the world of finance. The crypto world is coming down and Trung Fan, who writes for Bloomberg, you'd write everything business on the internet. Can you please dumb this down for all of our Chicklets listeners? Okay, so I'm going to assume that the Chicklets listener know about FTX because of Tom Brady, Steph Curry, the Miami Heat Arena, and the 300 plus million they spent 
peppering the retail market. So I'm going to assume that they've seen the name. If they don't know what it is, it's a crypto exchange. And uh, I don't know how often you guys talk about crypto exchanges here. Did FTX ever advertise with spitting? I know that Portnoy had a problem with that. I owned part of a Bitcoin. I used to own part of a Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. And I couldn't go cash out as of two days ago. Okay. When I we won like a, a March Madness bracket. And yes, at some point, FTX was involved with spitting chickles and they hosed me too, buddy. Okay. So you got, you got rugged also with proper terminology in crypto Twitter. When an exchange like well freezes your money is to get rugged, so you'll be oh, seeing that, that word a lot. Nobody wants to get rugged. Oh, no, <laughs> nobody wants to get no rugged. Those rug get... burn, rug burns were a motherfucker. Yeah. All right, so the the Rob rugging. Maybe, but... Well, let me preamble everything because we uh, we might get a little bit conspiratorial and we might oh, get like oh a boy, little bit oh boy, making oh fun Explain of. Explain uh, what? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay, oh, well, I just uh, so uh, uh, the first thing I want to say is this: hundreds of thousands of people have their money stuck on FTX. It's awful. Uh, we're talking probably 10 billions in customer deposits where it looks like almost certainly stolen. Uh, of, and uh, that is a crime because the terms of service for FTX is that we cannot use uh, customer money for investing or anything else. That some places that's acceptable, that literally in terms of service, not allowed. So the thing about FTX you have to understand is this. The main character is a gentleman named Sam Bankman-Fried. So everybody calls him SBF. You've probably been seeing it all over Twitter. So this individual SBF, a bit of a uh, prodigy. So an MIT graduate uh, worked at a quant hedge fund called Jane Street uh, out of university. And his origin story is that he left his quant hedge fund because he heard about Bitcoin. And in the world of Bitcoin, there was this very famous trade where the price was different in Japan and America. So he had found this arbitrage opportunity and at one point was making, I think, eight to $10 million a day trading this arbitrage between USA and Japan. Now, with things that have come to light, some people are beginning to question whether that's true, but that's his origin story. So you know how Spider-Man got bit by like the radioactive spider? This is his origin story. So let me fast forward a bit, 2019. He launches FTX, which we discuss as a crypto exchange. You buy and sell Dogecoin, Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin. And But uh, before FTX, he had launched something called Alameda Research, which is a hedge fund. And this is where the fuckery begins. Because if you have a hedge fund and you have a crypto exchange, you don't have to be a finance person to be like, oh, well, that's weird. So he has a hedge fund and he can see what retail traders are trading. That kind of stinks to me. So let me, let me establish that. Do you guys have any questions with just that setup? He owns, this guy, SPF has a hedge fund and a crypto exchange. So let's just establish that. No, I think you're doing a hell of a job. You are giving buzzing us the, right now. The chicklets okay. FTX explanation. Keep crushing it. Okay. And, and, and what you just explained is a, a major conflict of interest. Correct. Huge conflict of interest. It's been, people have been questioning this from the beginning, but, uh, and listen, this happens in traditional finance also. Like we might have to pull in some 08, uh, uh, you know, chicanery. If I have to, I don't want to just bury crypto here because I actually do still believe in a lot of crypto. I think this is more of a human greed a situation than necessarily crypto. Crypto is just a vehicle for it. So they, he creates this exchange called FTX and Around 20, 2020, COVID happens. You know, you guys remember game stonks, retail traders going crazy, just doing anything, buying freaking monkey pictures, investing in crypto. Everybody's making money, right? Everybody's happy. And they really blew up around 20, uh, 2020, 2021. And this is when they started really going after the retail market. So they initially had started for advanced traders. They offered what was called better execution. So you could trade faster. So if you're a big time trader, sweet, you use FTX. But if you're a retail person like me, or like biz, you might buy Bitcoin once a year, right? But if you're going to make that decision once a year, it's like any other product, you want to you want to know what's top of mind. So this is where this massive marketing spend comes, right? So like they're going, they're hitting up the, the, the Tom Brady relationship, super famous, obviously, the uh, Steph Curry. Steph Larry Curry, David. Yeah, you know, Larry David on Super Bowl ad. I joke about Steph Curry. He skated through this. He's just like <laughs> juking through. Nobody mentions <laughs> Steph Curry's name. Giselle's getting dragged. Tom Brady's getting dragged. <laughs> Curry's nowhere to be seen. But uh, nicest guy in the world, though. So, like, uh, probably fair enough, right? Crossed it over. He, cr he yeah. crossed over the rug. <laughs> he shook him. Yeah, he crossed it over a step back. But um, so they do this huge retail push. Name Miami's arena, obviously. And they, they start getting customer deposits. And... And this is where it actually gets tricky because it's not clear that he was actually SBF 
was actually out from the beginning to pull Bernie Madoff type shit. But it's looking like what may have happened is this. He got caught up in this crazy, like I was, we were saying, like, you know, everybody's, everybody's making money. 2021, the pom poms are out. Everybody's winning. Right. And, uh, he, so with his hedge fund and his crypto exchange, both those things are still happening, but it looks like what happened with the hedge fund is you guys remember this whole thing about the fed raising interest rates that happens in March. First time in three years, Jerome Powell says, okay, pumping the brakes. Inflation's hot. The easy money. we got to stop this. Right. So in March, the first rate hike in three years. And then in May, the Fed does the largest rate hike they've ever done. Uh, I think it's 50 basis points in 20 years. And they choreograph that they're not going to stop. They're going to do whatever it takes to end inflation. And when you raise interest rates, it's really bad for speculative assets. <laughs> and uh, that uh, crypto really took a dive around April, uh, May of this year. So you guys might remember around the spring, a number of crypto exchanges and hedge funds blew up. And at the time, everybody was looking at FTX. They looked like they were really weathering the storm. They're like, wow, they must have like really good risk management controls or they're able to raise 2 billion from a, a platinum venture capitalist. So they either have the money to weather the storm or they're just really good at the crypto game to weather the storm. But as it turns out, they were not that good. They were not better than everybody else who got wiped in May. They themselves on that hedge fund took a massive hit, anywhere from five to $10 billion. And this, so to hide, basically, they basically put a band-aid over this massive hole. And part of how they did it was they took customer deposits from FTX. That's when they that's, started going retail? That's the crime, yeah. That was the crime. That's all when they started going retail. They had built oh. up a big retail base before then, like in the year uh, leading up to. Okay. So, so, for example, Larry, yeah, Larry David, for example, had the Super Bowl ad in uh, February, right? So that was like the peak of FTX's uh, uh, marketing spend. So they probably had 12 months before that blow up to really get retail investors in. Like Business Bitcoin was probably bought in the last 12, like between the May 2022 and uh, uh, May 2021, right? So I just want to be very clear here. This was the crime. Alameda Research, the hedge fund, took a massive loss in that uh, the, the crypto uh, blow up, which happened because of the Fed. Not blaming the Fed here, but that was the catalyst. And then they had access to uh, FTX customer deposits, illegal, totally illegal, to co-mingle those funds. And that that's... They spent that peop, those people's money investing on crypto. They spent it to help out that hedge to fund. To plug the hedge fund's hole. That, that's exactly. a fact. That everything is pointing to that is what they wow. did to cover up the huge loss. And obviously, in their heads, they're like, we can trade ourselves out of this, right? They're like, we can trade ourselves out of this. We're like, this, remember, this guy, I think, he's MIT guy. He's Mr. So, like... So here's what's even It'll crazier. never catch up. It'll never yeah, catch up. We're good. Exactly. Here's what's, yeah, that's crazy. Here's what's even crazier about it is it probably would have been smooth sailing, but I believe one of their competitors or somebody in the yes. know on crypto sends out a tweet one week ago. Yes, Biz, you nailed it. This is, to your point, I wouldn't say smooth sailing, but the thing that's interesting, to your point, it was a very clear catalyst. It was a single tweet that took it all down. So I think the better way to look at it is this. It was already a creaky house, right? Because the foundation is crooked. The foundation is awful. We just described. They're taking money from customers and plugging this massive hole that they had in a trading loss. And they, to your point, it's a crooked, it's a rickety base. So to answer your question, Biz, the individual, his name is CZ. He's the richest person in crypto. I think he's worth 20 to $30 billion. Nobody knows. All right. This guy, his, his, his exchange is the biggest exchange in the world. And just give you an idea how big it is. Binance is the name of his exchange. First of all, no one knows where this thing's headquarters. It's, it, it is so sketchy. Uh, but CZ has come out of this looking like pretty From one good. rickety house to another, basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, right. That's what RA claims. <laughs> yeah. It's but RA's house. Time. It's already house, That's where right? headquarters is. So, so let's actually, let's run with this analogy. I like where this go. So the, the foundation of this house is rotted, all right? So CZ comes in. So here's the interesting. CZ, this Binance individual, was an early investor in FTX because he was kind of like one of the godfathers of the industry. And he's like, I'm going to invest, help this guy out. Maybe he can help me crack into the U.S. market. You know, he's an MIT, SBF, his parents, Stanford professors, both of them extremely connected to like elite America. Right. Yeah. And um, so CZ had invested in his company, but a year ago they started having falling out because FTX getting a little bit big. 
too big for his britches, right? So Binance is like, I'm out. I don't want to be in anymore. You got to buy me out. So the uh, uh, CZ, the individual that uh, Biz alluded to that sent this tweet last week, and I will explain what happened, but part of the deal for him to leave FTX, he was given a lot of, uh, you might've also heard FTT, which is the token for FTX. And the one thing I'll say about tokens, I don't want to get too complicated here, is that this shit's all made up, okay? If a, a token for an exchange, listen, a lot of things are made up, but like the US government gets to back it up with guns and you have to pay taxes in the US dollar, right? Like that's the reason the US dollar works. It's like there's aircraft, there's 30 aircraft carriers patrolling the world. Like you're going to pay your taxes. But like <laughs> if FTX makes the token the only value in that token it's is shit. Only, it's sh- right it's shit except like well let's say this way if spin chicklets did a token the only value would be what confidence your fans the audience have in you guys right it's like do i believe these guys we do have one it's called big deal brewing and pink whitney <laughs> that is a version <laughs> of a token right uh but um so cz we we, just, we 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 mine it by consuming it and pooping it out <laughs> five to six exactly. times a day on live show days <laughs> Wait, have we had any? Have you guys had any big deal today? Are you having some right now? No, you no, no I'm gonna save Monday, it for I'm after trying, you hey, explain this. I'm trying. Okay. I'm trying to lay off. All right, man. Um, I'm, I'm waiting I'll for Monday Night Football. No, no. So, what, now, so what back to the token. So okay, back to, back the, to the token. So CZ has all these FTT tokens, right? And again, we, let's just live in a world where we know all, most of this stuff is BS and it's all built on confidence. So the thing is, if you have an asset that's built on confidence, if you have a serious hitter say this is bullshit it can destroy the confidence in said asset. And I remember what I said earlier. Yeah, CZ, it's the richest person in crypto, runs the biggest exchange, and fuck, his name's CZ. Like, if your name is just two guys or letters, like, like you're a big deal, right? Sounds like a Bond villain, yeah. It's like like RA, man. It's like, this this Uh, guy's a big deal. Yeah, there's there's something about this guy that's off, man. (laughs) He didn't do what I did for the nickname. Right, so um, last week, and this is what's so crazy about uh, this entire incident, it's been playing out all over Twitter. And uh, and on top of the fact that Elon just bought Twitter, it's just the most insane week ever on Twitter, right? And the whole Twitter blue blow up. Like, I, I, I did drain my dopamine, like, refreshing my phone the past week. <laughs> so last Sunday, CZ sends out a tweet, and it's so ominous. He's like, we're selling all of our FTX tokens. Like, we peeked behind the curtains, and it doesn't look good. And, that was uh, the tweet? Oh. Yeah, it's like uh, something to that effect. I mean, we could pull it up and read it, but I mean, I'm going to dramatize things a bit. Like, I, I'm a bit of a bullshitter, yeah, so we'll dramatize pepper. it. Up. Yeah. <laughs> so he basically tweets to the entire world, the most, like, the most reputable biggest guy in, uh, in, in crypto is like, yeah, I looked at uh, uh, FTT's books, uh, FTX's books, not good. So the token goes to shit. When the token goes to shit, and remember, they borrowed all those customer deposits. They got to pay back those customers' deposits. But the problem is this. When the token goes to shit, the customer's like, oh, the token's going to shit. I want to take all my money I want everything out, out. out of uh, the exchange. So as we mentioned, Biz, you said, listen, if, if this tweet didn't go out, they probably have time to try to fix things. But not anymore, man. And the, the number one mistake any financial institution can make, and this happens repeatedly over the centuries, this is known as a dictum, Okay. There's a dictum in the banking industry. If you have to tell your depositors their money is safe, no one's going to believe you. It's fucking over. And so SBF replies to CZ's tweet with, guys, everything's fine. Assets are totally fine. And literally triggers it. Not a single person believes oh, him. Oh, so he panicked and he hit the reply button. It was like <laughs> responding to a girl too soon. No, from from it, my understanding, six billion dollars was tried to be taken out at that point. To the point in the following, end. yeah, exactly. In the next thirty six hours after the tweet, so this is last Sunday through Monday. Oh God. Money starts coming out, and uh, I'll tell you what's funny. Again, this is not just a crypto story because a month ago, Credit Suisse did the same thing. They sent a letter to investors, being like, "Hey, we're hearing some rumors on social media that deposits aren't fine. Just want to let you know everything's fine." <laughs> Boom. Their fucking bonds go to shit. As soon as you have to tell people your stuff's fine in finance, it's over. It's called the bag of hot addictum. Wow. It's really famous. Yeah. So um, so that takes us to, let me take us to Tuesday. So within 48 hours of that initial CZ tweet, Binance, uh, SBF had called every other major crypto exchange CEO. He needed money. He needed to, he said in his words, to get 
liquidity to handle the withdrawals. But the reality is this, the whole thing was sinking and he knew the gig was up and uh, he knew the crime had been committed. And now he's just like, okay, the only way I'm not going to go to jail is to keep this entire thing a going concern. And really to business point, try to just over time, bury, like dig my way out of this hole. Right. Uh, which is obviously the dumbest uh, thing you could possibly do. So within 48 hours, CZ goes, I'm going to buy FTX. So that's, uh, uh, sorry, Ryan, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I just want to say, no, no, well, no. yeah, I have one thing is like, CZ said, I want to buy FTX. And then the next day they go, we looked at the, we looked at the books again. We're not buying. And that, that was game over because again, the biggest whale in crypto says, I'm not going to back this. It's over. It was literally over. No one else had the funds to do it. So, and then the, the one thing I'll add, I'd love to take you guys' questions out there is within, I guess, say 48 hours from FTX pulling out, oh, sorry, uh, Binance pulling out of buying FTX, it became clear no one was going to save it. Then all the rumors and uh, investigations started coming out, early investigations and signs of evidence that the uh, the customer deposit fuckery had gone down. So that's where we kind of are right now. I got, I got a two-part question. I'll keep them both simple. Okay. First, what happens to the people whose money's in there? Do yep. they have any chance of getting anything back? And 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 two, is it like the banks in 08 where this guy, this this dude that went to MIT, SBF, whatever his name is, is he going to end up like fine from this? Is he ever going to? Is he going to go to jail? Does he deserve to go to jail in your mind? I so I'll answer. I'll answer the second question first, actually. Um, I think he will go to jail. Wow. Uh, I think it was a very clear, uh, he's in the Bahamas, by the way. It sounds like he tried to flee to Dubai, right, which is a sure. non-extradition city. Holy uh, shit. Extradition so country. Is... Yeah, it's it's got, it's like, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a, a teaser here, but there's state level stuff involved here because I, I can even walk you guys around one of my favorite conspiracy theories, but I'll do it after. But the, the long story short of it is that he's a CIA plan and it was a way for them to get a view into crypto. Insane theory, but before I do I'm that, I'm down. Right. I'm eating. I'm picking yeah. it up. Okay, I'm okay. It up. This is buying okay. 100 shares of okay. that shit. Okay, shot. okay. <laughs> Get your tinfoil hats up. Oh, yeah. Biz, Let's go hey, Biz has this conspiracy token that's being delivered to the apartment. <laughs> Biz, has a, Biz has I a fitted tinfoil hat. Oh, okay, yeah, so okay. Ryan, let me, uh, let, me, uh, let me answer Ryan's question actually with you guys remember Martin Screlly, farmer, farmer bro? Oh, yeah. Dirtbag. Uh, so, well, Bad person. I, I Okay. I have a mixed feelings about uh, Martin. Uh, uh, what I will say is this. He he didn't go to jail for actually uh, what you guys think he did. He didn't go to jail for any of the farmer stuff. He went to jail for misappropriating investor money. The funny thing is, though, he misappropriated their money and made them all like five times, but he still misappropriated it. Yeah, it's crazy. So that's something that people should understand. He didn't go to jail for the uh, the hiking, the, uh, the, the the drug that he bought, which is uh, that was kind of the story. I thought the real reason he went to jail. I just is thought he, that was mean. That was like, yeah, was that was crushing right. people. Totally, totally. I, and, and again, I, I, I have mixed feeling. There's the rationale we don't have to go into, but it's like, hey, listen, you got to pay for research somehow. But at the end, of, and, and, uh, and the insurance company's got to pay for it. Still, optics awful. And he went to jail for five to seven years, right? But there, the thing I will say about Martin is this, there's no question he's one of the most astute minds in finance. Uh, uh, not necessarily the most, but like he, he, cause he writes a lot, right? And he's very, very lucid when he writes. He's out of jail now. And he wrote, uh, uh, he has a newsletter on Substack, obviously. Uh, and I read it this morning. So he's been in jail. He's dealt with federal prosecutors. This is what he said. He said, I think SPF's going to go to jail for life. He says, at a minimum, I think he's going to get 15 years. And the reason he says that is because the customer deposit uh, misappropriation is so egregious. And this is such a political event, right? Remember, there's 100,000 creditors. I don't know how many are in the United States, but this becomes a political hot potato, right? So oh, like yeah. in, in May, when a crypto hedge fund blew up, that was just greed. That was just a crypto hedge guy over levered himself, blew himself up. This is criminal. People's money. Yeah, this is people's money. And, uh, and the SEC and the US government is taking so much heat for being asleep at the wheel. Because this is like the oh, sixth. They're going to make blow. an example out of yeah, them. For exactly. Sure. And, right? and you're essentially creating a hedge against U.S. currency, so they're just going to try to multiply exactly. Here. Well, I'll give you guys a very interesting parallel uh, before I answer um, uh, Ryan's second, uh, first question: Ask who's will they get the deposits back? So you got the, you probably heard a lot of comparisons to Enron, right? Oh, this is like financial fraud, like Enron. Because the big thing with Enron was it was a financial engineering fraud. That was the thing. They're moving money around. Uh, different vehicles. But what people don't remember from Enron, and I think is probably the most important parallel is this, Kenneth Lay, who's the chairman of Enron, 
was one of George W. Bush's largest donors for his governorship and his U.S. presidential election. When US, when George W. Bush became president of the United States, uh, was an elected in 2000, he created a committee to write energy legislation. Kenneth Lay was on that committee. And he, Kenneth Lay wrote uh, uh, legislation. Rules. Yeah, wrote the rules that allowed for the deregulation of the electricity markets, which is why Enron fucked over Cal. You guys remember when Enron screwed California electricity yeah. people? Yeah. That was all Kenneth Lay had written those rules. So you guys may have heard, SBF is the second biggest donor to the Democratic Party. He said he wanted to donate a billion dollars in the 2024 election. He's already donated $50 million. Again, don't want to get too conspiratorial, but the point is this. He has political protection, but so did Kenneth Lay, and Kenneth Lay went to jail. In fact, Kenneth Lay died in prison. So I've I think- watched that documentary. That's an right. amazing, Shit, amazing you're movie. You're buzzing yeah, dude, right now, buddy. I'm, uh, I'm dude, buzzing. I, if you read that thing, I'm like, oh, I've been on like Twitter for 96 straight hours, man. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so Ryan, your first question was, will the depositors get their money back? Oh, man, sadly- Sadly, this is looking like where it is right now. So there was a leaked balance sheet. Again, we don't know the authenticity of it, but the Financial Times wrote about it. Early analysis, this is awful. I'm not laughing. Like, it's awful. Early analysis of that balance sheet says there's a $9 billion hole that's owed to uh, depositors. And in an optimistic scenario, and remember, to give you an example, Bernie Madoff's uh, a $60 billion Ponzi scheme, they're still clawing back money 15 years later, okay? But to their credit, the U.S. government has clawed back nearly 80% of stolen funds from Bernie Madoff. But this is a little bit different situation because you can probably track down where that Ponzi scheme, ha- Ponzi scheme happens. The problem with FTX is they literally blew that money. Like they were investing it, over levering it, and it's fucking gone. So an optimistic reading of the dip- of, of, of that balance sheet that was shown to show the FTX assets is they might be getting five cents on the dollar. And and, and this is the thing you have to remember. That's five cents across everyone, right? So I'm hoping that the following will happen. I have no idea how legally possible this is, but let's say that you had two depositors at FTX. And I know one, I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a crypto hedge fund called Galios. I think they had a hundred million in uh, FTX. They're able to get 50 million out. So they have 50 million stuck there. And by stuck, I mean it's gone forever. Right. Oh. So that 50 million is gone. But then you'll have a depositor like Joe Average, who put 5K into FTX, but actually needs that money. It's the holiday is coming up. He's never going to fucking see that money again. So are you going to do a situation where you give people back five cents on the dollar, including people that have tens of millions on there? Or are you just going to be like, you know what? We're going to make everybody whole up to 30 grand. And then from there, we'll start apportioning pro rata what people deserve. I hope something like that gets implemented because to have, man, I know people that like, unfortunately were white and they put oh, like serious savings sick. in there. Right. And it's like, it wasn't even like they're trying to like bet and like, you know, like 10 X their money in Bitcoin. Just like, yeah, this is interesting. I'm putting a bit of my portfolio in here. And then sometimes you just end up putting a bit more you want and just kind of forget about it. Right. Cause like, Oh, this is a platinum brand. They're backed by the biggest venture capitalist in the world. Yeah. You're thinking it's, you're thinking it's a S and P 500, yeah, right? Like, exactly. Like, this is, we're good here. That's kind of been our, our boys, like for a long time. And like, somebody's going to end up eating the bag at the, at the end of this. Now, what, what's stopping this guy from getting a, a G six and going to Dubai? If he's in well, Bahamas, totally, so. right? I mean, let's say, uh, I mean, even let's say he does, I think ultimately the question becomes whether or not he goes to jail is, can we scratch enough assets from him to help pay people, pay people back? But unfortunately, it looks like they were taking a lot of the customer deposits and like pumping up, like these, we're talking about these tokens have no value in reality, right? He's putting this money into tokens that really don't have any value. And as we've seen over the past six months, the crypto market has completely shit. So uh, that's what the last question I was going to ask you is you said you still believe in crypto. This situation here is obviously going to hold it back a lot, if not yeah. maybe ruin its reputation forever. What makes Bitcoin different than the rest? And why is it even still a thing? Like how, how does, who determines that that coin is still w- worth $16,000? Totally. That's what nobody seems to be able to understand and why people okay. believe in crypto. So uh, I make uh, the first comment I make, I'd separate, again, not investment advice, right? Like, And I bought 
late into Bitcoin. Like I'm not like a truther that's been in the game for 10 years, but I, I have bought into the narrative that I think it, it'll be a, a version of a replacement for gold. And the argument for that essentially is that the entire gold market cap in the world is about 10 trillion. And people are saying, what if Bitcoin takes 20% of that, right? That makes it a $2 trillion asset. That's the which argument is, I've heard. Yeah. That it's just, which is about, it just needs a tiny piece of the pie. Exactly, make, right? Yep. Which is like four to five times from here. I, I think that that argument is credible. I'm not going to talk to why, but it has to do with the fact that it's a limited supply, right? It's literally the only asset in the world where you know there's 21 million and that's it, right? Because you can still make gold. Well, that's Even what gold. they say. Right, right, right. <laughs> Before it gets hacked. So uh, the two things I'll add to your point, Biz, is this. Bitcoin has had like the biggest hack bounty in the world for past 13 years, right? In past decade. And every single day, people are trying to attack Bitcoin itself. Attacking an exchange or hacking somebody's like wallet or phone is very different than the actual Bitcoin protocol, right? Which has survived and thrived and has brought people in the ecosystem. But the, the, the other stuff you layer on top is like, you put an exchange on top, that's not Bitcoin. That's an exchange that sells Bitcoin. That can blow up. You put a wallet on your phone, that's, you can buy Bitcoin with it, but that's not Bitcoin, right? You see what I'm saying? It's like everything else, and sure, humans, Super fallible technology, super fallible. So that's the that's the issue with Bitcoin. So to your question, is like it, it, it set it back huge, and I'll tell you actually why. The biggest blow to Bitcoin is not necessarily in the retail market. Retail got fucked so hard, I feel so bad for them. I hope people get as much money back as possible. But the real problem that has happened is this, because you'll know this biz because you're from Canada. Ontario Teachers Pension Plan oh, lost a so hundred million dollars on FTX. Now. They managed That's, 200. They should not be in Ex yes, that exa shit. That's Ryan, bullshit. Exactly. That's this is what's crazy. Ryan, I'll tell you what's crazy about it. In Ontario, in the province of Ontario, you can't even use the app FTX. The province deemed the app unacceptable for the, 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 the population of Ontario. But the pension fund invested $100 million into the app. Like, it's insane, right? And oh um, God. so this is actually the huge blowback. There was basically call it 500 billion to a trillion, maybe trillions with an S because we're talking insurance companies, pensions, endowments, multi-trillion dollar asset class, right? They were waiting to, they're fine to allocate one or 2% to crypto. It's not that, I mean, that's acceptable risk for them. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but after Friday, that's no longer acceptable. If you're a chief investment officer for an endowment and you go to your investment board and be like, hey, I want to put money, they're going to tell you fuck off. They're like, you're done. Right? So that's another, that's that's a, another big chunk right, of money. That. That's Talk a about huge, the, yeah, exactly, dude. So to end, okay. so to answer your question is like, um, it's a quick summary. I believe that the, the certain properties of Bitcoin make it still a, a, a potential substitute for gold in some capacity, but the blowback from retail and maybe just from the size of institutional really has set crypto back probably five to 10 years. I got to send one over to R.A. and R.A. is the movie guy. Mm -hmm. The One of the craziest aspects of, of this entire story. R.A., I'll send it to you. Uh, yeah, Biz, the Michael Lewis book. Of course, he wrote Moneyball, uh, an excellent book that became a terrific movie with Brad Pitt. Uh, and he was writing a book anyways, and all this happened to happen on his watch. So he went from maybe a run-of-the-mill crypto book to possibly a bestseller, possibly a Pulitzer hit, right? I think he also was part of the big short and wrote that or, or yep. was it? He did write the that? big short. Yeah. So there's been, I can send you guys some memes. You'll appreciate people are making yeah. like posters for the big short too, with all the crypto phases. Oh my God. So, so it just so happened that this guy was following the, the, the big dog of FTX. I forget the guy's name. What's SBF. His name? SBF. The, SBF. SBF, the bond villain. <laughs> he was following around assuming that he was writing a, a story about the next genius in finance, like basically the next Warren Buffett of the future. And then this story falls oh in his God. lap in the, in the midst of following this Correct. guy around. This, you got, well, it, this I just want to say, I'll give you guys something up. really fun. Yeah. It, it, it feels like it's a simulation and uh, I'll add two things where I think uh, your listeners might want to pull a couple more uh, strings on this. Cause there's infinite stories here. So number one is, you guys know the Madden curse when you put an athlete on the cover of Madden yep. and uh, uh, they, they either have a shitty season or they get injured. So the equivalent of the Madden curse in finance is if somebody calls you the next Warren Buffett, you're done. <laughs> and <laughs> and there's a meme going around this Twitter. that about everyone. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the next Warren Buffett keeps getting brought up. SBF literally has a cover on Fortune. Next Warren Buffett, but sure enough, like clockwork, done. Oh my uh, God. The other thing I'll add is um, 
there are some insane stories about what's going on at, at, with the actual operation. It looks like it was like a dozen people living in the Bahamas, all taking methamphetamines, banging each other, running a hundred billion dollar crypto exchange. Fuck it's like this hiring? is what, oh yeah. Literally, this is what that's you, where I went for spring break. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, listen, the listeners here want to entertain yourself. Literally, just type in SBF like Bahamas drugs, and like people are pulling up pictures that he had with all these publications, and then like zooming into his table, like finding prescription drugs, like patches for like Alzheimer patients that get you zoomed all day. And like, it is absolutely wild what's going on. Oh, oh my Holy God. This is shit, just man. Yeah. It's a You're, crazy story. It I is mean, insane. It was, it was $36 billion to nothing in, in, the, in what, 30 hours? Effect, yeah, effectively, once the confidence snapped, it was over. Like, to your point, Ryan, it was like, it was effectively overnight. Uh, Mor- after. Moral of the story being, do not fuck with CZ. <laughs> that guy would rip your throat up because because in, re- in reality they were friendly there was a falling out and that guy had the power to just basically come out and say your product shit and you're done to the prime mantis well ryan to your to your point this is the other uh, we, we, i promised a little bit of conspiracy zone so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it a bit cz's denied this he said uh he said it was not his master plan to take down ftx but if he did have a master plan, it'd be exactly what he did, which is tweet this coin is shit, and then a week, a day later, be like, "Hey, I'm gonna buy you guys," and then walk away. Like that's exactly what you do. I'm not saying he did, but I'm saying that's exactly what you Where's would he do. From? He is a, a he's Chinese Canadian, so he's actually went to McGill, which is uh, interesting. Really? Yeah, he used to he work for McGill when I was on BU one year, a little <laughs> uh, warm up game. I think I had one and two. <laughs> Well, so let me add that the other thing about CZ that you guys uh, and your listeners might enjoy, because like I said, these are so many threads. Is uh, so in addition to be a big donor, SBF from FTX was uh, was helping to write legislation around crypto, right? And uh, one of the things he's trying to do apparently was box out all the other exchanges and basically have favorable legislation for himself. CZ caught wind of this. And to your point, Ryan, and moral of the story. Yep. Don't, do fuck, not fuck, cross this, don't man. fuck with Dr. CZ. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Oh, is, man. Uh, well, that, thank you so much. I mean, are you a hockey fan? Man, are you guys, are, well, are you, you'll laugh because uh, I'm not embarrassingly. I stopped watching hockey uh, when uh, they had the strike. I came in 08, 09. I'm from Vancouver, so okay. we've had a couple of close 03, calls. 03 was, was yeah. the, I think, the big um, one. That was the, the, last, the last time I was a huge fan, uh, I grew up in Calgary. So I was a big Flames fan. Uh, uh, I was I was born in '85, too young to remember '88 uh, or '89. But I have like the Lanny McDonald like hockey sign, hockey stick in my house. And uh, I, obviously, my parents, both Vietnamese refugees to Canada, they're like, "Yo, we gotta get these people like into the Canadian stuff." So like, my brother's a big hockey player, and like, they're making us watch all the Flames games, to kind of get us cultured in. And then uh, when we moved to Vancouver in '94, the same year. Uh, actually, '94 is interesting because the the year the Canucks lost to the Rangers. Yeah, we moved from Calgary to Vancouver and obviously Vancouver beat Calgary uh, uh, with the Pavel Burry uh, breakaway. Yep. Right. So yeah, that, yeah. that, 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 uh, that summer, I was very conflicted from my new city to the old one. But yeah. uh, unfortunately I'm not as big into hockey as I used to be. I'm a, I'm a big uh, basketball fan. And uh, I'll tell you my main sport, actually, uh, my business I've alluded to is just is is is, is Twitter. That's yeah. that's the greatest Buddy, dopamine and, hit and, ever. And, and I'm going to shout out your Twitter here. This is a Trung fan again. It's Trung T fan on Twitter. He's got over half a million. Uh, Elon Musk follows you. One of the funnest business accounts that you could follow it breaks down i think you broke down ryan reynolds and what they did with the soccer team overseas you actually ended up doing it with our vodka and how it came to be as well i did the vodka joe pompliano did the uh ray ryan reynolds joe pompey on the legend okay so yeah, he's yeah. another he's, oh, another he's good a good one. follow too yeah, yeah hey you're our official business insider now is that cool Seriously. yes i yeah. would be an honor to come back on uh, for any other uh, uh, scandals. Happens about once a quarter. So, we uh, <laughs> yeah, we got a new segment right there, folks. Thank Not of so this much. side, but if there is one thing we can leave you with on the way out, it's Elon follows you on Twitter. Can you reach out and say that RA wants to go head to head, either Jeopardy, Jeopardy or the dozen? We have a show through Barstool. And maybe we can go with him and a few of his SpaceX people against me, Wit, <laughs> R.A., and Grinnell. Oh, man. If he wants a shot at the title, you tell Elon to come barking. And I ain't fucking paying eight bucks for the check mark. Yeah, seriously. Like, <laughs> I I have one. I didn't even ask for one. I got one. So I ain't paying eight bucks. When did you get one? Fucking Gaz got it for me like 
years ago. I was oh, like, I didn't know if you just got one recently. No, R.A. I, I tells have... Elon Musk to take his check mark and <laughs> shove it, and we'll <laughs> no. see you in jeopardy or well, the dozen, I, baby. I didn't say this last week. I, I, I blocked. I haven't blocked. I blocked him like years ago on Twitter, like just because he was always in my feed and I I wasn't interested. So just I, mute I just him. You're not a block. Just mute. Yeah, I, I usually do the mute thing because, but the mutes are for the, like the mutants who just like annoy you all the time. That was just like block because then I don't have to hear any of any of the stuff because people are like, oh, you they call me like a cock and a virtual signal, all that stuff. I'm like, guy, I, I don't even know what the guy's politics are. I just I just get sick of all hearing right. all his tweets. So I just you know how you take him down. It. You tell him Tesla's Tesla's a fraud. You look behind the curtain and it ain't going. And then, <laughs> was it a this is the, C, the CZ it. the CZ playbook? <laughs> well, hey, thank you so much for breaking all that down for us, man. Uh, you know, great to have Honor. you on. And, yeah, uh, definitely learned a few things about the crypto world. That's for sure. Keep crushing it, Trunk. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right, gang, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. Hope you enjoyed Andre Wa. Absolutely hysterical. And we will be back next week with another episode. So also don't forget Sandbagger Wednesday, 6 p.m. on our YouTube channel. Some are saying it's the best ever. Have a great week, everybody.